I worked at a store that was very close to my house, so I walked home every day. The map of the story is, there's my job, my friend's job, a traffic light, a small park, another traffic light, three abandoned stores, and finally a gas station. The only busy part of this route is the gas station. One day I was leaving work and it was starting to get dark. When I left, there was an employee fixing the electrical box of the store that my friend works at. I glanced at him, not thinking anything of it, and waved to my friend. She smiled through the glass door and I continued on my way. It was just another normal day. When I was exactly in the middle of the park, I glanced quickly over my shoulder, because I'm an anxious woman, and saw the electrician who I just passed walking behind me. Everything I'm going to tell you happened very quickly. When I looked back again, his eyes were fixated on me, and he had no expression on his face. All the alarm bells were going off in my head, so I started walking at a faster pace. More out of paranoia than real fear, than real fear. So I looked again, this time more slowly, and I noticed his steps increased in speed just like mine. His expression had also changed to anger and impatience, like a hunter frustrated because the little rabbit ran too fast. I think deep down our survival instincts know when someone wants to do something bad to us by just looking at them. I haven't started running yet. I don't know if when I looked back the third time, my fearful expression gave me away, but instead of walking, he began to almost run and walk at the same time. His strides became so long it was awkward to look at, and so I ran. I had seen this a thousand times on the news. The park was empty. It was just me and him. I knew what he wanted to do. I had my phone out of my hand, but the adrenaline was telling me to keep running and running. I ran the light and crossed the street, still not daring to look back. Maybe he was right behind me. What do I do? I thought after arriving to the abandoned stores, he would have given up. So I looked back one last time, and there he was, still not running, just walking super fast in a weird way. The adrenaline made me run even faster, and when I looked again after a while, he had suddenly stopped. The guy just stood there, his angry expression also fading away. His face looked blank. It was like he was staring into nothing, but his eyes, his eyes were still fixed on me. At this point, I was already approaching the gas station, and he was just a small silhouette that didn't move. My heart was still racing and my hand was shaking so badly I could barely type the password to my cell phone. I kept walking and looking back every second. He didn't move an inch. I started to get paranoid, thinking that maybe he really was an employee, that maybe I was imagining things, that he wasn't really following me. It's like your brain just starts to justify the situation, so you stop suffering. When I was already at the end of the gas station and the adrenaline was slowly decreasing, my boss called me and asked me if I arrived home yet. I said no. He said that my friend next door was worried about me because there was a crazy man pretending he had tools in his hand and pretending to fix the power box. She said she was too scared to tell him to stop and just watch the weird mimicking for a while. But then I passed by, and he turned and followed me, as if he was literally waiting for me. My friend was so scared that she started to record the man, in case something happened, and was ready to call the police. After that episode, I changed my route I did to go to work, and even started to use a bike. Guys, don't forget to always stay alert of your surroundings. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't realized as quickly as I did that he was following me. He would have reached me in seconds. I'm a 26 year old female. I live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not too many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming from work. My boyfriend is away to Thailand for a month and we usually take our dogs out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I usually feel safe. Last week, around 8 p.m., I left my flat to take my dog pee. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. 
She just had her space surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I was waiting for my dog to do her business when a car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly neighbor nod towards me and I did a smile back, you know, to be polite. The guy parks at the front of the building and I'm on the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog trying to get her to hurry up because I'm freezing. I look up and the man is stood outside his car staring at me. Freaked out by this, I turn my attention back to my dog. Keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with his creepy ass smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person. I can be paranoid and aware, as any woman should be at night, but something about him made me feel scared. He was walking so slow as if he wanted to talk to me, so I hid behind a van telling my dog to hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore which terrified the life out of me. All I heard was footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes nuts. She's jumping around barking aggressively which she never does with people but this guy doesn't take this as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence but even though she's doing this he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him please leave as she just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice, he asked, what's your name? I couldn't really hear him. He kept repeating the question. I eventually understood what he was asking. Meanwhile, my dog is still absolutely going nuts at him. I say again, please, my dog just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignoring me again, he walks towards us asking my name, so I start walking away from him. He ponders for a minute, still smiling. Creepy, may I add. He eventually backs up slowly, still facing me. I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds. He walks back to his car, looking over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend my dog is doing something when she was really just being a pain in the ass and just standing there. I look up and he's gone. I'm shaking, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on and she's telling me, just go inside. But she doesn't realize I'm frozen in fear. Eventually I see a woman and her son rock up to the front door so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. The front of her building has a glass door. I glance in and the man is standing there waiting for us. I told the woman, this man has been following me and my dog. I'm scared. And she walks in with me. The man sees I'm not alone and walks right past us out the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decided to tell my two male neighbors about it as my boyfriend is away and they agreed to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11 a.m. just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're heading into the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He's looking for me. Then he starts walking towards me. At first, I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled his creepy smile, and I realized who it was. He said, hi. So I said hi, then beelined it for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I pressed the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me. Again, my dog goes nuts at him. He asked me what my name was. He has an accent. He asked me again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what, my dog's name or mine? He goes, yours. I froze and said a fake name. He started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about to open and I could run away. He told me his name. I replied, nice to meet you. And finally the lift's door opens. 
I walk in and press my button to my floor, hoping that he'll leave me alone. He ran behind me as I walked in and went, I'd like to see you again. What the fuck? Shivers ran down my spine. I was creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing and he tried to stick his hand to stop the lift from closing. Thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid that he was going to run up as he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get home and lock the doors. The lift opens and he's not there, so I beeline it to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs and I swear I thought I saw him coming up. I ran inside and locked the front door. I was so confused by what just happened. Next thing I do, message everyone with an update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on record. So I did that and the police arrived at my flat at 3 p.m. I explained everything to them and they said I could either A. Get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off. Or B. Next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone and if he doesn't, phone the police and it would be considered harassment. But for now, the police couldn't do more, which was fair enough. I didn't want to anger him at this stage, as it's not a crime at this point. But why can't he just leave me alone? I've clearly shown that I'm not interested. It annoys me so much that I can't even leave my house looking ugly as hell without someone being desperate for any female in the immediate area. I hate saying something's going on when it isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling. Update. I hadn't seen the guy since the last incident, but I saw him today. I again was out taking my dog to the toilet around 1 p.m. As soon as I left the main door, I looked and the guy was sitting in his car. He clocked me. I started walking past his car when he got out and said hi to me. I completely ignored him and walked on by. I was preparing myself to shout at him if he kept following me or talking to me. I went over to the grass and the guy is standing in his car staring again. I'm a bit further away so I text my sister letting her know that he's at his car watching me. She didn't reply so I phoned one of my male neighbors and he quickly got his shoes on and says that he was coming downstairs. I look back at the man and he seems to have his phone out recording me. I start shaking, working myself up to the point of confronting him and telling him to leave me alone. The next thing I know, my sister bolts out of the building and fast walks over to me and my dog. She says as soon as she came out of the building, she saw him back inside his car with the door fully open and his back was turned to her because he was watching me. So she saw it this time. He looked at her briefly and watched her walk over to me. He starts staring at us both. That's when my male neighbor got outside and walked over to us. The man continued watching as I told them both I think he was waiting for me to go back into the building because why would he just be sitting there? My sister had enough of it. She told me and my neighbor to take the dog for a walk and she stormed over to the guy's car. She said, excuse me? And he was shocked. She stood right in front of his car and explained that he needed to leave me alone, that I'm not interested that I told him that the dog just had surgery and he wouldn't leave, which is unacceptable. She also said that I had already mentioned that I had a boyfriend, so he needs to leave me alone. He just stood there and mumbled a few times. She said he looked frightened. She walked back into the building, so we took the dog for a walk and when we got back, he was gone. Probably got out of his car and ran back into his flat. I mean, he made me uncomfortable, so she did it to him. Now, if anything else happens, I'm phoning the police as they would then say it was harassment. I also contacted the leasing agency and sent them an email with all the details so they're aware. Thank you again everyone, feel much better now, and I'll keep you updated. I'm a female and I was in my mid-twenties at this time. 
I was working late one night at a secluded office about one kilometer from any other buildings and surrounded by a forest. I occasionally stayed late and would be the last car in the parking lot. This night, I locked up, walked down the trail to the parking lot, and as I exited the trail, I noticed there was another car in the lot. Despite the large size of this parking lot, it was parked directly next to mine. There'd be no reason to park in this lot unless you worked in the building. A man stepped from behind the car, looking at me. He was a white man, probably average height, slender, with brown, medium-length curly hair. He was staring at me with his chin down and a very serious, predatory look. I stopped walking. He was probably about 10 to 15 meters away from me. I debated returning to the office, but if this man had bad intentions, I doubted I could run back, get my key out, and open the door without him catching me. I decided to walk to my car and act normal. I said, hello, how's it going? In a calm and confident tone while walking towards my car. He walked a semi-circle around me, just staring at me, without a change of expression. I kept him in my line of vision and made it to my car, unlocked it, got in, and locked the door very fast. He just stood there. I drove home feeling a little spooked, but wrote it off as just a weird encounter. Maybe he was high, who knows. I called the site security. Normally they would be at the main building, a kilometer away, and don't actively patrol where my office was. I told them about the encounter, and they said they'd go check it out. I never heard back, nor did I follow up. I went home. I live with roommates, and we never lock our doors. One was out of town, and the other one was at work until late, and would usually stay over at our boyfriend's, so I didn't expect anyone. I went about my evening routine as normal, and got ready for bed a few hours after the whole parking lot encounter. Just after I had gotten into bed, I heard footsteps coming up our old creaky wooden stairs. The footsteps continued down the hallway towards my room, but stopped just short. The floors were creaky in this house and you could hear any movement, so no sound meant someone was standing next to my door for what felt like 30 seconds. I was totally silent and had 911 typed out on my phone ready to call. I heard a cell notification from where the person was outside my room and then footsteps went back downstairs. I texted my roommate. The one that was at work called me confirming it was not her and that yes, the other one was still out of town. I asked her to stay on the phone with me while I checked the house. I went into all the rooms upstairs, nothing, went downstairs and the front door was open. I closed it and locked it and checked the rest of the house including the creepy basement. All clear. I heard back from the other roommate. Neither of them was expecting anyone. I dismissed it as someone who was drunk. It was Friday. Walked into the wrong house. I had heard a story of a friend of a friend who did that once and woke up in his neighbor's place. This all happened in 2014. I thought it was a little weird that both of these incidents occurred on the same night, but never connected the two. It was during my last month living in this place before moving across the continent. Fast forward to 2020 when I watched Unbelievable, where a serial killer talked about how he stalked his victims and I was often in their house multiple times before doing anything, and sometimes stalked people and never actually did anything. The more I thought about it, the more I think I was targeted by someone who knew my patterns. Perhaps someone who was planning something for the first time and couldn't go through with it. Do you think these two incidents were connected? Or did I just have two weird but harmless encounters in one evening? Hey everyone. So in 2020, I met this guy at a mall that I worked at. He owned one of the stores at the mall. It was a tech store to repair phones. Anyway, I would see him often because the office was close to his store. To be specific, right across from each other. One day he came up to me and asked for my name. We made small talk and we exchanged numbers. We started seeing each other until one night. I was so tired from work I didn't want to go to dinner with him anymore. 
I'm a single mom and I get burnt out easily. I told him I didn't want to go anymore and he said, no, get ready. I already made the reservations. I said flat out no, because I was exhausted and I'm the type to refuse to be forced into doing anything and being controlling is such a turn off. So I was already getting ready to dump him. I said no firmly. He responded saying I'm on my way. And I said, well, I'm not going. So waste your gas if you want to. I didn't think he would come. But of course, he came. He showed up to my apartment and was non-stop honking outside. He was calling and texting me non-stop while honking. I threatened to call the cops and he didn't stop. I called the cops for a noise complaint. And as soon as he heard the sirens, he sped off. I remember waking up the next morning to 60 text messages and 100 missed calls saying, I can't believe you stood me up. I love you. What is wrong with you? I just wanted to spend time with you. The list goes on, but it really made me see him in a different weird, creepy light. Because how do you love me if we've only been dating for two months? We weren't in a relationship at all. At least in my eyes, we weren't. Yes, we did have sex already after the first two weeks of seeing each other. What scared me was I remember when, after we had sex, he said he was a virgin. I'm starting to believe he actually was because of how things started to escalate. After he told me that he was a virgin, I didn't have sex with him again. So out of the two months, we only had sex once. He's Muslim, and his parents are very strict and crazy. He would sneak out to see me all the time, even though he was already 24 at the time. So after that night of him honking, I broke it off with him and called him a psycho. I told him I don't ever want to see you again. Now, we're in 2023, and ever since 2020 to now, he goes through weird mental states, where in certain months he will blow up my phone, but I'll do it once out of like six months, basically out of the blue. I never respond. Until one day in October, he sent an apology saying I'm sorry. I've moved on. I know I was acting crazy. Blah, blah. And that he wanted to be on good terms as friends and asked if he can take me to dinner to make up for what he's done. I thought he was being honest because I hadn't heard from him in months. And I said, okay. So I went to dinner with him. Biggest mistake of my life. Because before we got the food, he literally got on his knees and begged for me to never leave him again and that he was in love with me. I'd never been so scared or freaked out in my life. I sat in silence to keep my cool and stood silent because I didn't know what he was capable of anymore and I didn't want him to snap. I said, I don't feel good. Can I go home? And he drove me home. Once I got out of the car, I was so relieved and promised myself I would never talk to him again. I never spoke to him again. Ever since October of 2022, he has been texting my phone once or twice a week, asking to go to dinner, and I never responded because he makes me so sick to my stomach. I moved, thank God, so he doesn't know where I live, but recently he's been texting me to go to dinner. The last text was December 30th, and prior was the week before. It's just been very consistent. But recently, on Friday, January 6th, 2023, two days ago, he took a picture of me while I was working and sent me the picture saying, that's you. It scared the hell out of me, because how could he know where I worked? I just switched to a different salon, and he didn't know the salon prior I worked at. At least, I don't think he knew. I've only been at this salon for two or three weeks. It makes no sense. My heart dropped to my ass when I seen the picture, and I responded, You're stalking me. Leave me alone already. He said he has a limo service, and he was driving around when no way in hell he could have seen me through the window, because my station is the second station. He zoomed in to take the picture. There's a desk where he took the photo. It's so weird and creepy. I called the police and they basically victim blamed me and said, how do I not know the guy I dated's last name or his home address? 
They said since I didn't know his last name or home address, I can't file a restraining order or an order of protection. Please help. I know the laws are different in every state, but I am in Chicago, Illinois, and I don't know what he's capable of. Please help. Hey, Reddit. I'm a longtime user, but due to the nature of this situation, I decided to use a throwaway. Trigger warnings for baby death, abuse, stalking, etc. Also, apologies if this isn't the right sub. We just need answers. My girlfriend's mother is a longtime heroin user and has been in and out of jail for my girlfriend's whole life. When she lived with her mother and her mother's husband, she witnessed physical abuse and drug activity. She was forced to move out at a very young age in order to stay alive. She thought her mother was finally clean when her mother announced her pregnancy. After getting over the initial shock, my girlfriend decided to be supportive of her mother since she thought she was clean. That was until her mother overdosed while pregnant. She decided to cut all contact at that point. My girlfriend is also a mandated reporter and last year reported her mother and her mother's husband to the state since she knew it wasn't a safe situation for the baby. The baby died in their house not even a month after birth due to an overdose with signs of physical abuse. My girlfriend's mother was arrested for the murder of her baby and other charges. Her husband was arrested for child endangerment and other charges very recently. At first, the judge did not grant either of them bail. Eventually, her husband was granted bail in which he posted. We did not know this until recently, which helped us put some of the pieces together. My girlfriend and I like to sit outside her house in the car and just chat or listen to music. Recently, there have been black cars around my girlfriend's house. She also is frequently followed by black cars when she drives me home. It's the same couple of black cars that do this. They're not just random ones. At first, we thought we were just paranoid since everyone was still in jail. But when we found out that the husband was out of jail, we began to doubt our insanity. The first major thing happened after my girlfriend and I went on a dinner date. We got home after dark and sat in her car for about 45 minutes before we noticed the same black car passing by us every few minutes. After 10 minutes of that, a different car drove towards us, flicking its high beams on when it got close enough for us to see who was inside. It swerved into the oncoming lane, and I genuinely thought it was going to hit the passenger side of the car. It sped away and we ran inside. After that, we started noticing the black cars more and more. This past Wednesday morning, around 3 a.m.-ish, the same distinct black van that we had been seeing pulled up outside of my house. This was weird, because my girlfriend and I live about 30 minutes from each other in two separate cities. A man got out of the van and shined a flashlight through my yard, scanning it almost. He shined the flashlight up at the window I was sitting at, kept it there for a second, then walked 30 feet to an empty driveway scanned around there for 20 seconds before getting in the van and peeling away. The windows were ice covered and frozen, so I couldn't make out the specifics of the van, but it was strange. A few nights later, my girlfriend and I spent some time hanging out in the car when we spotted a black van hiding behind another parked car further up the street. We could only see one headlight, but it creeped by us as we sat in the car. My girlfriend lives between two dead-end streets. Think of a very blocky U. She lives between the two prongs. The van went up the first dead end, four ways on, and sat for a few minutes before turning around and driving almost into the other lane of traffic to get close to us. It then went up the other dead end and stayed put. We thought it was weird that the van didn't just back out of the first dead end instead opting to drive all the way up the narrow street and turn around. After a few minutes, we call a friend and recount the story just to get an extra opinion. While my girlfriend was talking to our friend, I got out of the car to go for a cigarette and to see how far away the van was. I walked up the dead end that the van was on for about 15 feet before getting the worst gut feeling I've ever gotten. Across the street from me was a black mass, which was darker than the darkness around it. 
I decided to just turn around and rush my girlfriend into the house. Later that night, we heard a bang coming from downstairs, followed by what sounded like a boot on wooden stairs. We locked the bedroom door and I sat against the door with a baseball bat, hopeful to barricade it. A few minutes later, we heard a car door slam before the sound of tires squealing and a car driving away. Our initial idea was maybe it came from the TV, but we had paused it and the TV in the next room is never loud enough to feel real. When I went downstairs an hour later to get water, there was nothing damaged or missing. We theorized that maybe it was the sound of the front door trying to be opened, even though it was deadbolted. My girlfriend's exterior wall doesn't face the road, and we've never heard car sounds before. It is, however, next to a private driveway, and sometimes we'll hear her grandparents' car door close or the neighbors backing out. The next day, I was shoveling the sidewalks at my girlfriend's house, an activity that took about 20 minutes, and I saw the same black Chevy Silverado with mud streaks on the tailgate. It circled the block about four times. I was able to see the silhouette of the man driving through the passenger side window, and each time, it was the same man in the same truck. My girlfriend lives in a small town, and we were able to catalog the neighborhood cars. The black van and truck are abnormal. Our theory is that someone is trying to scare my girlfriend into not testifying, or flat out make sure neither of us ever have the ability to testify. We really just need more opinions. Are we just paranoid, or is this something we should actually be worried about? Do you think that these are just weird coincidences? I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age. My family and I lived out of town about 8 miles out. Our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would always drop me off two blocks away from my home. One day, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me, so slow that I figured that they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and walked to my house. That was the end of that. Consistently, this truck would follow slowly behind me. After a couple days of this, I walked into my house. I was always the first one home. When I got out, I looked out the window. Inside was an older man in a black lab. He was staring at me, idling in his truck, then he pulled away. I decided enough was enough, and I told my parents. Of course, my sister was quick to jump in, saying that I was lying. I did have a habit of telling stories, but my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, across the street at a gas station, pointing towards the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much that she called the police and the school. I went to school and was quickly pulled into the office. The man had been spotted at the school, waiting in his truck. That day, I rode the bus home. This time, the truck was parked alongside the street. I would have to walk past the man's driver's side door to get home. I debated, considering running for it. Apparently, this man was getting desperate now that he had been spotted. A police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man in the truck. He quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. Never saw him again, and I don't believe he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid over my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days, and children go missing so easily. I don't like to think about if I had been grabbed. I wouldn't be here typing this. My kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky. Many children aren't. So, stranger with ill intentions. Let's not meet.
So I'm a 28 year old woman and this happened to me when I was 13. I'm an adult now, but still kind of traumatized. For a little context, I transferred schools because lack of money. This school I went to was a cheaper private school because where I lived, the public ones kind of sucked. I didn't have any friends for at least the first couple of months. I started noticing this boy, Victor. He was always staring at me during classes, in the hallways, by the window, and at lunch. It was an everyday thing, but I didn't care because as a kid, I only thought of stupid stuff like dolls or whatever. Oh, one more thing. I was flat as a table back then, so totally looked like a small child. The girls in my class started saying that Victor had a crush on me, which creeped the hell out of me because he was 18. I was creeped out but still didn't care, as long as he didn't approach me or anything. Things escalated quickly. Victor would follow me home every day. Thank god I've moved since and he doesn't know where I live anymore. The most annoying thing, however, was he constantly asked his friends to try to talk to me and convince me into going out with him and to make out with him after school. These talks would usually take about 30 minutes of them trying so hard to convince me to agree with this while Victor was behind them watching the conversation like a freak. Obviously I rejected all the time, but being the nice guy that he was, he started spreading rumors about us making out anyways. Nobody believed him though, because he was such a weird guy, and the whole school knew it. The final straw was when our school had a trip to a book fair. I was super excited. At this point, I had made a couple friends. On our way to this fair, I was on the bus with my friend, and Victor was also on, three seats behind us. I could feel his eyes on me the whole way. Out of nowhere, he came and asked for my friend's cell phone, and she gave it to him. Very stupid of her. He returned her cell phone not even two minutes after. She checked the cell phone and showed me he had taken a bunch of photos of me. I guess this was his way of saying that he has already done this at some point. She got so pissed and went to go talk to him. When she returned, she said the creepiest thing I've ever heard in my life. She said this with a very scared look on her face. He said to me that when you least expect it, he'll push you into a bathroom and rape you, today. The only thing that went through my mind was, what should I do now? I looked at him and he gave me a creepy smile. After this, I spent the whole day looking behind my back, not leaving the side of my teacher. She didn't even understand why I didn't want to walk around the fair. I was on alert mode all the time, and thank god nothing happened. When I got home, I cried in my room like a baby. This was the end of the year, thankfully, and I switched schools again. I told this to my mom last year, and she was like, Yeah, it happens. It happened to me too when I was your age. So shocked how this is such a common thing. I'm now 28, and I still see Victor on the streets. He has followed me around a few times. I always walk in circles until I lose him, but sometimes he waits for me outside stores and restaurants. I think about what would happen to me at the book fair if I didn't have my teacher next to me the whole time, and wonder if one day he'll do something or just continue this creepy behavior. The story goes way back to 1998 when I was 16 years old. I was with my two friends, who I'll call Ben and Jake for privacy reasons. It was a late summer evening on a Saturday, and I was sitting in my room listening to some 80s rock, as teenagers back then would do. I got bored after some time and went outside to meet Ben and Jake. We were chilling in Ben's garage for a while, drinking beer and smoking a little pot. We got bored pretty quickly and went out to do some teenage shit. I remember we were walking down the narrow path by the woods that goes down towards the lake. Back in the late 90s, there was a popular hangout for teenagers there, so we were hoping to see some other kids there. When we arrived, there was no one there except the sound of crickets in the taller grass. We sat on the bench for a while and just talked for about 15 minutes when Jake wanted to go to an old fishing hut by the lake. We all agreed on going inside and exploring it. We entered the hut. 
While Jake and Ben were walking around and breaking shit, I couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. We went upstairs where there was an old wooden boat laying there with the fishing net over it. We were kind of checking it out when all of a sudden we heard the wooden door to the hut creak open. We could hear heavy footsteps entering down below, followed by heavy breathing. We all stopped dead in our tracks and almost held our breath. There was around a five second break that felt like an eternity when suddenly the man spoke in a drunken voice. I know you're here. Come out, come out wherever you are, you little brats. The heavy footsteps started to walk towards the stairs as the older floor creaked underneath. Jake went inside the wooden boat and the rest of us followed. We put the fishing net over our heads and didn't move. The man arrived upstairs and we could hear him stumbling around. I can hear you. We were sitting dead still, but I could feel the fear in all of us. The man was walking around moving stuff. I was thinking of a plan to escape without being caught, but we were literally sitting ducks. Suddenly, we could feel the fishing net being ripped off. Here you are. Jake reacted the fastest and pushed him away, and the man fell onto his back. We ran like hell out of there and through the tall grass into the woods. We could hear the man give a chase, but gave up, probably due to his drunken state. We all went back to Ben's garage and fell onto the couch, exhausted. Jake told us that the man dropped a knife as he fell onto the floor. We all just sat in shock for the rest of the night. To this day, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Jake didn't push him. Recently, I feel like my dog was uninterested in our usual walk route, so I took him to a different area of the town. Everything was fine, but a guy approached me. He made small talk, asked me if he could pet my dog, and I didn't feel unsafe as it was still daytime with a few people out, so I let him. Pretty much right after, he just left. It was strange, no buy or anything, just walked away. Later when I got home, I was getting texts from a number that I never heard of. This gets creepy as it's happened to other women, but the guy looked at my dog's tag for a split second, memorized my number. Creepy from the get-go, but he was so casual about it, like it was a normal thing to do. Even though I blocked his number, I still have had run-ins with him in places far away from the original spot so I'm pretty sure he followed me home without my knowledge and kept track of places I frequent. I'm getting the police involved, so don't worry, ladies. I know I can't really say much, but don't have a schedule that you follow to a T every day and keep a hawk eye on anyone that pets your dog or flat out reject it. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in NSW. We would go there every school holidays and there were many kids that I used to run around and play with. I have fond memories of this place where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss. But other memories are not so good and now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people who owned the caravan park had a son. He was roughly 25 years old and I would have been around 5 or 6. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's rubbish on a tractor and do other odd jobs like this to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he'd pull up when I was playing out front and ask if I wanted a ride on the tractor. I, being young and naive, of course, accepted it and jumped on because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor? This is back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision and you'd just come back home when the streetlights came on. One day when he dropped me back off at our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by my arm and yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me, I don't want you hanging around that man again, he said, without saying why. But he's nice. He gives me lollies, I said. Just don't. I'm telling you. Don't talk to him. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to a nice man who only gave me tractor rides, gave me lollies and hugs, and sometimes, the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, 
My dad said I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. To which she smirked and replied, Oh yeah? Why is that? Fast forward nearly 14 years later, my family and I are watching the news when the man's face flashes across the screen, attached to a story where he killed two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, look at this, look at this. I knew it was bad news. There was always just something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on the tractor? My blood ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part, he killed people with pills he would call his lollies. Please always listen to your parents. I would be dead by now if it wasn't for them. Hi there. I'm a longtime listener, reader, and finally wanted to share my story. I hope it's allowed on the subreddit as it's something that has truly stuck with me for over 10 years now. My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from LA up the west coast and then went back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation road trip style. One night, we were traveling through Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around a while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't to bring your own UV light, if you know what I mean. My mom and dad found a place that looked okay and went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night, while my sister and I stayed in the car to listen to music on our iPods. We were bopping around to the Frey album I bought that day when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom, what is she doing? I look out the window and can see into the reception of the motel. I see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with the staff wherever we go, so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I told my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard or something, as if her hypervigilant senses had kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad got back into the car and discussed what to do about staying the night. My dad stated that we wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we'd better just stay here. Plus, it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, she said. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place, until my mom finally snaps and yells over my dad saying, we are not staying here. Fucking hell, fine, my dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other like, what the fuck just happened? But we stay quiet as my mom seemed on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that my mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we were all bustling around the motel room getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV to hear a story on the news about a shooting at the motel that my mom didn't want to stay at. Turns out about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked the last room and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all turned and looked at my mom who was standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place, she said to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. Moral of the story is, always trust your gut, or better, your mother's gut. This is a story as told by my dad. My dad was a younger teenager at the time and was riding on the bus in Chicago. A man got on and sat in the seat across the aisle from him. He turned to him and started to strike up a conversation. My dad says that the hairs on the back of his neck raised and he seriously got a creepy vibe from him. The man was all smiles and charm and was asking my dad more increasingly personal questions. Luckily, before things got too personal or creepy, my dad stop came and he enthusiastically noped off the bus and forgot about this. It wasn't until years later, 1978, the year I was born, that he saw on the news that the same creepy guy 
affectionately known by children as Pongo the Clown and Patches the Clown, had a thing for teenage boys. His name was John Wayne Gacy. Here's another creepy detail. My dad is best friends with a guy who happened to live across the street from Gacy as a child and teenager. He confirms that Gacy was a creepy dude. He also confirmed that his parents observed the police and forensics going to work on Gacy's basement and painstakingly removing 26 teenage boys from the crawl space. Sweet home Chicago. Stay safe and listen to your inner voice. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residential building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel. So two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were for student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated. All the doors were powered with four AA batteries, if the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working the overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. He said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key card to his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest. He replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our systems to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but quickly learned from it. Later on in the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came back to the desk again and said that he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again, and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card, and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I had to change the batteries and went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name and I told him. He didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with a master key and told him to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really fucking weird, but I try not to think about it. I've changed the batteries for plenty of other doors by this point, and some of the students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be displayed for everyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent. I thought he might be an international student, since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, and maybe it was just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying that his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it and that there was something underneath it that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. It said there was a leak under the fridge. Just kept trying to get me to go down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up here in the morning to take a look at it and to check if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed, and in the most steady, chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay, you could take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away, trying to remain composed, and said, No thanks, I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping the fuck out of me, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me, or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped towards the door and closed it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, 
he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me, just focused on getting the fuck out of there. He once again tried to get me to follow him into the bedroom, saying that the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot the actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room, no dishes in his kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no bed sheets on the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back into the international student theory, thinking that he had just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathering the door kit and left. Before I reached the elevator, he came out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes on and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed. You need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went back inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got back to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room that he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in the back office and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait now that I knew that he wasn't a resident. He tore a corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on my desk and drew a flower on it and then put it on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back to the empty room and tried to convince them that he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously, he fucking didn't. That's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting and tried to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for his student card, and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove that he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell that he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave them was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street. And he said yes, but he couldn't tell them what building number it was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later and apartment 1200 does not exist. When security asked him his purpose of sneaking into a room, he just kept up with the ums and us and saying he didn't know. They asked, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anyone who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? He kept on fidgeting and saying, I don't know. No reason. I was just here. At one point, he tried to tell them that he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I had literally never seen him before this night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything, but it was still fucking unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured that that room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, the housekeeper came to the desk and told me they had found the door deadbolt open, the TV was on, and the housekeeper was inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left that night, and that's when the creep let himself into the building and found it. I never saw him again, and to this day I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the heebie-jeebies. In the summer of 2015, I was 33 years old. I was broke, jobless, in Mexico City. My entire life had gone steadily down the drain for the past couple of years, and my best friend had moved back to Europe. I was tired and bored, so when an online friend I had met in person two years before invited me to spend a month in his farmhouse in Norway, I accepted without hesitation. The deal was simple. In exchange for some work at the farm, I would get a pretty sweet holiday in a country I always, always wanted to visit. 
I had no problem doing labor work, and in fact, I was looking forward to do it and get my body back into some real action. Since I moved to Mexico City from Canada in 2011, I had been feeling rusty and soft. So I packed my suitcase, put on my boots, and said goodbye to Mexico City the best way I knew how, getting pissed drunk. I arrived at Stavanger in Norway, but my suitcase decided to go to Thailand instead. So after an hour of filling out reports and giving the address to my friend's house, I was able to walk out and meet him again. My friend Harold, he was standing there, confused and annoyed. He told me later that he was about to leave the airport, thinking I decided not to take the flight after all. I guess I was lucky. That night, I spent it with Harold and his friends in an oceanfront apartment in a quiet neighborhood in Stravanger, getting drunk on Norwegian beer and smoking hash. Disgusting shit if you ask me. I prefer the real thing. But anyways, I felt welcomed and content. The next day, Harold drove me all the way to his farmhouse about an hour south of Stavanger in a community called Eggersund. At least I think that's the name of the place I was in. Norwegian names and addresses are weird if you're not too familiar with them. The land Harold owned was huge and beautiful. Not really sure how it all works, but in his property, there's a lighthouse that attracts a lot of tourists from all over Europe. The house itself was small, located on the top of a hill with a huge barn next to it. Harold lived alone in a two-story house, but I was told the basement housed a tenant. As soon as I glanced to the basement window, I got a strange feeling of dread. There was a webcam facing the driveway, and the rest of the windows were covered with boxes and papers, but I decided not to mention it since Harold didn't seem to care. I just assumed the guy was an eccentric man, or maybe was just a normal precaution considering we were more or less in the middle of nowhere, with the neighboring houses separated by big fields. I took my mind off of it and focused on the joy of being in Norway. After being installed in one of the bedrooms upstairs, I was informed that week Harold's son's wedding was going to be celebrated, and thus, the house was going to be filled with the bride's family. In general, it was great to meet them, but on my second night, when everyone had gone to sleep and Harold and I were still chatting and drinking beer, I got to meet the tenant, Olaf. Harold had been having some troubles with his new smartphone, and apparently Olaf was tech savvy and indeed had been the one purchasing the phone for Harold. We went downstairs to Olaf's basement. Now, Harold kept telling me he didn't like Olaf, and was actually upset by the way Olaf kept the newly remodeled basement. But from what I understood, they kinda had a relationship more than just a landlord tenant. The basement was dark, all the windows were covered, and piles of junk cluttered the entire place. The bedroom was full of computer parts and electronic junk. He had blinking and beeping. Olaf invited us to sit down, and when he turned on his desk lamp to check Harold's phone, I got my first real look of him. He was in his mid-40s, but looked older. Shaved head, really skinny, big nose, and deep shadows under his eyes. He had an entire look of a meth addict. I should know, since I worked in a recovery house in British Columbia, Canada. I had seen the same face back then in people who were dealing with some severe addictions. The way he stuttered only confirmed further my observations and I decided I had to keep an eye on him. My gut told me right then and there that he was trouble. Olaf finished with Harold's phone and then directed his attention to me. He asked if I wanted to see some porn, to which I declined entirely. I just wanted to leave the dark oppressive basement. Harold laughed a drunken laughter and asked Olaf if he had gay porn, to which Olaf said he didn't care about the sexualities of the videos, he simply liked to see people getting things introduced in them. When he said it, I got chills running down my spine and asked myself if he meant that in just a sexual way or if there was a more ominous meaning to it, but we didn't stay to find out. Harold had a busy day the next day and I was tired and thoroughly creeped out by Olaf when we were back in the house, I asked Harold if he trusted his friend, to which Harold answered that Olaf wasn't his friend. He was just an addict running the basement. The government paid Harold the rent, and a nurse visited him twice a week to bring his medication. After dropping that bomb, he said goodnight and went to his bedroom. I tried not to think about Olaf, but between my gut feeling and him popping in the house unannounced when everyone else was out preparing for the wedding that weekend, 
I couldn't really relax. The first time he went inside was to give me a flash drive with movies he had illegally downloaded from the internet. He made sure to emphasize the illegal part. The second time he seemed high and wanted to simply let me know if I needed something I could ask him for anything but asked me not to tell Harold about him going upstairs. He said that and then walked out very slowly and carefully as if he knew he would fall if he rushed. When the wedding was over and the house was empty again, except Harold and me, the encounters with Olaf became stranger and more often. One time I was in the kitchen fixing myself some breakfast. I turned around to find Olaf standing in the kitchen door bleeding from his nose and staring at me. I jumped out of my skin and dropped my breakfast, making a huge mess. He didn't seem to notice, but simply started babbling incoherently while directing his cloudy eyes to the ceiling on top of my head. I was petrified, trying to think of a train of actions that wouldn't trigger a violent response from him when he simply turned around and quietly walked out of the house. I started to lock the doors whenever I was alone in the house after that day. When I told Harold about this, he got visibly mad and went downstairs to talk and yell at Olaf. Harold told me that he didn't really like him to have the basement and that he tried to kick him out several times but the government always ruled against evicting Olaf and Harold's sister was mostly responsible for it. She felt bad for the guy and was 100% on Olaf's side just because he had the same name as her father. Go figure. So Harold had to learn to live with him in the basement but only because Olaf was supposed to be clean and in treatment for his addiction. After that day, Olaf stopped being friendly with me and became just a cold, invasive presence in my life. There was one day when I was in the barn chatting with a couple of Harold's friends when Olaf entered the barn to place his laptop and some homemade looking gadget by the window. Despite no one asking him, he began to explain to us that he was using it to hack into other people's networks and get their Wi-Fi passwords. You know, like everyone does, right? He gave me a nasty glare and then stormed out. I turned to Harold's friends and told him that I was completely afraid of him and I had this feeling that he would attack me one day. Harold's friends told me that that would never happen but if I ever felt like I was in real danger, I could give them a call and they would pick me up. We exchanged numbers, hugged and said our goodbyes for the night. The next days, things between Harold and I turned sour, mostly because I didn't feel safe anymore and I had expressed my wish to his dad go to Germany to visit a man who is now my husband. Apparently, Harold had hoped for us to grow closer but had failed to let me know. In the end, I was exhausted and didn't want to deal with that anymore. I should mention that Harold has severe alcoholism that I wasn't aware of before until I spent a month seeing him get filthy wasted on a daily basis. To some, that might be attractive, but not to me. So altogether, the situation was bad, and I wanted out. I had done my job. I had done nothing wrong, and I wanted to be able to relax away from both of them. That night, I decided to organize my flight to Germany from Norway. Harold went out to get drunk and didn't come back until the morning the next day. I tried to stay up and wait for him to talk, but I must have fallen asleep at some point. I woke up to the sound of the front door being closed and caught a glance of him walking towards the barn with a dog and a six pack of beers through the living room window. I then tried to send him a message through Facebook but discovered the internet was down. That's weird, I thought, and the whole time I had been there, the internet never failed, not even once. I went to the router and restarted it a couple times to no avail. I decided to let it be. Maybe Harold had cut the internet as a way of drunk childish punishment. So I would just have to get on with my morning routine and have breakfast before going to knock on the barn door. That would give him some time to blow off some steam, I thought. I went downstairs to the bathroom, got comfortably naked and jumped into the shower, ready to refresh myself and sing a couple of songs to lift my spirits in preparation for all the grim talk that awaited me with Harold. Halfway through the first song, I hear a loud bang coming from the front door, followed by someone screaming my name. I thought Harold must be pissed drunk and angry. I sighed while turning off the shower, thinking I was going to have a long argument, when the bathroom door slammed open and I saw to my horror, Olaf coming in with a completely deranged expression on his face, wielding the big cutter knife. 
the kind of employees used in warehouses to open boxes. For a few seconds, I couldn't think or focus on anything other than a knife in his hands and the fact that I was naked, wet and cornered in a small bathroom in the middle of nowhere in Norway. I was paralyzed. My biggest fear was actually happening. I couldn't scream or move. Just staring at the knife, he kept pulling and pushing, making that now horrifying noise those blades do when operated. I was just about to pass out when Olaf's screams brought me back to the gravity of the situation. He was yelling, accusing me of playing with Harold's feelings. He was calling me a liar, a filthy Mexican, and throwing in some threats about cutting me open and fucking me up if I tried to take anything from Harold. That, I think, is what got my gears moving once again. He called me a thief. I can be called whatever, but I'm not a thief, and I'm not a liar. So I'm standing there getting myself angry at the psycho in front of me, threatening my life. My training from the recovery house in Canada kicked in. I remember the rules when dealing with alter addicts. Make eye contact. Keep your hands down so you don't startle them. Speak in a calm but dominant voice and always, always refer to them by their name. And that's exactly what I did. Despite the fear and the certainty of me being stabbed to death, I stared at him in his cloudy, crazy wide open eyes and said, Olaf, you are a thief. You are the one that keeps stealing Harold's silverware. Olaf, you are the one that keeps breaking into his house. Olaf, Harold is not your friend. Olaf, Harold doesn't want you living here. It was a long shot, but it worked. My words made him confused and I was able to take one, one single step forward, making him take one small step back. He then charged at me again with his rant and wielded his knife to my chest and neck. I could feel the cold sweat dripping down my back and a burning void forming in my stomach every time he launched at me with that knife, but I didn't flinch. I stood my ground and kept repeating the same words to him, every time gaining another step, pushing him little by little out of the bathroom. He might have noticed what I was doing, but by then it was too late. When he took that last step out of the bathroom door frame, I moved as fast as my terrorized body allowed me and slammed the door shut on his stupid crooked nose. I locked it immediately and pushed my body against it with all my body weight. While a storm of curses, punches, and kicks rained on that little farmhouse door. I remember praying to a god that I didn't really believe in to hold the door in its place and to keep the psycho outside. There was nothing I could use in that bathroom to defend myself. Nothing against an infuriated, high psychopath wielding a knife and a possibly broken nose. After what seemed like an eternity, I heard and felt a last strong kick to the door and then, to my relief, he stormed out of the house with a loud bang of the front door, announcing his exit. However, I stayed put for another 20 minutes, not able to breathe or think of anything else than keeping the door closed. I wanted to puke, but I couldn't move. Eventually, my senses came back and I knew I had to act quickly. I opened the door of the bathroom, flew upstairs, got dressed, and then exited the house through the window to the garden. I knew he could hear me moving on the first floor and they had that stupid camera spying the driveway. I jumped to the garden, jumped up fence and ran around the house to the barn. I kicked and banged, screaming for Harold to let me in, but it was useless. The drunk fuck was living his drama and I needed help, so I ran all the way to the next house where the sister lived, rang the bell, and when she opened it, I explained to her the best way I could about what just happened. She didn't speak a word of English, so it was a comical exchange for about 10 minutes until her expression shifted from confusion to absolute terror mirroring my own. She walked me to the barn, opened the door, commanded Harold to guard me, and went straight to the basement to confront Olaf. I was shocked and shaking, still trying to explain to Harold what just happened. His drunken state was gone by the time I had finished explaining. He too went to the basement and I could just hear screams. They took Olaf out. The sister and her husband got Olaf into the car and took him away. Harold stayed with me all day. I drank so much beer but I simply couldn't get drunk. I wanted to get drunk. I wanted to forget but I simply couldn't. I was told that Olaf admitted having a knife and that his intentions were to make me fight him. 
So in reality, he wanted an excuse to stab the life out of my naked butt. After all, he liked to see people having things introduced in them, right? That night, I slept in the house while Harold kept guard of the house. I had some tools with me to defend myself, and of course, I slept fully dressed. It was a horrible night. The next morning, we went to the police to file a report. But even the cops seemed baffled and couldn't believe something like that could happen in their small, peaceful, picture-perfect community. But they believed me, and the cop who took my statement asked me if there was somewhere I could go. Well, this was all sorted out. I told them, in fact, I was planning to visit Germany the very next day. The last day, I barely spoke with Harold. I didn't blame him, but he told me that in his drunken state, he had told Olaf that I was leaving and that he was sad about it. Since Olaf had been doing drugs all night, he understood it as he had to defend Harold. So he, Olaf, cut off the internet, waited for me to go in the shower, and went upstairs to do his job. I left Norway without a single word, without looking back. They told me I could testify via Skype whenever the trial started. So they took my information and promised me justice would be served. It's been more than a year now, and I've never heard back from the police. When I asked Harold about it, he told me the police dropped the case for a lack of evidence, and Olaf is back in Harold's basement doing whatever it is he does. Life goes on. I was angry for a while, but even anger goes away after a while, if there's nothing to burn. I tried to focus on the good things of life, and life itself. Every day is now a gift, or a chance, but the shadow of fear has never really left me. I keep looking over my shoulder, keep studying people just in case I have to defend myself. I still have a sense of dread whenever I take a shower, especially at a gym where I'm more vulnerable. I can't help thinking that anyone else would have ended up a bloody corpse in a pool of blood in the shower. I noticed for hours until someone had to use that bathroom. If I had done something different, if Olaf hadn't been so high to be intimidated by my words, that bloated corpse would have been me. I still don't know how to get rid of that thought, but I try. All I know is Olaf is free, and I really, really, really don't want to ever meet him again. Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga and had a beautiful girlfriend. He seemed very balanced and healthy. I'll name him Coworker A. We had another longtime coworker who was sort of Mr. Popular with the managers, but honestly, super annoying. Really large personality. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, I'll name him Coworker B. Now, before I explain, I should include this workplace sucked. It barely holds a single star on a deed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly into a year of coworker A's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friends to another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things. But something was really out of place when he mentioned his beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him who was super rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's just trolling. Fast forward a few weeks. Fast forward a few weeks, coworker A has seemingly took a lot of interest in coworker B and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in more of an endearing way kind of copying his silly dances and laughing, seemed harmless. But as months ago past, he continues to dance more and more to the point that he had even been asked to stop by the supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings using the same mannerisms and phrases as coworker B. This really started to creep out coworker B to the point that he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but coworker A was very vocal against substance use, including alcohol, weed, etc. He was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when coworker B ends up getting a new hire at work. She ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together, etc. This is when coworker A shows up at work using coworker B's name, even signing himself in on the logbooks as him. 
referring to himself as B all morning. Then later in the day, he stands up on a work table screaming, I'm in love with co-worker B's girlfriend's name. With his arms spread out in the cross Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place went silent, and after he ended up standing in the corner with a broom sweeping nothing for several hours, he wouldn't turn around from the corner either, not even if he tapped his shoulder or called him by name. The only time I saw him away from the corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last ones out of the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him, and he was looking directly at me, head tilt down, making a snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided coworker A needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guard who I'm friends with told me A was showing up in the middle of the night trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 or 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, coworker A comes back to work and seems somewhat normal, almost like he had no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be, but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wanky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with coworker A, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me and go for a hike, throw axes at trees, etc. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I had to get back to him on that as I was secretly a little on edge. He asked me later that day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations. He said, well I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then. And I laughed not knowing how to react at all. I told my manager about that, and he kind of scratched his head uncontrollably and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, coworker A ends up finding coworker B's address due to a work get together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to coworker A. They would eventually find rocks and sticks in weird formations on their doorstep, like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was A. Things got really weird when we actually found A looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out B's name, repeatedly whispering, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire A. Four years later, coworker A still stalks coworker B's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. The place has got shut down since. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends messages to each one of us as well saying, Hey, it's B from work. So I guess my question is, what would you call this behavior? And how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? But what would his diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he does not seem to, but he sure as hell remembers B's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one and only one. I'm the bigger one. She's the smaller one. He was put on this earth essentially to save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from his family or anything and is working on a new job, living alone unintended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. About five years ago, I worked at a high-end kitchenware company as a floor salesperson. At the time, I was about 20 years old. I'm a female, and this matters later. I'm a larger woman, dress size 26 approximately, and I'm 5'9". I'm also mixed indigenous, so picture thick hair, dark features, wide build, etc. Again, important for later. I have been working at this job for a few months at this point. My boss, who, side note, is a total creep, had really warmed up to me and promoted me to the key holder within a few weeks of working. I had been comfortable closing on my own and working alone too. Often I'd either be working the full day shift, 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. alone, or I'd work the crossover shift where I'd overlap with someone, 
for about an hour and then I closed the store alone. That shift was from 4 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. One evening I came in, greeted my boss. He then decided to take a smoke break for about 25 minutes within the last hour of overlap. I didn't mind, as I mentioned before, the guy was a total creep. But as he was leaving, I noticed a kind of strangely behavior man pacing outside our store. Our location was inside the mall so you get window shoppers all the time, but this guy was pacing with intention. He was wearing a large jacket, sunglasses, and a hat, so it was generally hard to see him, but he would occasionally lower his glasses to peer into the store. I even tried calling out to him from behind the desk at one point, saying something like, I don't bite, come on in, in a friendly way. He shook his head and said, just looking, in a low but clear voice. He backed away, leaving the storefront. I brushed it off as some rando just being too nervous to come into our store. Whatever, happens all the time. It was at this point my boss returned from his smoke break and began finishing up a couple of his end of day tasks before leaving. I mentioned to him that I accidentally scared off a nervous window shopper. We kind of laughed it off and disregarded it as nothing, but something felt weird. He was pacing for a solid 20 minutes just by the window staring in, although it's retail. I chalked it up to weirdness. After a few minutes, my phone rang and I picked it up. On the other end was a guy with a low and clear voice huffing as if he had been running, asking about getting gifts for his girlfriend. The conversation goes as follows. Oh, no worries. We have a couple of options for gifts. Is she looking for knives? Dining wear? Uh, uh, don't know. She liked knives, I guess. Okay, if you're not sure what she already has, you can get her a specialty knife. Fuck. God, yeah. Sorry. Specialty knives. I know I should have hung up on him at this point. It's okay. Yeah, so, specialty knives. We have an assortment. Some are meant for meat and fish. Others are for vegetables. Does she cook a lot? Fucking slide that dick up inside you, babe. Excuse me? You look like you're a fat whore. Fat bitch is gonna get this cock. Your little blue shirt and blazer are gonna be shredded when I'm done rip- At that point, I promptly hung up the phone, shaking and nervously looking around. My boss knew something was up and asked me what was wrong. I told him what just happened, and he expressed his apologies, but otherwise didn't seem concerned. It clicked in my head suddenly. The guy window shopping earlier had the same voice as the guy on the call. I was petrified. I told my boss I was near certain it was the same guy. At that exact moment, my boss got a call from his very young girlfriend. That story is for another day. He had to leave 15 minutes earlier than planned. So there I was, alone in the store and stuck for another four and a half hours. The stars were not aligned for me this evening. I ended up calling security and letting him know that I received a threatening call from a customer who I was fairly sure was wandering the mall. They stationed an officer outside the store for the remainder of the evening, but I still felt entirely on edge. Every call that I got, I let go to voicemail. I was too scared to answer again. I was also working in another store, game store, in the mall at this time. I called my friend there to ask if after their closing shift, I could walk home with them. He lived a block behind me, and he agreed. I quickly walked over to the store with a security guard nearby. I started to walk home with my friend. The whole time I was scanning my surroundings, getting glimpses of shadowy figures outside and making myself anxious. Eventually I got home, calmed myself down, and tried to get some rest. The next day I had to shift at my other job with the same friend who walked me home. At one point in the afternoon I picked up the phone and they called us from the same guy. I much more quickly realized who it was and hung up the phone a lot faster than the first time around. But he got as far as saying, I like this uniform better. I can see more of those curves without. Then I hung up. Our dress code was a t-shirt and jeans or leggings. I was wearing a shirt and jeans. I told my boss at the game store about what happened and we made an official buddy system after that. Nobody leaves alone ever. Luckily, we worked in pairs. We would not separate until we were either at a bus stop or at home. Nothing happened after that, thankfully. It was just awful having it happen back to back like that with no conclusion. The security guard stayed on alert for a while. I ended up speaking to another female worker in the mall. 
and it turns out there was a handful of plus size women getting harassed and violent phone calls for a little while, but they never caught a guy doing it. I still think about this years later. I wonder where he is and what he's doing. I never saw him again, I don't think at least, and if I did, I wouldn't have known. Anyways, feels good to get off my chest finally. When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day, this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started to talk to me at the cash register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it, and he asked me if it was short for anything. I said yes, and told him my full name. He asked me what kind of name it is. My name originates from a Greek name, so I told him that, because it's kind of interesting. He asked me if I've ever been to the Greek festival in our city. I said no, and he replied, Well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point, I'm 16, and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up at the coffee shop every day and ask my coworkers when I would be coming in or if I would not be coming in that day. Eventually, he would start sitting in the seat right next to the front door waiting for me to come in. One day, he physically stood and blocked my path and asked if he could buy coffee for me. Yes, at the coffee shop I worked at and then tried to grab my hand. When I decided to walk past to go to the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room. He would hang out there for a few hours watching me and would constantly try to talk to me. My managers eventually told me to work in the back until he left every day, and then he started sitting in a seat that was closest to the back room. After that, I started coming into work through the back door and staying until he left. My coworkers would tell him that I quit hoping that he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls and the cycle started over again. Truthfully, he didn't seem that harmful except the time he grabbed my hand, but it was creepy and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end because no matter what he did or told him, it didn't stop him and he was just there watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order he was still allowed into the plaza the coffee shop was located in, but obviously not into the coffee shop at all. And we usually saw him go into the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. Very creepy and kind of scary as a 16 year old girl. Hey everyone, first time poster. It's not the scariest, but it's one of the weirdest that left me with a strange feeling. So this is about the weirdest job interview I've ever had. This happened sometime after February 2018. My brother's community college was having a job fair and I went thinking, hey, this is legit. I'm gonna go, take some resumes and see what happens. So we're at the fair, a couple of cool booths, people looking for photographers, etc. We come across this table. I asked what they do. We work in contracts and entertainment, or something like that. I hand the guy my resume. He looks at me and puts it down, doesn't even look at the resume. He wants to schedule an interview with me, so I agree. I have to add, at the time, I wasn't doing well mentally. I was in the middle of what you would now call an emotional mental breakdown and not eating, etc. So y'all can imagine what I look like. But nonetheless, I secure the interview I do some internet research and find that this company does not have a digital footprint besides their super bare bones website. Nothing on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Indeed, nothing. The job interview was in a random building right off the freeway. So I show up and there's no parking near the building. So I park in the neighborhood, go to the building and there's this guy, I would say in his mid forties. He is friendly and helps me figure out how to get to the floor I'm supposed to be on. I thanked him and went up. When I get to the floor, I realized I forgot my resume, so I leave the building and walk back to my car. When I make my way back to the building, I see the same guy just standing by a window of the building, just standing there and staring into nothing. He seemed surprised that I was behind him and not upstairs. Then I go into the job interview room. 
On the front desk lady is blonde, in basically a spaghetti strap shirt and black pants. She interviews me, and the strangest thing is, this woman is tweaker skinny. And this isn't a body shame or anything. She was just so thin, it didn't seem normal. Now, when I first met the guy at the job fair, they were in suits, dressed sharply, and said they worked with DirecTV. And during the interview, they basically said they're handing out Obama phones on the street. The whole office was decorated in basic Target decorations, some I saw later at a Target. Then the next week, they scheduled me for a full interview, and there's the same old dude, but this time, he's interviewing, and has the same panicked look on his face like last time. At the front desk this day is another young woman, better dressed, but just as tweaker skinny, and much more on the, this job is so amazing, I loved my job. My interview this time is some young guy in his early 20s wearing a suit two sizes too big, comically so. The guy gave me an interview that was basically the same interview as before, and they were going to start my onboarding. Something felt weird, and something told me to just say no, so I ended up bailing. But damn, does this interview still stand in my head? I emailed the community college about it later, but basically what they told me was, we can't fix if people at our job fairs lie to us about their jobs. Which having worked at a college department that had job fairs really concerned me. How do they not verify the people who show up? I know in my old department, they would painstakingly verify the people there. To this day, I'm still worried about this. How many other college students have met these people? What was their exact goal? Why were all the female staff so thin? Why did they have no social media footprint for an entertainment-centered company? How many people actually fell for this? And what exactly did I almost get myself into? I work with disabled and vulnerable adults. One time I was grabbing a drink with a friend, Joe, and he asked if I could work with his girlfriend, Jane. Jane and I got on like a house on fire. She had some physical disabilities, but also had some mental health issues leading to her being pre-described antipsychotics. Joe was practically on top of Jane's medicine as he trained to be a mental health nurse. He had me filling in sheets as if I was working in a psych ward at their house rather than the private residence. Usually, I simply make sure people I work with take their meds. Sometimes, if they're on controlled drugs, I might fill in a tick box, but he had full-on sheets that I was expected to fill in as a nurse would. Over time, I realized how controlling Joe was and how he used Jane's mental health against her. Gradually, I realized that if he attended doctor's appointments with her, she would get an increase in meds. And if I attended with her, this didn't happen. Joe was getting me stressed out with how useless I was, not putting items back into the cupboards perfectly, making spelling mistakes, or missing punctuation on the over-the-top med sheets. I didn't notice how quite off balance he was keeping me, but I was very stressed out. So stressed out that I had several episodes of insomnia. One of these episodes, the doctors concluded led me to hallucinations twice while waking up. The doctor gave me sleeping pills and the hallucinations didn't come back. When I saw Joe hit Jane for the first time, I did have the wherewithal to call social services, but Jane claimed it didn't happen. Joe said I misunderstood what was going on and that I didn't have any right to interfere in their relationship. The first time Jane left, he claimed I had undue influence over her and he left me checking words I had said in case I somehow was influencing her as a vulnerable person. Joe pinned me against the wall by my throat because I tried to prevent him from hitting her. I knew that I needed to leave, so I mentally gave Jane until January to leave him and then I would stop working there. I registered a complaint with Joe's nursing course about his treatment of the vulnerable. She left him before Christmas. By June, without him influencing her doctors, she had been taken off all the psych meds and didn't have any episodes since she had left, almost as if the stressor wasn't present. Her physical disabilities improved significantly as well in the years since she left. That's because of the lack of unnecessary psych meds. I haven't worked for Jane in years as she moved away to marry a lovely bloke. I do work for a young adult who is apprenticing in the workplace 
and for the first six months has me in the breakout area identifying anything a disability charity can provide for access needs. His colleagues chat away to me on their breaks, including one who is a very proud daughter. The daughter has a colleague used to provide fun tales of dumbasses who came to work hung over nature. Then the colleague turned up to work while drunk and high at a psych ward. Then the colleague boasted about keeping an ex-girlfriend interfering friend quiet by feeding the girlfriend drugs so she didn't call social services on him. The daughter has made a complaint. Then I got to see a photo of this colleague. Of course, it's Joe. And I'm stuck here thinking about those times I hallucinated due to insomnia. Or did he put something in my tea? Might be completely unsupervised. Jada, my supervisor, was about to take off for the night. She kept repeating the same instructions over and over. Then again, this place had huge turnover. Maybe she honestly forgot I wasn't that new. No phones, she urged. If you got a slow night, make yourself useful. Nod and smile. I decided to get the worst tasks out of the way early. Cleaning the bathroom, restocking the freezers, taking out the trash checking the receipt rolls, watering the plants. Took me about an hour. It wasn't even midnight yet, and I was pretty much done for the night. I considered mopping the floor, but I figured I could save that for later. I'd been useful enough. I was on my fourth game of Team Flight Tactics when I realized I'd forgotten my name tag. No big deal, really, but I figured I'd might as well fetch it. The manager's office was usually locked, but tonight I had the keys to it. I opened the door and started going through the drawers. Didn't take long to find the name tags. There was an entire box of them. At first, I thought they were all blanks, but as I started going through them, I realized they were all previous employees. Sure, this place had high turnover, but this? We were talking a hundred people. Easy. This was ridiculous. I admit, this is where I started asking myself some questions. During the day shift, there was always someone new, someone being trained or interviewed. I had only been there for about a week, and I was already feeling like a veteran. The only people who seemed to be regulars were the managers, Jada, Kenny, and Alicia. They seemed decent enough. So why were there so many people quitting? As I got back behind the register, I realized there was a customer outside, literally just standing outside the door. I waved at them. There was something off. They were just standing there, but they were so close that the automated door should have opened, and yet, the door remained closed. It was a man, late thirties, scraggly beard, rough red shirt, bit of a chunky look with sunken bloodshot eyes and a natural frown. He just stared at me. I waved at him again, but I got no response. Can I help you? I called out. Nothing. Not a blink. I pulled out a chair and sat down. The man stayed outside, looking in. I tried not to think about it, but it was bothering me. I couldn't see his car anywhere on the cameras, and he didn't seem to want anything. I couldn't tell if he was on drugs or just being weird. I gave him a few minutes, but he just stood there. Finally, I got up from my chair. Sir, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. He didn't seem to listen. He was a bit shorter than me, but he had a good 50 pounds on me. He'd be trouble in a brawl. I don't want to call the police, I said. Can I help you, sir? I pulled out my phone and held it up for him to see. I dialed the number and held it up for him to see. But still, nothing. Then, my phone rang. Unknown caller. It was just past midnight. Without letting the unnerving man out of my sight, I took the call. Yeah, I answered. Please don't hang up, a voice on the other end said. You're in danger, and I can help. I was getting nervous. I wandered back and forth, watching those bloodshot eyes follow me. Who is this? I asked. I'm Angie, the voice responded. I used to work there. Same shift, same managers. 
I wanted to warn you. I'd seen an Angie tag in the box earlier, maybe even several. She sounded young and nervous as all hell. In a few hours, something terrible is going to happen, she continued. And if you're not out by then, you might as well be dead. What are you talking about? Look outside. I'd been looking outside this entire time, but I'd been entirely focused on this one man outside the front door. From across the road, I could see more people, about a dozen, lumbering out of the woods. I need you to leave, she said. Just walk out. Nothing will happen if you just walk away. Nothing will come for you. Who? Who are these people? What's going to happen? I... I don't know what... Look, she interrupted. It is perfectly simple. Just walk out the door. Something in my head screamed for me not to do it. That I shouldn't step outside and just walk past these people. They felt malicious, and I couldn't put my finger on why. Still, I stepped up to the door. Leaving seemed like the obvious choice. Strangely, it didn't open. It won't open, I said. Hold on. They... They want to keep you in there. They don't want you to leave. They want you to stay and die. Die? I asked. What do you mean? I stopped my pacing. Something was wrong. Was I locked in? Tell me exactly what is about to happen. I demanded. Something is in there with you. Angie sighed. It could be five minutes. It could be a few hours. But that thing... In there is coming for you. And what thing are we talking about? The man with bloodshot eyes had two people joining him. A young man with a grotesque overbite and a young woman who could easily be mistaken for a child. All of them stared at me with the same broken eyes and rough clothes. They stopped, inches short from the door. It doesn't have a name, Angie said, but it'll leave you empty. It'll leave you like the people out front. But if I leave, I'll be okay. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Hold on, I'll check the back. I hurried out back to the employee entrance. I pressed down on the cold handle and the door swung open. Outside were another group of four people. Two young men, an older woman, and a girl no more than 16 years old. They all stared at me. I couldn't tell if they were drawn to me or the store. I stopped short of stepping through the door. Why do... do they come here? I asked Angie. They serve their master. They want the spoils. What spoils? What? I thought about it. She was talking about me. Right, I said, nodding to myself. I see. Are you at the back door? Are you there yet? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Just walk out, she whispered. It's not too late. I was just about to walk out when a thought hit me. Why would they lock the front door but not the back? That didn't make any sense. If the purpose was to keep me here, they could easily barricade the back as well. Something didn't add up. The door is open, I said. Great, you can still make it. Why wouldn't they lock the back door, Angie? She hesitated and there was a brief pause. If they're locking me in here to hurt me, why wouldn't they lock the back door? I repeated. I don't know, she said, but you have to trust me. They gave me the keys, Angie. They go everywhere. I can lock and unlock this door a hundred times. What's going on? They, they don't usually do that. I closed the door and stepped back. Four less pairs of eyes staring at me. Look, said Angie. I was the last person to leave. They messed up. I found a spare key and got out before it was too late. Maybe, maybe they figured I'd warn you. Maybe they're trying to trick you. Sure, yeah. I chuckled. Convenient. I'm trying to help you, she cried out. Those things out there are to discourage you from going outside. They're harmless, but they're there to scare you. Can't you see it as all just a way for them to keep you in there? I got one person screaming at me to go outside, and no one telling me to stay. No locked doors, just plenty of creeps staring at me. 
What am I supposed to believe? Fine. You want more proof? Call the police. Hang up and call them. I ended the call. There were eight people out front by now, all gathering outside the front door. I couldn't tell if they were trying to get in or if they were waiting for me to step out. I called the emergency services, only to be met with silence. Not even a dial tone, just a blank nothing. I tried a few more numbers. My mom, my friends. I tried going online, but all I got was cached copies of sites I'd been to before. My background picture had changed to a black screen, but there was something else. Something had started to smell. The freshly stocked frozen goods had suddenly gone bad, and a stench was oozing out of the freezers. Our flowers by the counter had withered and died, all except the sunflowers, which turned to sickly blue. I wasn't getting through to anyone. Being inside was awful. The single-serving frozen meals were making me gag, I figured I'd go for the landline. As I got to the manager's office, I got another call on my phone. Unknown caller. Looking back and forth between my phone and the landline, I weighed my options. I chose Angie. How were you getting through? I asked her. How do you know my number? I still got the email password. I just checked your application. But how come your number works? Everything else is down. I'm calling from a private network, she said. They don't know there's a way in. They? I asked. I thought it was just one thing. No, they're working together. People just go missing without someone noticing. So there's like a... an intelligence behind it? A conspiracy? Yeah, people come and go in these places all the time. Are they paying you under the table? They figured, um... It was sort of a trial, and no paperwork, no missing people, no records, just a box of name tags. It made sense in a way, but I needed more. I needed proof. There had to be something. Why didn't you call me earlier? I asked. You could have called me as soon as I got the job or, or as soon as my shift started. I had to make sure Jada wasn't around, she said. She would have tried to trick you. I'm not sure you're not trying to trick me. Why would I spend my time calling you from across the country just to have you fail? If I was part of this, I would have just let you sit there with your goddamn team flight tactics and die. She went quiet. So did I. I counted my breaths as I looked outside. There were more of them now. How did you know what I was playing? I asked. She didn't respond. The silence hung in the air. I'm asking you, how did you know what I was playing? She was just as quiet as the man with the bloodshot eyes, still waiting for me outside the door. You're watching. You knew I was alone. You knew I was getting antsy about the guy showing up outside. Yeah, she sighed. You tried to get me out as soon as he showed up. You tried to trick me before there were too many of them to scare me off. That's... that's not... She sighed. I could hear heavy breathing. As I paced back and forth, I was getting ready to hang up. This was a trick. She was the one tricking me, clearly. Trying to get me to go outside to join those things. I know this looks bad, she said. I know. I'm sorry. I'm honestly just trying to help you. This time I was the one keeping quiet. I walked up to the door, studying the people outside. Blank stares, following my every move. I felt like a snake charmer, like they could snap out of it and tear me apart in the blink of an eye. As I said, I... I have the passwords for everything. I'm the only one who knows them. I just wanted to give you the best shot at getting out of there. I hoped they wouldn't come tonight. But as soon as they did, I just, I had to do something. You're not being honest with me. I'm not lying. I'm just, just having a hard time explaining it. There's a lot of stuff about this that all sounds completely insane. I don't want to throw you off the deep end. Give it to me straight, I demanded. Tell me what the hell is coming for me. It's not a, 
thing. Like, not real. It's there, but... It's just... I don't know how to explain it. It just steps through. Steps through what? The world. The air. A ripple in time or... Or something. It just steps in. And it's there. And then... Then it shoves some kind of mouth spike into your head and gargles up something inside. A mouth spike? What the hell are you? Yes, a spike. And no, I mean, it goes into your mouth. It doesn't have a mouth of its own. It just goes into you and gone. Game over. I didn't know what to think. My mind was a jumbled mess and I felt my pulse rising and falling. There were over 18 people outside in various states of disarray, all of them just staring at me. If I just stepped outside, I'd know for sure. What does it look like? Does it? The lights flickered. There was a loud hum, a buzz, and then an electric failure. One of the fluorescent lights burned out, while the others just slowly dimmed to nothing. This was real. It was make or break by this point. Something was happening. The lights went out, I whispered. Is this... Now! Angie screamed. Get out! Now! I ran. I tripped and fumbled my way into the back room in complete darkness. I almost twisted my ankle as I bumped into the lunch table. I could barely hear my thoughts. And I had to remind myself to breathe. The roof of my mouth ached as if anticipating a piercing pain. I could feel my head filling with blood and adrenaline as my dry eyes refused to blink. As I put my hand on the back door, I did the mistake of pulling instead of pushing. It took me three tries before a thought hit me. I couldn't see a thing on the door because of the darkness. In fact, I couldn't see anything. Nothing. Angie, I wheezed putting my phone to my ear. Are you there? Hurry, she screamed. You can make it. How did you see it? The thing was huge. It just... No. How did you see it in the complete darkness? You... You said the lights went out. It was right there. I can't even see the sign on the back door. How the hell did you see a spike? Look, I... And to add to that... How the hell do you know what it does with that spike? You've never seen the thing kill. You said you were the last one to work this shift. And the thing sure as hell didn't kill you. You're missing the point. I... It doesn't add up, Angie. None of this adds up. You couldn't have seen it, and there's no way for you to know how it kills. I stood there in the dark. I heard Angie panting on the other side, matching my breathing. You're lying to me, Angie. You're not trying to save me. She stopped breathing. For about a minute, it was just quiet. The call ended. A wave washed over me. I was either dead or saved. There was no in between. I was moments from finding out. Every little sound shook me. A breeze just outside. A crackling wire. Ventilation struggling to turn back on. I hadn't even noticed my hand was on the door handle. You lied to me, I said out loud. You, you did. I caught you. There was a sound coming from the other side of the door, a shuffling of feet. Yes, said Angie, from the other side of the door. I must have stood there for an hour until the power came back on. The people outside were gone. Angie was gone. My phone worked just fine, so I called everyone and just cried for help. The police found me locked in the bathroom in a full panic, and I barely even remember being escorted out. Cameras had picked up the mob gathering outside, but that was pretty much it. They couldn't be identified from the back of their heads. Jada and the other managers were called in, and they seemed genuinely surprised. I've since looked it up. A hundred people starting and quitting their job in a place like that isn't uncommon. People come and go all the time. The managers honestly didn't know why people disappeared. It seems. Maybe this is just how things work. Or maybe there's more than one Angie out there, preying on short-term workers. 
and the front door. There was no conspiracy there. The thing just jammed sometimes. Some kind of trouble with the wiring. If I'd messed with it just a little bit more, the thing could have kicked wide open. That broken door was the one thing that saved me from joining them that night. I would have walked right out as soon as Angie asked me to. I worked there for another four months, but just day shifts and weekends. The night shifts seemed to go off without a hitch though. Maybe Angie and her friends moved on from an easy meal. I've saved up enough money for my move to Minneapolis, but I'd never forgive myself if I didn't Background. put this into writing. I was 26 at the Looking time, back at pregnant, it, and I it lived feels in a very surreal. rural area. There are things out there. Tom had always been friends with things my friends that want us to join them. He was a quiet art kid who had an insane natural talent. Seemed nice enough, but despite always wearing a smile, he just gave people, mostly girls, the feeling that something was off with him. I never spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him because of this, but I never really had any reason to believe that he was dangerous. Just weird. Anyways, years after high school, I reconnect with my high school sweetheart, Jamie, who happens to be best friends with Tom. Everything was going great for Jamie and I. We got married, started a family, were remodeling an old family home on acres of land that was our own. The dream. By then, Tom had been a regular at greetings. I noticed more and more they had a weapons fascination and also liked to brag on himself. Obviously, obnoxious, but still nothing made me feel threatened. Tom by this time had been married to a woman who was old enough to be his mother. These two were not a healthy, cohesive couple. Super codependent, manipulative, and apparently they had gotten physical with one another. In the midst of this, Tom had started drinking and lying about his drinking, getting two DWIs and even showing up to our house drunk. Jamie eventually told him to show up sober or not to come over at all. I was about three months pregnant and he didn't want that at our house. Time goes by, no word from Tom. That is until about three months, that's the last visit. He calls my husband wanting to chat and sounds very depressed. I'm about six months along at this time. Jamie hasn't come by and they chat outside. Tom wants to leave his wife, good for him, but something isn't right, even more so than normal. Jamie sneaks through Tom's scooter while Tom had came inside to use our restroom. He finds a stashed bottle of vodka. While Jamie is still outside, Tom all of a sudden doesn't have to use the restroom anymore. He turns to me and looks me up and down, so cold and expressionless. You know Jess. Women are most beautiful when they're pregnant. You've never looked more gorgeous. He makes a move closer to me. By this time, Jamie is walking in. Come outside, we need to talk. Shortly afterwards, I hear Tom leave and Jamie comes in to tell me about the alcohol. I tell him about the creepy comment and we both agree that he can't be trusted. He was not welcome here until he got help. Tom stopped calling, no text. Nothing. Jamie reached out to make sure he was okay, with no response. From what we heard from his family, he was okay, just working and staying busy trying to keep sober. We really hoped that he was taking care of himself. Two months later, I'm eight months pregnant, I'm no longer working, and Jamie works six days a week. That's a lot of time alone. His schedule was always the same, and it's not changed in years. Tom randomly shows up at our house at 10 a.m. on a day he knew Jamie worked, so I was confused. I usually napped around this time because I was huge and tired. Luckily, I was awake this time and in the front room. This room has a huge window that faces the driveway and the door to my right leads to our garage. I shot him a nervous wave through the window. He didn't seem to see me and was grabbing something out of a duffel bag on a scooter. He pulled out a shotgun. I know there's fight or flight, but I just froze. He grabbed a bottle and took a swig from it, guessing whiskey because of the bottle and the color. Then he finally notices me, sheer horror on my face, 
In return, I get a hateful look. He says something I can't hear, then smiles. Not a happy smile. Packs up his gun and leaves. I immediately call Jamie. He works close, and the police take forever to get where we live. He didn't answer. I totally freaked out while checking the locks. Jamie calls back about 10 minutes later, and as we're talking, Jamie's dad, who lives just down the road, calls. Tom tried to break into his home. Thankfully, James' dad is always armed. He caught him red-handed, but didn't call the cops because of the long-standing relationship with Tom's family. Apparently, Tom hadn't had his gun out when he was caught, so Jamie's dad didn't feel threatened enough to call the cops. Not happy about that. Wasn't my choice. Don't worry, I called the cops myself later that day. That alone was scary and super confusing, but what Jamie told me later really freaked me out. When I was working, I worked a set schedule except the occasions I had been called in. One day, a month prior to my incident, Jamie called in sick and I, coincidentally, was called into work. I hated leaving him sick, but duty called. Jamie said he had been napping a little after 9 due to his high fever. He had woken up at some point to the sound of the door opening and closing, but he was so out of it that he figured it must have been his fever. What woke him up and kept him at least semi-alert was the bell on her bedroom door. Our dog jiggles it to potty in the morning, and FYI, this dog is overly friendly. He'd be the dog to show the intruder the most valuable stuff to steal. He heard it jingle twice, lightly. He vaguely remembers looking up and seeing what looked like Tom at the end of our bed, staring at him. He said he passed out from the fever getting worse and came to not very long after. By then, Tom was gone, so Jamie figured it was just a fever dream messing with him. After the gun incident, though, he wasn't so sure anymore. It's been over two years, and we make no attempts to talk to Tom. He used to drive by from time to time, but never tried to make contact. I still make sure all my locks and windows are secure throughout the day. Tom, let's not meet ever again. Trigger warning for this story, as it has some details of domestic assault and abuse. My mother just told me this, and I'm still in a bit of shock. My mother is strong, independent, and hardworking. She worked her ass off as a sergeant in the army until she was honorably discharged after she was raped by a fellow sergeant. They wanted to keep it hush-hush, which, in my opinion, was messed up. She went on to work at a maximum security prison in Georgia. This is where she met my father, who was also a corrections officer. When they first met, they bonded over basketball. My mom was somewhat of a star in high school, but a lot of college scouts overlooked her because of her height and color. He was able to go to college for it until he hurt his knee and had to drop out and search for a different career. She says everything was great. They were the it couple, a beautiful couple. She still says that he was one of the most handsome men she has ever saw. She compares him to the singer Maxwell. He was smart, fit, charming, and funny. Life was perfect until he moved in with her a year into the relationship. Then everything went downhill. Someday she would come home from work to find him in a drunken stupor, lines of coke spread out over her coffee table. They would argue. She would toss out his bottles of Jack. He would smack her across the face, beat her throughout the night. She would have no choice but to go into work the next day, sore with bruises on her face and black eyes. Her neighbors and co-workers knew what was going on, but turned a blind eye. But the warden even threatened to fire her, saying it wasn't good for inmates to see her like that. So she decided to kick him out, cut all ties, get an order of protection against him, until she found out that she was pregnant. She put off breaking up with him for a while, working doubles as not to go home, basically living at the prison. Ironically, she only felt safe there. One day, she went home and he was there, sober for once. She told him about the pregnancy. By then, she was about two months along. 
He went off, saying he wasn't ready for a child. He demanded she get an abortion. He gave her money for it the next day before he went to work. Instead of an abortion, she spent the money he gave to her at the mall. When she got home, he asked if she had got it done. She said no, explaining that she was 32. She wasn't getting any younger and she always wanted a child. She was ready to raise one with or without him. He glared at her, his eyes full of hatred. If looks could kill, she would have dropped dead right there. He just nodded and said, Fine, keep it, and stomped off to bed. She was surprised. She thought he would have went off on her. She began to feel hopeful. Maybe he would stop abusing her, stay sober, and they could live happily again. She dismissed the glare as just her imagination and followed him to bed. She had work early the next day. Sometime during the night, she woke up to find him leaning over her, holding a huge knife to her throat. The evil look in his eyes from before. You don't want to do what I tell you, bitch? I'll cut that fucking baby out of you right now. They fought, rolling over the bed and crashing on the floor. Somehow, she was able to knock the knife out of his hand and it rolled under the bed, out of his reach. He then picked her by her hair and threw her against the wall, punching her repeatedly in the stomach, chest, and face. She did the only thing that she could do and kicked him in the crotch as hard as she could. He let out a yelp and dropped to his knees. You fucking bitch, he hollered, cupping his balls. My mom says she quickly grabbed her car keys and ran out of the bedroom. Her stomach felt like it was on fire. It hurt so bad, and she could barely see. Her head ached from hitting it when they fell off the bed. She got into the living room, wanted to grab her purse before she left. She was trying to feel around for it, but couldn't find it. My father must have worked through his pain because my mom says he soon followed her. You're not leaving. He said, heading towards the kitchen. My mom said she felt a shiver run through her body. She knew if she didn't leave right then, she would die that night. She knew that he was going for another knife. She also knew that she wouldn't be able to make it to the front door since the kitchen was right next to it. There's no way that she could run to the door before he got her, not in her condition. She felt like she was going to pass out any second. She heard my father rummaging through the kitchen, calling her all types of names. She threw up in the living room window, pushed out the screen, and climbed out. She hung from her hands, closed her eyes, began praying as she let herself drop. She fell into one of those large air conditioning things that you usually see outside, landing on her knees and elbows. She said it hurt like a bitch, but she was alive. Thanking God, she crawled off and limped to the parking lot where her car was. She drove off, never looking back. She left that whole life behind, her pretty condo, her friends, a job she loved and escaped to New York where my grandmother lived, all because of my father, a man she loved and someone she thought loved her back. Edit. Thank you all for the kind words and PMs. I showed my mom this morning and she started crying. Don't worry, it's happy tears. Seeing such kind comments from complete strangers just warmed her heart. A lot of you asked how she's doing now. She still has her bad days, but she's much happier. She's a counselor at the VA hospital for vets who come back dealing with issues, drug addiction, PTSD, etc. She loves her job and she loves helping others. She feels like she's making a difference in the world. Still overprotective, but I understand it's only because she's scared of whatever could happen to me. As for my dad, my mother told me today that he was just released from prison this year after doing a few years for robbery. Hopefully he dropped the soap or something a few times. My husband was at work. I was five months pregnant. I was pretty small and my belly hadn't popped yet. Other women who have been pregnant understand, one day you'll wake up and your belly is just huge, but I still was clearly pregnant with a bump. Let me preface this with the fact that we lived in one of the most upscale areas in our state. 
I went to take the dog out and noticed a boy 20 or so who was going from building to building in our apartment complex, walking down the halls and coming back out. It was an outdoor complex, so when I took my dog out, I could see multiple halls that he was pacing through. At first, I thought maybe he was trying to find a friend's unit, but he was acting a little manic, so that put up a red flag. He started walking towards my building, so I immediately started walking towards the apartment without making it obvious where I lived. There were two hallway entries in the building adjacent from each other. It was a three-story building, so I figured, even if I'm walking towards my apartment, as long as he's not close enough, he won't be able to tell which unit I live in. As I'm walking back, he's probably about 10 feet from me, and he whistles. Immediately, I'm freaking out, but he ends up walking down the adjacent hall. I get to my apartment and lock the door. A few minutes later, after thinking there's no way he could have figured out which unit is mine, I'm warming up some food and get a horrible feeling, like an instinct. So I look out the peephole and he's literally on the other side, facing against the door, like he's listening. Immediately I call the cops, then my husband. I grab the knife and open the window, just in case somehow he could break in. We live on the second story. Luckily the cops showed up and maybe he heard me call them because the kid was gone before he could do anything serious. After that, my husband and I bought a gun for our own protection. Gun control is a major issue in our country right now, but it can also help save lives. Had the person broken in, I felt helpless to protect myself and my daughter. I and my family decided to spend the New Year's with some friends of the family to ring in 2015. There are three big families that we were pretty close to, so there were about 20 of us there. The family hosting us that night made this huge, wonderful meal, and we were all so excited. The hostess, to avoid confusion, we will call her Maria. We were lounging around the house waiting for Maria's husband, son, and son-in-law to come home from work and we were having a good time. Maria's son-in-law came home and it turned out he invited a friend from work to join in the festivities. Everyone was welcoming and tried to make him comfortable. I began to notice that I kept catching the friend's eye ever since he showed up. I was pregnant. One of the dads there took notice and began to bring up my pregnancy. Obviously with the intention of letting the friend know that in my condition, I was certainly not looking to hook up. This plan backfired. The friend began to give me pregnancy advice and talking about his children, and his eyes began to shine a way a person does when they are becoming aroused. This made me very, very uncomfortable, and I decided to just avoid the friend for the night. It didn't matter where I was, he would do his damn best to keep me in his line of sight and would not take his eyes off of me for any length of time. Even though I was in deep conversations with Pedro, who, God bless him, did his best to try to distract the friend from me and make sure that he was not near me. Eventually, around 11pm, we all decided we wanted coffee in true Hispanic fashion. And when Maria mentioned she had cake mix, I volunteered to make the cake so we would have something sweet to eat with our coffee. At that point, the friend was fidgeting like mad. He looked like he was on drugs. He suddenly gets up as I was about to crack the eggs and he got so close to me that he had me pinned against himself and the section of the counter. He was so close to me and starts giving me advice on how to make a cake. This cake is from a fucking box. I've done it millions of times. I start to tell him this and he keeps talking over me and presses his crotch on me so I can feel that he's rock hard and gives me that look. I'm so nauseous, uneasy, and annoyed at this point that I say, look, I've done this a million times and don't need your help. Thankfully, he can see perfectly into the kitchen from the family den from the waist up. So he finally gave up and went back to the den. Many more things happened throughout the night that made me want to throw up. Like the New Year's hug when he tried to fill me up. I have nothing against people with pregnancy fetishes. I can understand that people have sexual preferences. 
But this guy clearly didn't get the hint that I was not interested and did not care that I was carrying someone else's child in my womb. I found it to be a sickening thing that he would do this to a pregnant woman. I hope I never meet him again. I was 20 years old at the time. I was about seven or eight months pregnant with my daughter and I needed to stop to get makeup from the dollar store on my way home from work. I've done it a thousand times. I mean, this dollar store is literally three minutes from my house and is my go-to store when I need something fast and cheap. Well, I go in, I start browsing. It's a dollar store for God's sakes. Like I was actually gonna leave with just makeup. I notice this guy walking behind me. No big deal, right? He's probably doing the same thing I'm doing, looking at junk. So I grab a few things, throw them into my basket. All Walt do was casually following me down aisle after aisle, looking at the junk. Eventually, I move into the makeup aisle. I'm standing there, trying to decide which $5 foundation I was going to butcher next. And I kid you not, this man is suddenly standing next to me in the freaking makeup aisle. And by next to me, I mean less than a foot away, looking at lip stain. Now, at first, I wasn't concerned. Again, it's a dollar store, and people are weird. But something about him being that close to me in that moment really wicked me out. Here I am, 5'2", very pregnant post-teen. Essentially a watermelon person who struggles to walk, let alone run more than 20 feet at a time, while stopping to catch my breath. Of course, the only thing going through my head was, Jesus, I'm too tired to be fucking kidnapped right now. Which at the time, I thought was a joke. Who would even want to snatch a pregnant lady? I doubt I'd even fit in their van. Imagine the abundance of inconvenience, non-criminally consistent bathroom breaks. That would really put a damper on their plans. You know, all those dumb, unrealistic thoughts that you think and try to make yourself feel less weird in a weird situation. Anyway, I acknowledge that this guy is creeping and I grabbed the last foundation bottle I looked at, not caring if it was even the right color, and went to the counter to check out. Dude followed me again. He was right behind me in line with absolutely no merchandise. Guess he ended up buying a candy bar or something from the counter. I paid for my crap and immediately called my fiance before walking out of the store. I made a point to state somewhat loudly that I needed him to stay on the phone with me until I pulled out of the parking lot. I was pretty freaked out at this point, but I made it to my car and got out of the parking lot. Cool, cool. Almost home. Having a glance from my rearview mirror at the red light, and this guy was, I shit you not, right behind me in his car. Cue watermelon person tears and absolute panic. Ended up pulling into a gas station. Dude followed me in there too. My fiance's best friend was managing, and I ended up walking into his office, and dude finally left 15 minutes later. My fiance's friend wanted to call the police, but I was tired and high off of pregnancy hormones. I wasn't sure if this guy was actually following me, or if I was just overreacting and paranoid. I didn't want to get this guy in trouble for just running errands or whatever, so I convinced him not to. Thinking about this now, post-watermelon, I probably should have let him call. So this story is a bit of a long story from several years ago when I worked at a fast food chain that served barbecue. I clearly remember this because it was just so weird. My parents owned the business so they allowed me to work there whenever I wanted. At the time, I was 14 years old but I had purple hair because I had had identity issues I guess. So I looked a lot older than I actually was but I was still only about 5'4". One night, I'm working on a Saturday night with only one other girl, a little older than me, trying to get started on closing since we closed in about an hour. It was 8pm and fully dark outside. It was completely silent. Usually you can hear cars pull up and you could definitely see them as the walls were covered in windows. I'm just sweeping up when I see something move out of the dark. I look up and in the back of our parking lot is a man in all dark clothes just looking inside. No car in sight. 
I think it's weird, but people are like that sometimes. About 10 minutes later, the door squeaks open really quickly, and it made me jump because it was loud. It was a very large, tall man wearing black scrubs with a scraggly beard. At this point, I'm annoyed because it's like 40 minutes before close, and it's super hard to close this restaurant. But I put my biggest fake smile on and say like usual, Hi, welcome to... Nothing. No words for what felt like five minutes. Then a woman wearing the same clothes came in, and the lady looks like the guy's twin. So they come up to the front counter to order, and I say, What can I get for you today? Do y'all have fortune cookies? Uh, no sir. We only sell barbecue and sides. That's too bad. We brought our own anyway. I want a large sweet tea. So, no fortune cookies here? No ma'am. At this point, she actually was really mad that we didn't have fortune cookies. Then no food for me. That was their whole order. Just a large drink. They paid and sat down at one of the empty tables. The man had been carrying a computer bag with him, so I thought maybe he had to do some work real quick. But no, he opens his bag and pulls out a whopping handful of fortune cookies. Like, at least 30. They're both very silent and it's really creeping me out. As I'm sweeping under the table next to them, the guy says, without ever looking in my direction, We use these numbers from the cookies to play the lottery every day. Oh, that's really cool. No, it's not. It's serious. We didn't do it one night, and it was the winning numbers. We could have won $2,000. We cried for months. Oh. Little 14-year-old me didn't know what to say, so I just kept sweeping. Now we run an acupuncture shop in the next town over. We can cure everything. Awesome. At this point, I'm sweeping towards the back of the store. I'm facing away from them because they're already creeping me out and I was hoping that they would just stop talking. I don't think you think I'm serious. His voice got really loud all of a sudden, like he was yelling at me, and now he was looking at me. They both looked really pissed at me for some reason, but I didn't want to say any more, so I kept quiet. We cure everything. Smoking habits, cured. Back pain, cured. Chronic headaches, cured. He is actually screaming at me now and my coworker had been in the walk-in cooler, so she heard nothing. I'm starting to walk into the kitchen, but I had to pass him to get there, and to a phone. As I'm walking past, he stares me down. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified, and I don't know what to do, so I start to call my parents. Before I could even grab my phone, this man is suddenly right behind me. We even help ladies get pregnant. He said this a little louder than a whisper, and this sent shivers all the way down my spine that I actually froze. The man walks back towards the table, and I take off downstairs to my coworker. I decided the best option was to lock ourselves in the office and wait until they left. Eventually, we came out and they were gone. There isn't really a good ending to this, because that's all there was. I told my parents and they came and got me. We tried looking up acupuncture places in the town he said he was from, but there weren't any for another 60 miles away. A year later, I'm at a gas station down the street from the restaurant and I'm filling up when a man came back to his car which was beside me. I didn't pay him much attention until he said, what a nice day outside, a good day for some acupuncture. I looked up and I shit you not I was the same creepy dude from the night. I said, yep, and promptly stopped filling up my car and drove away. I don't know if this guy recognized me or what, but to that creepy guy that wanted me to get pregnant at 14 years old, that's not me. I'm a 22 year old female. It was a pretty warm summer evening and I just finished a late shift at my office. I was feeling tired, eager to get home. I lived about a half mile away, so I walked down the empty street towards my apartment building. I noticed a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk. He was muttering something to himself and seemed agitated. I didn't think much of it though and continued on my way. 
Suddenly, I heard footsteps and turned around to see the homeless man running towards me with a screwdriver in his hand. I immediately started running, but he was fast and quickly caught up to me. I could feel his breath on my neck as he lunged at me, swinging the screwdriver and nipping my jacket. My heart was pounding and I knew I had to do something to get away from him. I zigzagged down the street, hoping to confuse him or slow him down, but he was determined and kept chasing me. I could hear him screaming profanities and threats as he closed in on me again. I could see my local convenience store up ahead and I made a run for it, hoping to find safety inside. I could feel him right behind me as I was running into the entrance and pushed my way inside. I ran into the bathroom, shut it behind me and locked it, panting and sweating. The man pounded on the door, trying to force his way inside. I could hear him cursing and yelling as I crashed down behind the sink, just in case he broke through the door. I could hear the employee telling him to leave, but the man paid no attention. After what felt like an eternity, I heard his footsteps fading away and realized he had given up and left. I stayed in the bathroom until the employee came to the door. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to walk back to my apartment my heart still racing and my hands shaking. That night, I had trouble sleeping, haunted by the thought of the homeless man's rage and the screwdriver he wielded. So, I don't live in the greatest area, nor the nicest apartment. I'm always checking my surroundings when I'm out and about. Nothing crazy, just being aware of what's going on around me. That being said, the other night I decided that the mountain of dirty clothes and happening in my closet was bordering on, uh, disgusting, and it was time for me to do one of my least favorite chores, laundry. I don't mind doing laundry itself, but the laundry room in this building always gives me the creeps. It's in the dank and dark basement of the building, and you always have to grope the wall for the light switch. It would really make an excellent location for a horror film. So I go down, throw my laundry in the machine, everything is fine and dandy. Come back 45 minutes later to throw it in the dryer, nothing out of the usual. An hour later I go back downstairs to the basement to collect my stuff in the dryer. Well, when I turn on the lights, the dryer door is open and my shit is strewn about, on the ground, hanging out of the dryer, etc. To top all of that, they were still wet. Which was the worst part because I didn't want to have to keep coming down to the laundry room because I'm a lazy shit. Normally I'd be like whatever because sometimes people open dryers and don't close them but this really looked like someone rummaged through my stuff. Shrugging this off I put my stuff back in and that's when I get such a sharp chill running down my spine like it was so random. I generally felt like I wasn't alone. I turn around back to the elevator and all of a sudden I hear the sound of someone frantically running up the stairs on the other side of the room, almost as if they knew they had been spotted. Anyway, I get my laundry back to my apartment and notice I'm missing stuff, but at that point I'm creeped out, so I'm not in the mood to go snooping around looking for some t-shirts. I kind of forget about the whole thing until a couple days later. I receive an email from the landlord telling all the residents that a homeless guy not only broke into the building, he performed sexual acts upon himself in the laundry room, then started a fire and went around the building trying to break into people's unlocked apartments. So I'm guessing this guy went through my stuff, probably took something, did god knows what with it, and uh, started an actual fucking fire for some reason. I was homeless for a couple years and parked to sleep at a campsite up north from where I'm from. I pulled in, parked, fed the cats, and started to cook and relax. Flashlights appeared in my face, four of them, looking at my window so I assumed it was rangers asking me to move since this campsite was technically closed. I rolled down my window a bit and asked them what was up and apparently it was a family of four also parked and camping. They had a fire going and a dog so I figured things were okay here but there was a really weird feeling. My boyfriend at the time decided to try to befriend them and we got out to chat. They asked us a lot of very pointed personal questions. Are you married? Do you live around here? Do you have kids? But actually it was their two kids asking all the questions. 
They spoke like adults, which made me assume maybe trauma was a real part in their lives. At some point, their kids put themselves to bed by basically going, Mom, Dad, we're headed to bed. That really rubbed me the wrong way, but whatever. It all got worse from here, though. They talked about their converted truck they live in. Apparently, the kids shared a bed, and the key point they made was that the van was soundproof. They really wanted to play with our cats, but no such luck. They started to try to separate me from my boyfriend, saying shit like, Let's walk to the river. Let's go look at the car. And at some point, they started letting the fire go out and standing behind us a lot. That was enough. We left some stuff behind and got in our car, started it up, and just talked like, what the fuck? It took two minutes for the woman to walk up to the van and ask if we were leaving. We said no and that we were just cold. She asked to sit in the seat behind us. I asked why. She didn't answer and asked if she could sit with us or on my lap. Again, I asked why. Again, she didn't answer. She said we couldn't leave her there because her husband beats her. So I asked her if she wanted us to call the police. She didn't answer, pulled out a cigarette and lit up. We looked at each other and heard someone douse the fire. I said, baby, just out of so much nervousness, which is when I found out that my boyfriend was suspicious from the beginning and didn't think to say anything until now, only to add that if I had stayed and not followed him to the car, he would have just left me there. He was a waste of space, but before I could process it, I heard the husband grab something off the fire tool set. And from earlier, I noticed that they had a large red axe. I just got tunnel vision and hit the gas. I felt the bitch pounce off the side of my van as we pulled away. And just as we got on the road, an ambulance was behind us with the lights flashing. I wasn't stopping for it. You know how easy it is to buy emergency lights for your car on Amazon. No fucking thanks. The ambulance eventually turned off a dead end road after a while of demon driving into town. We never heard a siren. I looked up the aforementioned river. It was two and a half miles into the dense woods. Apparently, a lot of people go missing out there. I wonder who's to blame. This happened about a month ago, and I can still not shake this traumatic event. I'm a receptionist at a professional building in Pasadena, California. I'm female in my mid-twenties and spend the long boring days at my desk listening to my favorite murder, crime junkie, and new obsession, Let's Not Meet the Pod, that I started binging yesterday and got me writing this post. So it was a normal Tuesday at the office. I got off around 6pm and locked everything up. I make my way downstairs to the lit up parking lot and say goodbye to the standing security guard. I pull out my keys in preparation for the long walk to my car which is in the isolated employee parking lot. The employee's parking lot is about a block away from my office building on a secluded street with literally no street lights or through traffic. I'm not sure why the street has no street lights. Normally it's not dark out at 6 p.m., but since it was November, it's pitch black out by this time. So as routine, I pull out my keys while I'm in the lit parking lot and call my boyfriend just in case I get murdered or something. This situation made me realize that my boyfriend could not help me through the phone. So I'm talking to my boyfriend, keys in hand, and I see a dark figure on the sidewalk that I'm walking on to get to my car. I say something to my boyfriend and see the dark figure walking towards me. I flip my phone light to shine in his face and he says, Who the fuck are you talking to, bitch? I immediately go off the sidewalk into the street to get away and say, My boyfriend. I could tell right away that he was a dirty meth head homeless man with a huge beard, khaki shorts, and a ball cap. He then starts yelling at me, who you talking to bitch, and follows me in the street. I literally stop and show him my phone like an idiot, trying to prove that I wasn't talking to him. He comes up to me at an arm's distance and starts calling me awful names and demanding I go to the other side of the street as if he owned the place. We are both in the middle of the street now. I knew if I crossed to the other side, I would just have to cross again as my car was on the side of the crazy homeless man. I told him, get the fuck away from me, I'll call the police right now, with the most disgusting look on my face. He then puts his hands in the shape of a gun, puts his fingers to my head, 
and a method do slur says, I'll kill you, bitch. Right here, you fat bitch. I'll kill you. My heart sank. At this moment, I realized this guy was out of his mind, angry and violent. I start to rush towards my car, all while my boyfriend is on the phone saying, What's going on? Get in your car. Put your keys between your fingers and run. I see the man running towards my car and luckily I dodged him, pressed the unlock button and got in super quick. He's standing right in front of my car and proceeds to kick my front bumper hard saying, Fuck you. You better not call the cops. On repeat. He then runs behind a dumpster and is spying on me from behind the dumpster as I'm pulling out. He then starts running around my car towards the front and I truly thought I was going to have to run him over. He starts chasing my car down the road and stops at his belongings. I peel into my office building and fly down the security guard hysterical. I told him that there's a crazy man that just threatened to kill me. I call the cops and see the man booking it down the street which gave me the perfect view of his face and outfit. The cops sent an officer and I left the scene 5 minutes later. The crazy man was still on the corner just standing there so I screamed, fuck you, as I drove off. He tried to run at my car. Apparently the cops couldn't find him, he even sent a helicopter. I later found out that he tried to rob my coworker that night but was unsuccessful. The next morning I saw the crazy man back in front of the employee parking. Two cops were surrounding him. He was arrested. I was happy but anxious that I had to see the crazy man yet again. He proceeded to hang around the street for the next two weeks. I constantly saw him in the morning and on my lunch. I was paranoid that he was looking for me. I thought that's why he was coming back. He must be looking for me. I messaged our office building manager and they got a trespassing order on this dude. I hadn't seen him again until this Monday. He was sleeping at the same exact spot where the encounter happened. My heart sinks every time I see him and I relive the trauma all over. Our office building now has employees move their cars over from the employee parking lot to the main lot around 4 p.m. so no one is walking in the dark anymore. We also use the buddy system now. I got two pepper spray cans and I don't go anywhere without them now. I always thought that my obsession with true crime had prepared me for any scary situation thrown my way. After this night, I realized that there is no amount of true crime podcasts that could ever prepare me to fight off someone who has the will to harm me. If this man had a gun, I'd be done for. This is my second post of this sub. I have almost a lot of different encounters and few people wanted me to post more about them so here's another one for you guys. So the same suburban area where my family lived, there was a really old abandoned three story building, a few houses from ours. It was a local hotspot for teenagers and other young kids to go explore this scary old building. Me and my friends had explored it a lot of times. Mostly just the yard since the house owner still owned it and took care of it. By that, the owner just locked all the doors and windows whenever someone broke into it. But one day, me and my three friends wanted some excitement, so we figured we should just go to the house for all time's sake in the middle of the night. And so we did. We went to the house, and I'm not sure if it was just the feeling of an abandoned building but something already felt off in my head. But I feel like that in a lot of places, so I didn't think much about it. We then tried to open the door, but it seemed to be locked or stuck since we tried pulling it and pulling, but it didn't open. Then my other friend tried kicking the door in. He managed to get his foot through the door, making a hole in it. We then reached through the hole and opened the door from the other side. It had a weird mechanic or something but we got it open and we went in the rooms were quite small even though that there were a lot of rooms it had a basement and a middle floor and an upstairs we explored and chatted and explored it for old time's sake it was about pretty much 1 a.m when it started to rain a bit 
So, we decided to stay inside from the rain. We were upstairs in kind of a living room. We sat down on the floor instead of an old molded couch because, really, who would do that? We were chatting about Clash Royale until we heard a sound coming from the downstairs. Floorboard creaking. Me and the others got all silent and confused about it. And then we just watch each other in silence. Then we heard another creak and something falling on the ground. We then looked at each other with wide eyes, scared to what to do. I then managed to stretch myself to look down the stairs with my head hidden. I didn't see anything, but I noticed that a table had fallen over in the kitchen area. I then told my friends that it was just the wind. It knocked down a table in the kitchen, and then we all started to chuckle from the jump scare. We then stood up and got ready to go downstairs, but before we could even reach the first step, we heard someone running and dashing from the back door outside. One of my friends got scared from it, so much that he almost fell. It's still funny to this day, you should have seen his face. But in all seriousness, we got confused and scared, so we decided to book it from the front door. We ran half a block to our friend's house, and we didn't see or notice anything on the way. Except the back door was almost off its hinges in the backyard. It was a strange happening, but we didn't think about it much. It was probably another teenager trying to break in and explore it, and got scared and ran away. We thought. Then a few days go by, and a friend from our group in the house noticed something interesting in the newspaper that a local drug addict homeless man had been found and taken to custody the man had been living in the abandoned house and using it for drug deals and shelter now i don't know what would have happened if we didn't hear his sounds and went downstairs with um in there and i still think about it sometimes what could have happened but i'm very happy nothing happened to us but man, it was still pretty fucked up. I was working on a no-budget film. A really trashy script. Weird plot. No redeeming values at all. Toward the end of the production, me and the director were going around getting second unit inserts. We were on 59th Street at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning, uploading the camera. We were going up to a penthouse he knew of to get a shot looking down at Central Park. No one knew about the film other than the production crew and actors. It would never, ever have been mentioned in any media. So the director and I are unloading, and there's no one around except for one homeless man. He shuffled along the sidewalk, heading in our direction. He's one of the sad, mentally ill people that our society refuses to help. So his schizophrenia is untreated, and he's out on the streets, and he's talking to himself nonstop as he comes along. When he gets close to us, he looks at us and says, And here are those guys that are making that movie about! And he proceeds to rattle off the entire plotline as he walks past, as if he were reading the IMBD synopsis. None of our equipment was visible. None of our equipment was visible. So there was no way that anyone would recognize us as a film crew. The director and I just looked at each other like, What just happened? When I was 17, going through Virginia with my mom on our way to North Carolina, we were staying at this hotel called Alexandria, and a lot of places were walking distance from this place. So, one day, we got ready to get breakfast over at this place called Panera Bread, a few blocks away. It's around maybe 11 a.m. Decently populated area. It's the summer. I'm in typical summer clothes. Nothing too extreme. A tank top and jean shorts. This guy is walking towards us on the sidewalk. And he starts walking directly towards us as he comes closer and I'm like, what the fuck is this dude doing? And he comes up to my mom and I'm about five feet or so away 
because I didn't realize he started saying something until I hear, How much for the little one? Because he thinks I'm a prostitute and my mom is my pimp. My mom was like, That's my daughter and she's not for sale. And he was like, Oh, you have a beautiful daughter. And then was like, Can I bomb some cigarettes? To my mom. When we were leaving Alexandria a day or two later, we are pretty sure we saw the same guy passed out on a public bench. So, to the horny homeless guy who thought I was a hooker, let's not meet again. I'm 18 and female, and I went to the beach with friends and my boyfriend. It was a hot day, so we had fun at the park, and then in the evening, we went to Brighton Beach and took some pictures of the sunset. We were having a good time. My friends Jay, who is 19 male, and E, 18 female, and her boyfriend D, 18 male, and my boyfriend, 19 male. So we were sitting there. Me and my friends were all wearing shorts because it was hot and the temperature was slowly going down. D leaves to catch a train. A drunk old man in his sixties approached us. I could sense something was wrong, so I asked him about himself, and he sat down with us. He seems friendly enough, and just looking for human interaction. Personally, I like helping people and talking to strangers. He seems to take a liking to me, but I didn't think much of it. Basically, he told us about his mess in the past. His brother committed suicide. His dad had prostate cancer. And he got it too. And only had six months left to live. We were quite drunk, so honestly, we weren't all there. He then told us about how in the morning, he's going to jump off a cliff and kill himself. And then he describes his messed up life, self-harm, being R-word, etc. Obviously, I didn't want him to kill himself, so I opened up about my past too. Sexual and physical abuse as a child. It seemed to really help. He took my hand and started stroking it. I didn't mind because he was just looking for comfort. Anyway, we all talked for about 45 minutes. He's still holding my hand and stroking the top of it. My friend is telling him about her past too and that it's getting better etc. He takes all of our hands, which is fine. He says we're like his sisters, and that he's homeless and lives on the beach. He says he doesn't care about himself, and he only cares about other people. I asked, What makes you think you're not worthy of being cared for? He burst into tears and said, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I feel for him. I take on too many burdens from others because I want to help. Anyway, it's getting colder and I'm in shorts and a linen top because I gave my hoodie to E. I'm really good at dealing with cold. My body usually projects warmth. He touches my leg and says, Oh, you are boiling. Why are you so warm? He then touches my friend's leg and says she's freezing. We were still kind of drunk, so I didn't really think much of it before all this. He was talking about how he respects everyone, especially women, and any man who is disrespectful to him has to deal with him. He told my boyfriend to take care of me, etc. I asked if he likes jelly beans, and then I gave him the bag that I got from a store a few hours ago. My friends gave him a chocolate bar. We didn't really have any proper food. He looks at me and says, You are stunning. Absolutely stunning. Without trying to sound like i um, vain, I have thick, very long curly hair, dyed red, which gets a lot of compliments, an hourglass figure, and, and long legs, and a pretty face. I'm not really usually freaked out when strangers call me pretty, so it didn't really raise any red flags. He calls my friend pretty too. Anyway, we gave him offerings and decided it was time for us to get some food. It was about 8 p.m. Me and my boyfriend were going on a date, and my other two friends were going off to get some of their food. 
So we get up and say our goodbyes. He then placed a kiss on my hand. He hugged each of one of us a few times, but on the last hug, he kisses E's forehead and then hugged me and leaguer a kiss on my jaw. He touches my back and says, Oh, you are like a furnace. It was over so quickly and slowly. I didn't know what to do. At the time, we were all a little bit like, What the fuck just happened? But that was yesterday. And I talked to E about it. And she says that it made her so uncomfortable. And me too. After we left him, we all agreed to meet today and give him some more blankets and food. But we talked about it. We figured out he was making some stuff up because it was so elaborated and practiced. And it didn't even end up happening. I talked to a friend who always hangs out at the beach. And she says she knows him. And that he's a bit weird. Not dangerous, but definitely messed up. He tells everyone that he's going to kill himself. And she advised me to stay away. This happened like three weeks ago. It was 6.30 p.m. I was walking home from school and I encountered this one homeless man. I assume in his 30s. He always wanders around my suburb, carrying a sack along with his two children, which I assume to be toddlers. One of his children approached me and tried holding my hand, begging if I had any spare change. I think giving food is better than giving money, so instead of giving them some coins, I gave the kid one pack of biscuits from my backpack, and the kid was okay with that, but his father wasn't. He gave me a bad look, so I walked away feeling uneasy and also sprayed hand sanitizer on my hands afterwards because his hands were seriously dirty at the time and he had just scavenged from a nearby trash bag right before that moment. Two days after, I encountered them again when I was on my way home around the same time, but on a different street in my suburb after coming from a friend's house. They were begging really hard for money. I didn't even have any food with me at the time. The man asked me if I really didn't have any money and that made me feel startled and gave me serious chills. He started approaching me really slowly, asked if he could check my backpack or pockets, so I started moving away from him. But then his two kids started grabbing my bag and prevented me from escaping. I managed to move fast enough that their hands got separated from my bag and they started crying real hard when they fell to the ground. Their dad yelled at me while I was escaping and called me a selfish and heartless person for doing that to his children. I tried contacting the local authorities in my area to see if they witnessed the man and child in the streets. They said that they are quite familiar with him since they wander around frequently. After telling them what happened to me, they told me that they will patrol the area to see if he comes back. However, I have not seen him since. This took place in 2019, before the whole COVID shit show started. I was trying to find a job and went through the global connections of employment. Due to a recommendation of my mom, she had worked with them when they were known as Gulf Coast Enterprise. I had gotten done with my seminar and I was waiting for the bus. This hobo had walked up and asked if I had any money for a drink. I told him I only had enough money for the bus and I needed it. That seemed to trigger him. He almost immediately got aggressive with me and demanded that I give him my money. I told him no again, that I needed it. His response was, Yeah, well I need it more than you. Wherever you need to go, you can walk, fat ass. I just stood there scared because I'm not one for conflict and this guy was making me feel really uncomfortable. His eyes went wild when I wouldn't pull out my wallet. He was about to throw a punch when we both suddenly heard a police cruiser blare their siren as they passed by. He stopped almost at once and stormed off, muttering to himself about God knows what. I was shaking pretty badly when the bus came around, and I never saw him again after that. For the rest of the time that I was training and I had to go take that bus, I did fear that he would come around again. He didn't, so that's a good thing. Let's keep it that way, shall we? Last night around 12.30, I was blitzed and wanted a snack as you do, so I went to 7-Eleven for a quickie. 
Now I live north of Orlando, outside the burbs, surrounded by cornfields, no street lights, and I couldn't hit my closest neighbor's house with a rock if I tried. So imagine my absolute horror when I grabbed me my snacks, shut my car door, turn and see someone standing with a flashlight. I tried to hold my screams and halfway expecting it to be one of my six other family members who lived in the house. Before I can muster up a word, I hear, you don't know me, but, and take off screaming babe over and over again as I ran the 40 feet inside of my house to frantically tell my boyfriend what happened and to get the gun. As we unlock the safe, I hear the dude talking outside my door. My boyfriend goes outside strapped, only to face a 6'2 skinny tweaker high off his ass with scabs all over his face on a bike two feet from our door. Dude, do you know where you fucking are? You're lucky she only went to the store and didn't go strapped. You'd be dead right now. What the fuck do you want? I'm sorry, sir. My name is Carrie. All my friends call me Bear. I used to be big, but all the fentanyl and meth left me like this. I got all my stuff stolen. My bike, my bags. I'm homeless. I got everything I own stole from me. I saw her come up the road and got excited that someone was awake, so I followed her to ask if I could use her Wi-Fi. He stole your bike? You're on a bike. Who the hell follows a woman alone at night with good intentions? My boyfriend followed, gun no longer pointed, but I could tell he was as conflicted as I was. Well, I grabbed it when I saw your car. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know she was a woman. I won't mean no harm. Please, I just need your Wi-Fi, and I'll leave. I'm sorry I scared you. I didn't mean to. I put my hotspot on for this guy. There's no way I was giving him access to my home Wi-Fi and having him come back here for free Wi-Fi as he pleased. I left my phone with my boyfriend and went back in to get a couple of free promotional backpacks we had. I filled one with canned food and another with giveaway clothes and a trash bag full of old blankets. I told the guy there's people here at all hours of the day and not to come back no matter what. He's lucky he found the only house of hippies in 10 miles or he probably wouldn't be breathing. Then we watched as his little red bike light disappeared down a long dark street. This guy got everything he owned stolen and I felt bad no matter how awful he scared me. What would you have done? This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever uses that back door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all the units had back doors at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you would have to go all the way around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make much sense to use the back entrance and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two men in the window standing at the door. A chill went down my spine. I did not feel safe about opening this door so I called out, Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Yes, hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for a cable but did not have any issues with it. I replied, we're not having any issues. Is there a problem with it? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head to myself. We're not having any issues, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed the knife from inside our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey the shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, all while gripping the knife tighter. Ma'am, ma'am. I saw them try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude as I always locked my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry I can't help you. Could I please get your name and badge numbers? I'll give your supervisor a call and let them know that the cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time. 
With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held that knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't even hold the phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying after he came home. He immediately called the cable company and spoke to a representative. They informed us that no one from the company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company. No one had. So to the two creepy men that tried to break into my home under the disguise of cable repair, let's not meet. My grandparents live in a house located in a very secluded area, surrounded by woods. The nearest neighbor is about a half mile away from the house. Whenever my grandfather has work in town for a couple days, he calls me home to take care of my grandmother who suffers from arthritis. One night, it started raining really heavily and the power was cut for the entire night. It was really windy and since this house is pretty old, you can hear a lot of creaking sounds. At around 1 a.m. in the middle of the night, I woke up to a loud knocking sound on the front door. My grandmother was still sleeping and I didn't want to wake her up. The noise freaked me out because it was impossible for someone to be out there at this time in the rain outside our house. But I thought maybe it's my grandfather who probably had some emergency and had to come home at this time of night. As I walked to the main door to see who it was, the knocking stopped. I saw our dog standing in the corner of the room, looking at the door with his tail between his legs. He looked super scared. I figured something wasn't right and that if someone was outside my door, it obviously wasn't my grandfather. I went upstairs to see who it was through a window and just saw a shadow, but I'm not sure if it was actually a person's shadow or just a hallucination from my sleepy mind. I did not open the door and went back to bed. The creepiest part was, the next morning, I saw muddy footprints on my porch and a broken door handle. My friends went to Mexico for vacation and asked me to house sit and take care of their dogs while they were gone. They'd pay me $40 a day just to sit around and let their dogs go out when they needed to. I am disabled, so this helps a lot. This is a semi-rural area, and the houses were roughly a quarter mile apart. Police have to come down from town 15 miles away, and response time can be well over an hour. I always take my pistol with me. It's always quiet when I've stayed there. This time was different. I was in the shower when the dog started barking and growling. They are big, large German shepherds, and one is actually police trained. The owners loan him to the county as a drug dog, and if you tell them to be quiet, they obey. This time they didn't, so I went on high alert. I shut off the water and looked outside the window. I didn't see anything, but when I walked out of the bathroom, I saw a shadow go across the bedroom window. I whispered to the dogs to hush, and they did. That's when I heard a man's voice. I couldn't make out everything he was saying, but I distinctly heard two words. Come around so I'm sure that there's more than one person. I run into the living room with my pistol and saw the door handle turn. I yelled, I have a gun and I will fucking use it. I heard feet run away. I was telling Siri to dial 911 and got the county sheriff fast. She said there are two cars on another call not too far away and it would take about 20 minutes for them to get there. That's better than the usual hour, but I was shaken up. I explained that I was on a farm and I would have to go down the road to unlock the cattle gate to let them in and to please tell the police officers that I would be carrying a pistol and to please not shoot me by mistake because I was not going outside the house without it. The dispatcher said, Oh no, do not go out there without your gun. I will tell them. The good thing about living in a rest state. She asked if I could see the road and I can. So she said, Wait in the house until I saw blue lights. I hung up and called my friends in Mexico. Their camera footage could be downloaded via an app and they said that they would go through it while I waited for the cops. I locked the house and went down to the gate when the police arrived. 
They searched the whole place, including the barn, but didn't find anything. While they were looking, my friends texted me the camera footage. There was a man on the porch. Unfortunately, cameras were not angled to get a shot of his face, and it was of course dark. I still think that there is more than one creep because of what they said. Come around. The police were very nice and said that they had passed a man on a bike on the way, which was strange for this area, especially at night, and they went to go look for him. But that's all they could do. They took a full report but never caught the creep. My husband came and stayed with me for the rest of the trip. One of our neighbors said that they found a tent and some gear near the woods a few weeks before, so maybe someone was living back there. Maybe a homeless person from town. I have house sat again since, and it was quiet. They're all going away for Christmas, and I will be there again. A lot of people asked me if I would have shot the creep if he had broken in. Yeah, absolutely. I would be sorry for hurting someone, but if it's them or me, yeah. Creepy porch guy, let's not ever meet again. A few years ago, I lived in a large apartment complex. My unit was at the very end of the first floor. A lot of strange people lived there, but seemed pretty harmless. One night, my boyfriend was over, thankfully, and we were watching a movie. I noticed a shadow pass by the window, but then I felt like it didn't completely pass by. At that point, I started feeling like I was being watched, but was too scared to turn and look. I finally look and see a silhouette of a person and a pair of eyes peeking between the space and the blinds. I told my boyfriend someone was out there and he jumped up. We saw a person's shadow run away. My boyfriend peeks out the window and we assume he had ran around the back of the building. A few minutes later, there was a knock at my door. My boyfriend and I just looked at each other because it's like 1am. I told him not to answer because I didn't want to open the door to anyone. After a minute of the decision, he's adamant of answering it. So I tell him to grab a knife. He opens the door and there is no one out there. He looked over and saw a man nearby a tree doing the come here motion with his hand. We called the cops and they said that they would keep an eye out but we never heard anything more. In that moment it felt like the beginning of a scary movie. The actual encounter was brief but terrifying. I'm a 30 year old female. I live with my wife and our sweet orange tabby cat. We own a home in an older neighborhood in a college town. The neighborhood is mostly families and older people. Right around 2 a.m. Monday morning, my wife and I are both woken up by our cat. Immediately after we hear him, we distinctly hear someone rattling our door, making the sound that they would have been holding the door handle while trying to open it. We rush to our living room, my wife wielding her aluminum bat. She smacks our recliner and screams, I have a fucking bat. Our cat crouches on the ground and is growling, his hackles raised. I got 911 on the line and we all got into one bedroom with a lock on it while waiting for the police. They came by but didn't see anything. That night my wife didn't get any more sleep. I only got a little myself after our cat curled up next to me. We both called out of our jobs at the university on Monday and wound up getting lock bars for our front and back doors and replaced our back door lock with one that requires a key on both sides. This thankfully went as well as it could have, but was so out of the blue and upsetting. More than anything, this is just a reminder to stay vigilant and invest in what security measures you can. We never imagined someone would try to break in in the dead of night when there are two cars in the driveway. This is a rather painful story to retell, I mean, it still keeps me up at night, but I'll do my best, as my therapist says writing about it will help me out and help me get through it. It's been two years and it still gets to me. It was just after midnight and I was home alone. My husband was out of town for work and wouldn't be back for a few days. I was curled up on the couch watching TV when I heard a noise coming from the front door. At first, I thought it was just the wind or a stray cat, but then I heard it again. It sounded like someone was trying to open the front door. My heart started racing and I quickly grabbed the phone to call the police. 
As I was dialing, I heard a loud crash and the sound of glass shattering. Someone had broken into my home. I quietly made my way to the kitchen and hid and waited for the police to arrive. Moments later, I heard footsteps coming towards me. They were slow and deliberate and sounded like they were getting closer and closer. I knew I had to act fast, but it was panicking in my mind. I grabbed a kitchen knife and prepared to defend myself. Suddenly, the door to the kitchen burst open and a man stepped in. He was rather tall and somewhat muscular. He was wearing a ski mask that was covering most of his face. I could tell that he was older, but not much more than that. I held the knife out, rather uneasy, but he easily overpowered me and knocked me to the ground. I just laid there. He told me not to get up, not to move, and everything would be okay. So I was just laying there, helpless and terrified. The man was rummaging through my belongings, every so often looking back at me. When he did, I closed my eyes. I didn't want to stare at him. Not only not to make him mad, but also I didn't want that image in my head. He took my jewelry, my money, and my phone before finally leaving the house. I was left alone shaken and traumatized by this experience. I honestly laid there till the police came. Once I heard them, I finally got up. They searched the house and the surroundings and ended up taking a report. As of now, the man has not been caught and this was two years ago. I was left to live in fear, wondering if he would ever come back. Since then, we put up cameras outside the house and we replaced the door in the back that had a glass window and it's now a much sturdier door. Anyway, that's my story and I hope one day I won't think about that every night before I go to bed. I was sitting in my living room one evening and I noticed movement outside my window. I glanced up and saw a man peering in. His face was pressed against the glass. I jumped up in shock and ran to the window, but he had already disappeared into the darkness. I felt very violated and scared knowing that someone had been watching me in my own home. I immediately called the police, but there was little that they could do without any identifying information about this peeping Tom. The next night, it happened again. I was in my bedroom getting ready for bed when I heard rustling outside my window. I looked up and saw the same man staring at me with a look of excitement in his face. I screamed and ran to the phone, but by the time the police arrived, he was gone. This went on for weeks with the man appearing at all hours of the night, watching me from outside my window. No matter if I had the blinds drawn or curtains up, it seemed like he would find the opening and stare in. I know this because my neighbor told me that he saw a man hanging around my house. I felt like a prisoner in my own home, constantly looking over my shoulder and jumping at every noise. I tried to stay strong and vigilant, but eventually, the stress and anxiety became too much. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, and felt like I was losing my mind. It was a constant battle to feel safe and secure in my own home. Finally, the police were able to catch the man in the act. It turns out that it was my neighbor who had been stalking me for months. I felt a sense of relief knowing that he was finally caught but the trauma of the experience stayed with me for years to come. I lost my sense of security and privacy and it took me a long time to regain those feelings again. This happened years ago when I was in college. We were four girls living in a dorm room. So I had this roommate, Anna, that used to stay late at night outside or at her boyfriend's and she would always forget to lock our dorm room door one night, around 3 a.m., I woke up from a nightmare. I heard something like a girl screaming, only once. But when I realized the dorm was all quiet, I thought for sure that it was just my imagination. I noticed that Anna had returned. She was in bed and I felt a strange urge to go see if the door was locked. So for the next few minutes, I had this internal dialogue. Go check the door. No, because if I stand up, I'll lose my sleep. Eventually, my laziness won and I fell asleep. When I woke up, my roommates briefed me on what happened that night. The whole dorm was talking about it. Apparently, a stranger entered our dorm that night. He was in his late 40s. He heard some girls in the room were not sleeping and were loud, so he banged on their door and said something, 
that I can't quite remember now. After some time, thinking he left, one of the girls went to the bathroom. The bathrooms are located in the hallway. As she was in the bathroom, he tried to break open the door. This was happening on the same floor where we lived, so that's probably why I heard the scream. Luckily, another girl saved her when she called the police and he got scared and ran away. But that's not all. Before he tried to assault that girl, he had been in the study room and vandalized it. He pooped on the floor, ripped the blast that was on a chair, and did other stuff in there. Made the study room a mess. The study room was right next to my room, and guess what? That night, we slept where our door unlocked. Just like you guys always say in here, always trust your gut. I should have trusted mine and checked the door. Thank God he didn't try our door. A few days later, I heard that the police found the guy and I heard that he was free. After that event, they increased the level of dorm security. Evening, folks. This has been ongoing for some time now, but tonight was particularly weird. Please excuse any weird formatting. I'm doing this on mobile, currently under my blankets, kinda freaking out. So, some context. I'm 25, female, and live on the second story of my building across from a big city. We have lots of houseless people in my area, and there's a safe injection site right next to my home. I'll mention right off the bat that I have been houseless within my lifetime from the ages of 8 to 10, and grew up in the care of a addict. I completely empathize with folks who are having a tough go at things. However, I also value my safety and my neighbor's safety for that matter. So I will preemptively apologize if at any point I sound frustrated at this ongoing situation. I'm mad at the situation that has plagued both the life of myself and the houseless man who is tormenting my building. This all started uh, about a year ago when my partner and I were nearly attacked by this houseless man while downstairs in our parking lot. To summarize the situation, we had just gotten home where my partner was going to drop me off. We didn't live together at the time, we kind of do now, but only on the weekends. And as we said our goodbyes, we noticed a man pacing in the visitor's parking lot who was seemingly having a rough time. We kept our distance, car doors locked and windows up, and eventually the man got the hint and left. Just to set the scene a bit here, my parking lot has two sections. One is a public parking guest area and the second is a locked gate with a smaller locked door for residents to safely park overnight. The gate requires a FOB entry, and the door has a regular building key. Both were made with metal bars. This is important for later. I got out of the car and proceeded to walk towards the door, key in hand. My partner started up the car which caused the houseless man to rush back into the parking lot and promptly attack the car. He hopped onto the hood, beating on the windows and trying to rip off the mirrors. I watched in horror as this terrifying situation evolved next to me. A mere 14 feet away. I quickly got my key into the lock and opened the door at lightning speed. The sound of my keys caught the attention of the man and he promptly sprinted towards me. Thankfully, by this point, I had begun closing the door behind me. By the time he got to me, I slammed the door in his face and stepped backwards while he screamed at me. When my partner realized I was safely behind a locked door, he got into gear and drove away. Moments later, he called me and instructed me to get away from the door and safely upstairs. It was a good thing he did. I felt like I was in freeze mode. I 
couldn't move. My heart was pounding out of my chest as this houseless man screamed disgusting things at me. Most of which revolved around essaying me and gesturing crudely at his groin and flicking his tongue. I finally broke my fear freeze, walked away as he chanted, Pretty lady, pretty lady, want to taste, huh? Those words are burned into my memory. I rushed upstairs and quickly closed the blinds of my windows. I heard him still yelling and chanting outside for a good few minutes after. But then I heard something unusual. A lighter clicking. The silence was deafening as the lighter clicked repetitively. Eventually the click stopped and he began laughing. I looked outside, peering through the blinds, I realized he was attempting to set our building's wooden fence on fire. Luckily it had rained, so the fence wasn't catching. I quickly hopped on a call with the emergency services who sent a police car and fire truck. As soon as the cop car pulled up, the houseless man went ballistic and started screaming bloody murder. They apprehended him quickly and took him away in the ambulance. Months passed with no sign of him, but one day a resident in my building reported being attacked by a man who matched his description. After the incident, we, the residents, repeatedly heard him screaming, crying, moaning and laughing at least three times a week outside our building, generally at night. He also started trashing and damaging people's cars when they parked in the guest parking lot. Thankfully, we installed a new gate last week that closes off the guest parking behind another FOB activated gate. The thing is, as soon as the gate got installed, the man left us alone. It has been quite a week. It's been nice, but tonight, about an hour ago, I was laying in bed scrolling on TikTok when I heard what sounded like soft sobbing. At first I thought it was coming from TikTok, but after some scrolling I realized it was coming from outside. I looked outside and there he was, sobbing and pacing around the back alley. He suddenly switched gears though and started jogging while groaning loudly and continuing to cry while occasionally hitting and attacking the new fence we installed. He has seemingly left now, but I am terrified at this new habit. I am really hoping he doesn't start crying outside my building routinely. I feel really bad for the guy and I also feel bad making this post, but the whole situation is really freaking me out. I don't feel safe. My own home and... I just need to vent. Thanks for reading. If anything else happens, I'll update this post. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we live on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2am, so I had always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was the weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out of our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock and it was around 2.30 a.m. My brother told me there were two men at our front door. 
Of course, now, this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walked out of the room and peeked over to look at the front door. When we looked, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me that there were two guys who had been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we headed over to where our parents are, whispering to try to find out what's going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point we see the men return and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog was still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards and still knocking while the dog was barking made this situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes the men walked away and we shuffled across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway which is lit up by our outside lights. There was a black Cadillac sitting there but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was where did the guys go? They weren't in the car and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately we figured out the answer when the handles to our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house which enters into the kitchen. At this point I just remember my mum frantically saying David as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun. Horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed his phone and called the police and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return to their knocking at the front. However, at this point, Several minutes had gone by and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and the yard, the two men bolted away attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of view, but the other was intercepted by an officer yelling at him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and fell to the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came back to my dad, and as we came out to the front, they ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So, random men at our door in the middle of the night? Let's not meet again. So let me preface this by saying I grew up in an upper middle class area really nice neighborhood with nothing but old people as neighbors. We live near great schools and there's a relatively low crime rate other than one neighborhood known for meth. When I was 13 we had our first break in. Nobody was home and I had just gotten off the bus. My mom was waiting for me at the top of the driveway in her grocery filled car. She was on the phone with my dad. She told me to wait with her since the window was busted out. My dad came home with three friends and got baseball bats to search the house. 
Nothing. The only reason we didn't call the cops is because we have a cat who likes to sit on the windowsill and we often left the window open for a breeze, leaving just a screen. We assumed that maybe the cat knocked out the screen by accident because someone forgot to close it. But then we later saw a boot print in the dirt going to the window and noticed our rug is all scooby dooed and rolled up from someone running. We assumed they saw our alarm system which tracks movement and flashes and got scared and ran thinking it was a silent alarm. What's odd is one step after entering the window was the computer, a TV, cash, and a camera. Nothing stolen. The second time getting broken into, I was 14. Same exact thing, window busted, nothing taken, boot print. This time we knew someone was coming after our house. We started setting our alarm more often. About six months later, I'm in the backyard sitting on the swing with my back facing the woods. My mom comes out on the upper deck and calls out to me saying that her and my dad are going to go see a movie and they would be back home in a few hours. I said okay and came back in through the basement door. Stupidly, I forgot to lock it. I stay in the basement in a side room with only one exit point and play Xbox. I put on my headset that covers my ears and enjoy about 20 minutes of Call of Duty before my cat who is sitting on my lap absolutely freaks out and bolts. I absolutely heard nothing because of my headset, but got up because she is quite scared. I see my basement door shaking after presumably slamming open into the wall. My heart drops and I think, maybe I left it cracked and the wind pushed it open. I don't see anyone standing in the doorway, but right behind the door there's a huge bush. I got a bad feeling in my gut and bolted upstairs. I burst through the basement door to my main floor, leaving it open, and run outside to my neighbors. My neighbors aren't home, but I hide in their yard while looking at my front door, which is glass and somewhat see-through. I wait for about 45 seconds and start laughing at myself thinking I'm just crazy. That's when I see a 6 foot man walk up the basement steps and past our front door. He peeks through the glass and I see him wearing a brown shirt and has short black or brown hair. I can't tell much more because the glass is opaque and because I was in my neighbor's yard. I called my parents to get no answer. I then called my sister who luckily worked at the theater and was there and she answers. I explain that there's someone in her house and she gets the on duty cop to send a bunch over. My sister rushes in the theater that my parents are in and they call a nearby neighbor that has guns to go check on me. At the time they thought I was still in the house. I see the man in my house turn away from the front door and head left down the hall. The left side of the hall has my parents' room and an office room. The office room is what he usually entered, assuming it was the same guy breaking in. After 30 seconds, I see him pass the front door again and go down the right side. That's where my room and my sister's room was. My neighbor is now coming into my yard with a pistol and calling for me, but he doesn't know I'm across the street and I'm too scared to yell to him. Right as he's turning to the front of the yard, he entered to the side. I see the man come back out and go downstairs where he presumably left through the basement door. Poor neighbor probably thought I was kidnapped, so I called him on his cell phone to let him know that I was across the street. No joke, six police came, three dogs, and they were all armed and ready. They kneeled in front of my garage, and my parents rushed home using the garage door opener to open it for them. Looked like a movie where they all had their guns out and the dogs aiming at the garage in case he was hiding. He was not there, which I knew from seeing him go back downstairs. The dogs start sniffing. They find a scent outside and follow it, but end up just picking up another cop's scent and losing it. They search the entire house and say it's clear, and I go back inside. We sent a neighborhood email out that night, and the next morning we got a response from a neighbor six doors down on the edge of the woods. I saw a man sprinting through the woods back into the meth neighborhood. He didn't get a good look at him, but definitely saw him sprinting, so he must have escaped through the back door and then ran back into the woods. The more I thought back on the experience, the more I realized these things. 1. It was probably the same guy since nothing was ever stolen and they were within a year and a half. 2. 
This man clearly didn't want money because he had tons of expensive things lying around that he didn't take. He searched East Hall for 30 seconds and left. He was looking for something or someone. 3. When I had my back to the woods on the swing, I think he was watching me. When my parents said they were leaving, he must have taken that as an opportunity. He had to have heard me because he came through the least visible door, the one I had gone through. 4. I was in a room that had no exits. If my cat wasn't on me, I wouldn't have heard him and he would have blocked my only exit and done God knows what. 5. I'm lucky he hid for a second before coming in. I'm guessing he wanted to make sure no one else was with me and waited to listen. 6. He was seen running back to the meth neighborhood, so he was probably drugged out and wanted to kill me. He never once took an item and only broke in three times when my parents weren't home. I strongly believe that this man wanted to find me and I think he was watching me from the woods. There's no telling how many days he watched me because I used to sit on that swing nearly every day. He was probably waiting for the right time for me to be alone. I love my cat to death and fully give her credit for saving my life. If she wasn't so loving and if she didn't want to be on my lap every waking hour of the day, I would have never known he came in and I don't even like thinking about what he would have done to me when he had my one exit sealed off. It's still super scary to think about and I'm not gonna lie, I hated being alone even up until I moved to college. I occasionally hear very distinct boot noises running up my stairs and back down. I would always check the back deck to see if anyone was leaving, but never saw anything. I constantly set the alarm from there on out and hated going on the swing when no one was home after that. Gave me some lasting paranoia too. So to the man who probably wanted to gut me, let's please not meet again. I was around 8 years old. I was playing Super Mario in my room at night, probably around 8 p.m. or so. I had a large window, like two normal windows side by side. The blinds were down but were slightly open so you could see the darkness outside. While I was playing I had a feeling like I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked to the left and clearly saw the outline of a white t-shirt in the window. It looked like the size of an adult. I remember being frozen and the hair standing up on my skin. I was petrified. It felt like minutes, but it was only seconds. I dropped my controller and ran out the room, telling my mom immediately. Just as that happened, I remember my dad pulling into the driveway. He said he saw nothing and checked around the whole house and everything, but found nothing. I was so scared though. I tried to even tell myself that it was a reflection of something in the room, but I knew what I saw. I tried to sit in the same spot for a few days to recreate the reflection and what it would look like, but nothing ever caused that look. I knew it. Someone was watching me. This all just happened 15 minutes ago and I'm freaked out, but hopefully I'll do an okay job recapping what just happened. At my apartment building, it's all street parking. Tonight, as I pulled in and parked, I noticed a man walk in the opposite direction from me. But then we made eye contact and he immediately turned around and walked in my direction. At first I thought it was strange but then he started to cross the street and was making a beeline for me. He wasn't saying anything at all so I didn't think he wanted money or directions. It freaked me out so I frantically grabbed my keys out of my purse and peeled out of there. What freaked me out though was that he was close enough to get into my car at that point that I made crystal eye contact and he looked pissed. So I drove off and circled around. I did not see that guy anywhere but decided to circle around again and look super carefully. Once again, looking around the sidewalk and the street and he's not walking around. I start to get out of my car and I see the guy coming out of the area where there were a bunch of bushes where I guess he had been hiding. Again, he beelines it for me. At this time, I'm actually on the phone with a really good friend of mine who at this point says he'll drive over. Luckily, he lives about 10 minutes from me. Said friend looks around and walks me into my apartment where I am safe now. But seriously, what the hell was that all about? He didn't say anything threatening to me, so I don't think I can call 911. But I do think I'll try the non-emergency number when I calm down. Stay safe out there, folks.
So the other night I was watching TV at 4 a.m. because I have stupid sleeping habits. I started hearing someone scream in despair. I opened my windows to take a look out closer, but the person was behind some trees and I couldn't make out what was going on. The screams were loud and painful, sounded like a woman, but I was not sure. The person finally got past the trees and I was able to see two men and one woman. The woman was screaming and the men were there, trying to help or being the reason she was screaming. Being a woman myself, I assumed the worst and I called the local police. They are like 20 meters away from where it was happening. I don't know how they didn't hear what was going on. I described the situation and the location and the police officer said that they were going to go check on it. The woman was still screaming. I couldn't understand what, then collapsed on the floor. The men were behind her, but they went on their way as she kept walking towards the police station. I never saw a police officer come out of the station, but they could have taken a route that I couldn't see from my window. I hope everything was okay with her, and that she just had some bad news delivered and was stressing out, and they were just friends helping. But if that was the case, I don't understand why they went away. The police said that they would call me back if they needed any info, but never did. First post here. It's short, but creeped me and my wife out. I stayed up last night, couldn't sleep because I drank coffee way close to bedtime. My wife usually falls asleep way before I do and doesn't wake up to anything. Anyways, I stayed up watching videos and movies and even read a few stories on here. Back and forth through the kitchen getting snacks and drinks. Finally decided to try to go to bed around 2.30am but was tossing and turning. I decided to take a hot shower as that usually relaxes me. I got up, took a pain pill, recent surgery and I was kind of hurting. I finally fell asleep around 3.30am. My wife gets up around 7.30am to use the restroom and yells, Babe, the front door is open. I stumble out of bed and grab my pistol, heading towards the living room. I look around and see a dim blue light coming in because the sun is beginning to rise and the door is halfway open. I quickly shut it and lock it, go back to my kid's room, and they both sound asleep. I check the kitchen, bathroom, even our closets, nothing. I start looking for missing things like keys, console, belongings, and everything is still in place. Nothing is missing. I look up the windows, vehicles still parked. We never use the front door ever. It's always deadbolted and locked, and I don't remember the last time we used it. Where our driveway is is the more convenient way to go in through the kitchen back door. We never figured it out. I was back and forth through the living room all night, and the door was closed. This is the first time this happened to me in 10 years that we've been here. Never any crime or break-ins around here. It really creeped us out. This happened last year sometime. I'm a small guy and I'm married. We live in a sketchy apartment complex. Anyway, we were sleeping one night and out of nowhere, someone starts pounding on our door at like 2 a.m. We both wake up shocked and a little scared because neither of us really have any close friends or family here because we are both kind of antisocial and the people we do have would call multiple times before showing up. We also at the time didn't have a peephole and we were the only people with a white door instead of a red door. So when we have new people come over, we tell them that. We didn't answer the door, but I grabbed a kitchen knife just in case. They kept pounding on the door for a good five minutes, while also sometimes trying the handle to get in. When they finally stopped and left, we watched them from our window as they got into an SUV. We still have no idea who it was, but I still think about it sometimes. I'm hesitant to share my story, but I feel it's important to warn others about the dangers of being a peeping Tom. You see, I used to be one. It all started out when I was a teenager, and I discovered the thrill of watching people through their windows at night. At first, I didn't think it was harmful. I was just curious about what people did in their private lives. But as time went on, my obsession grew. I found myself spending hours every night peering into strangers' homes, 
watching them go on about their daily routines. I thought I was being careful. I never got caught and I made sure not to do anything that would harm anyone. But then one night, everything changed. I was watching a woman through her bedroom window when she suddenly turned and caught me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there, staring at her in terror. To my surprise, she didn't call the police or scream for help. Instead, she walked over to the window and opened it. I thought she was going to confront me, but instead, she just looked at me with pity in her eyes. She told me what I was doing was wrong and that it could have serious consequences. She also told me she understood why I was doing it, that she had been in a dark place before and done things that she wasn't proud of. That conversation changed my life. I realized what I was doing was not only wrong, but also harmful to myself and others. I stopped being a peeping Tom after that night and never looked back. It's been years since that incident, but I still think about it often. Grateful to that woman for showing me compassion and understanding when I needed it the most. And I hope that my story can serve as a warning to others who might be tempted to engage in similar behaviors. It's never too late to change your ways and make a positive difference in the world. I received a knock on my back door around 1 a.m. They tried about three times before giving up. Someone coming to my back door is quite rare and would only happen if it was the landlord or my brother. My girlfriend has a key and wouldn't need to knock. None of the former would knock at my door at that hour. I didn't answer, mostly out of general annoyance. Flash forward to today, two days later. My girlfriend had just parked in the lot and I opened my back door for the first time since hearing the knocks. I saw some purple flowers in plastic wrapping that had been wilted due to the heavy rain and snow over the past couple days. It was unmarked and has no note attached to it. I immediately assumed the visitor was someone who had delivered flowers from my girlfriend. I had flowers delivered to her just a week ago, so I assumed she did it too. I had felt bad that I had let them wilt in the rain and profusely apologized to her when she came through the door. The flowers were not from her, and the 1 a.m. visitor remains unexplained. If a family member sent them, they would have called to ask if I got it, and I doubt anyone is stalking me, a guy in his mid-30s. Any ideas what this could be? I just found it unsettling. I'm a 16-year-old female, so about two years ago I was home with my mom. It was just the two of us. Now, my mom at the time was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was basically in a drug-induced coma. Nothing could wake her up. I had decided to take a bath while she slept. My bathroom door was locked, as was my mother's bedroom door, as she seemed to think we didn't know about her addictions and kept it locked so we didn't find out. The house was silent. I had only been in the bath for a half an hour before I heard the front door open. I assumed it was my elder sister coming back from work as no one else would have just walked in. But I wanted to be sure, so I texted her. I immediately got a worried text back saying, No, I'm not home. Why? Was someone there? I froze. I could hear the footsteps. Now, our house was small, one story, and from the front door to the bathroom door was only a small living room. I heard a weird scraping noise coming from the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the scraping sound stop outside the bathroom door and then someone grabbed the doorknob. They turned it very slowly from side to side for about a minute. The entire time I was silent, still frozen and shaking like a leaf. I wanted to call my mom but I didn't want whoever it was to hear the sound and get to my mom. After a while I didn't hear anything. I stayed in the bath for what I think was an hour till I heard the front door open and then click shut softly. I stayed in the bath long after the water had gone cold until I heard my sister come in. She yelled if I was there and if I was okay and why the door was unlocked. I got out of the bath and heard her gasp before I had come out, but when I did, I swear my blood went cold. There's a line spanning the wall of the hallway. The paint had been cut out like someone had trailed something sharp along the wall. 
Currently, the theory of the scraping noise I heard was someone trailing a knife on the wall. This was a few years ago in my old house, around Halloween. I'm a 43 year old male. One day, I was home alone in my house. I have a wife, three kids, and a dog. I'm in the basement cutting wood and working when all of a sudden I hear a thump on the ceiling above me, which is the first level floor. It's rhythmic and almost perfect in beat. I'm a handyman and do a lot of my own fixing and know the unusual sound houses make. This was not usual. I started following the thumping around the first floor. It's as if someone, something, is walking around. I call out my wife's name, no answer. My kids, no answer. Just soft moaning and thumps that are both getting louder. My dog is in the basement with me and following the sound with me with his tail straight up, completely silent. This is weird because I have a loud, jumpy dog. I then slowly follow the thumping to the steps. I hear a weak old woman's voice calling for Jimmy and she's calling it over and over again. Ignoring my hellos, she keeps walking around the first floor, calling out, moaning, and thumping. I grab my dog by the collar and leave out the basement door and walk around the outside of my house. I go up the street and there's this younger couple calling out for someone. Let's say Nancy for the sake of this. I go up to them and say, Are you Jimmy? The young guy looks at me in relief and confusion crossed on his face. He tells me that that's his dad's name, but he passed away years ago. Turns out Nancy was his mom with some kind of mental issue. She had snuck out of the house up the road. Her family lived in my house before we did. Did not know that. And she was having some kind of episode where she went looking for her husband in her home. She also had a wooden leg. Don't know the story, but that was a thumping. We got her home safely, and now I double checked my locks from that point on. This happened pretty much an hour ago. I was pulling up to my house with my mom when she says, Who is at her house? Me, being confused, looked at her yard. Then I see someone walking up towards us. My mom says he was trying to open the door to get in. The encounter went like this. Hey, I just lost my job and was looking for some work. Could you help? My mom replied with something that I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure she said no because of what he's about to ask. Could you spare a few dollars? Wanting to get rid of him, my mom said, Sure, if you can come to this side, I can give you a couple bucks. Thank you. My mom gives him some money. They start to talk about how he should take it as a blessing and pass it on to someone else. He says my mom is an angel. Then they start to talk about other things I can't remember right now. Then the man disappears. My mom starts to drive around to find the man to make sure he left as she understandably didn't feel safe getting out. We start to drive around. She calls her boyfriend and my dad. Then there's a cop on the side of the road. Hey, there's a middle-aged man on my doorstep with the screen door open. Then he walked up to my car and asked for work at this time of night which I found suspicious. He asked me for money and I gave him some money. Where do you live? My mom tells the cop and he says, okay, I'll follow you there. We drive back home. He inspects the front door and backyard, but there's no one. We decide it's safe to go back in. My mom's boyfriend is currently at our house right now and I'm shaking. Edit, I just talked to my mom. She said he could have been drunk and at the wrong house as it was St. Patrick's Day and people do like to get drunk on that day, even when they aren't Irish. But I highly doubt that as I find it weird that as soon as he saw us pulling up, he came over to our car with a sob story. Take this information as you will though. I have been seeing this young man who appears to be homeless in the park across the street from my house for the past few days. He must be new to this area because I had never seen him before and I frequent this park with my dog at least three to five times a day. He has some odd tendencies like sleeping in random and odd areas of the park such as next to a busy sidewalk and in landscaping. 
Night while walking to my car, I see that he has entered our small 20 apartment gated complex and is hanging out at the bottom of my stairs that is leading to my parking spot. No idea how he got in there, other than he followed someone in as a pedestrian through the lock gates that you have to enter a code for. I get in my car as fast as possible. I grab some dinner and about 20 minutes later, I come home and don't see him around anymore. I quickly walk up my step and glance around while getting my key in the lock to see that he had followed me up the stairs and was watching me from about 3-4 to four feet back. I was visibly startled when seeing him and said hello or something while turning my key and going inside, locking the door as fast as I could. This happened about 30 minutes ago, still shaking from the creepiness. This took place a couple years ago in Hollywood, Florida. I was in middle school at the time. My sister, mom, and I were at our front porch unlocking the door after coming home from school. We noticed something was off right away because our alarm didn't go off. My mom has always made it a point to set the alarm before she would leave the house. Although that was weird, we just commented about it. It was very possible that she had just forgot to set it. Because of that possibility, we just ignored it and moved on. As we entered the house, we began to set our backpacks and other stuff down. I heard the drawer close in my bedroom. I thought I was hearing things, so I looked at my mom and was about to ask her if she heard something. My mom looked at me at the same time and her look of horror was enough for me to realize that she had heard the same thing. My sister didn't notice because she had her earphones in. That sound and the fact that the alarm was off was enough for my mom to decide to get us out of there. She loudly said, I want to show you something in the backyard. But she didn't want anyone in the house to know that we were onto them, and that's why we were leaving the house. My sister looked confused, but I knew exactly why my mom said this. As we entered the backyard and shut the door behind us, we sped walk towards the alley behind our house. The only thing that separated us from it was a wooden fence. Once we reached the fence, we opened the gate and began to exit into the alley. I was the last one through the gate, and before I shut it, I looked at the house for the last time. To my horror, I saw someone looking at me through our curtains. We called the police and they found no one and nothing was stolen. I never told anyone about what I saw. I was about 12 or 13. It was a Friday or Saturday night and my dad worked nights. My parents were separated so I was at my dad's place. I had done homework, and once it got really late, I got into my pajamas. I checked my doors in on my younger sister. She was asleep, and I stayed up watching TV. I heard a knock at the front door. I had a dog. He begins to bark and runs to the back. It's just a little past midnight at this point. No one should be there. I decided to stay quiet. There were two windows I could look out of, but I decided not to. This was probably a good thing because there were knocks on that window too. Once that happened, I called my dad. Honestly, I should have called the police, but I was scared. I was near one of them and I could hear footsteps and voices. I didn't hear a word they said because I was freaking out and I moved away. I went to the back door to make sure it was locked and it was. Once I turned away, however, there were knocks. My dog stands by it and barks more. My dad tells me to check on my sister, and she's still sleeping. I finally decided to peek outside and see a truck, and it's just sitting there. My dad told me I would be okay, and soon after, he sent my grandfather over. He sat me for a while before going home. Now, in the morning, my sister told me she didn't hear anything. To be fair, I did close her bedroom door. I'm also glad the entire house was locked up. I wouldn't find out until a couple weeks later that the house next door was broken into. We literally had the police come over to our house and ask if we heard anything. We hadn't. My dad later moved into a bigger house, and that was that. This only happened a few hours ago, so I'm shaken, but it's too early in the morning to phone and wake up my friends. I need to talk to someone and get this out. I'm so creeped out and concerned, so I thought about coming here. Brief setting and context. 
I'm a woman in my 30s caring for my elderly parents, so I'm staying in my downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often have that window open at night since I need to be cool to sleep and haven't worried about it since there's a cabinet and aquarium in front of the window area. Not blocking the window from view and I could reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be able to leave it open again. It started at maybe 3.30 to 4 a.m. sometime. I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours. I was reading a book when I heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began to pace a bit, looking up at the window before jumping out the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police. Dog will bite. Just in case there's someone out there. I went to look at the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right curtain too, tucking it so the one wouldn't be able to move it. I really wasn't alarmed then. It was a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by our neighbor's gate next to the door will make Sable growl or bark, but she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She usually growl, but stay in bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that if it was someone scoping out our window to potentially burgle, they would have now seen the room was occupied by a person and a dog and would find an easier target, but I mainly guessed it was just some random noise she heard outside. I was wrong. A good half hour later, after I relaxed and thought I might doze off soon, I heard a growl again, a really serious, deep, and low growl, and I listened, again thinking it might be foxes or something, but I heard what sounded like deep, horror movie breathing sounds, like the heavy breathing sounds a pervert makes on the phone to his stalking victim in a film. I sat up, looked out the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back, lifted from the bottom like someone was peeking underneath it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted, hey! and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain. I saw a figure of a man moving away from the window to the right towards the front door and exit the front garden. Too dark to make out any features or clothing. It was just a dark male figure. Shakenly, I immediately thought that since I knew he moved away and it wasn't at or under our window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called the emergency services. One thing that creeped me out in hindsight is that it would have taken me a few seconds to move from my bed to the side of the window. And that was after I shouted and he knew that he had been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing that I had seen him until I pulled the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing was so deliberate. It was so loud, like someone was trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house, turning the lights on, making sure the rest of the house was secure. And it was. I'm very careful to lock all the doors and windows at night, and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5 a.m. and took their report. They suggested asking the neighbor if they had camera footage and to let them know that there was a prowler in the area. The cops went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5 a.m. Anyway, since the dark meant I only saw the shape of the person, I had no real description. I doubt they could do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man. But the breathing in the figure I saw instantly made me think male. An outline of his head looked smooth. So either he was bald or wearing a tight cap. Then the height would have been average. 5'8 to 5'10. I was still shaken but feeling angry and violated. And wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. 
I never thought anything like this would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges. Since I'm caring for my folks full time now, I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly or disabled parents. I'm at the wrong side of 35 and living in jeans, joggers, and t-shirts. No makeup or fussing with my hair most of the time. So not a likely target for a peeping Tom. If it wasn't for the fact that it was my dog who alerted me to something both times, I'd wonder whether I was half asleep and dreamt it. I have had hallucinations once as a result to a bad reaction to antidepressants. That was more than a decade ago. Hasn't happened before or since, and I learned how to test my reality in times. I was worried about whether something was really happening or not. I have to think it was someone who was looking to burgle our house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone was on drugs or having a mental health episode, or, and this one bothers me most, Someone who wanted to scare me. But why? Who? They know where I live. Are they going to come back? New fears keep popping into my mind. Like most nights, I'm up at some point late at night or very early in the morning and will let the dog outside into the back garden for a quick pee and I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to be attacked and the person gaining entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house that goes from the front to the back garden with only a very small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access, then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep again. They seemed to be trying to deliberately scare me when they returned the second time doing the deep breathing noise, and stayed by the window even after I shouted. In those few seconds it would have taken me from the shout out until I reached the window and could move the curtains out of the way. They could have moved and been long out of sight, but they stayed there until there was a chance I could see them, only then moving away. The breathing noises and then the coldness ran through me when I actually saw the man moving away from the window will always haunt me, along with the questions of their motives. Were they trying to scare me? Why? What's to stop them from coming back? Back when I was in 6th grade, I had a close-knit group of friends. There were four of us, and we were all girls, and we hung out all the time. Sleepovers were the norm for us, and we usually rotated houses, seeing that all our parents knew each other, and we all lived relatively close to each other. The furthest being about 10 minutes away. One particular sleepover, we were at my friend Caitlin's house and two of her cousins just happened to also be sleeping over. Caitlin had two sisters and an older brother that were really nice and friendly. During our sleepovers, they usually just stayed in their rooms and would only come out for food, so we never really felt like we were imposing on them. Her brother would sometimes let us play with his PS2 and his sisters would talk to us about boys and high school gossip, which at the time we thought was really cool. Overall, Caitlin had a really great relationship with her siblings. I couldn't say the same for her cousins though. One of her cousins was in 8th grade and she was closer in age to one of Caitlin's older sisters. Who was a freshman in high school so she was staying in her room. The other cousin was a boy who was a junior in high school and naturally he stayed in Caitlin's brother's room. The girl was nice but seemed a bit shy. The guy however just gave me the creeps. He was definitely more outgoing, but something about his mannerisms was strange, and when he smiled, it looked like he was smiling about something he thought in his head, and not necessarily at you. He had shoulder length, stringy and greasy hair that was dirty blonde, and was pretty scrawny for a guy's age. He looked like he could be a freshman in high school. Caitlin really seemed uncomfortable around him. Later on, we were in Caitlin's room. She told us that she just recently met her cousins because their mom and her mom had a falling out years before and weren't talking to each other. They recently reconnected, so they thought it would be a good idea for Caitlin's aunt and her children to come visit for a weekend. Caitlin said that her female cousin was really nice, but that she thought the guy was weird. Ever since he got to the house, he's been trying to hang out with her instead of her brother. He would go into her room and go through her toys and books, trying to make conversation with her. He was also kind of touchy. He would pet her cheeks and her hair. 
when she would flinch or move away from him, he would get this really cold look in his eyes and he would stare at her for a few seconds before smiling, that creepy smile he does. We all agreed that it was really weird, but eventually moved on to other things and talked about the usual stuff 6th graders talk about. We ended up watching a movie before bed and took our turns going to the bathroom in the hallway that Caitlin shared with one of her sisters to brush her teeth. The oldest sister had her own bathroom in her room. Everyone called dibs on their turn and since I didn't really care, I was the last one to go there. When my friend Lucia came back and told me that she was done, I was relieved because I was getting antsy and tired and just wanted to brush my teeth, lay in bed, and gossip until we fell asleep. I walked down the hallway and opened the door to the bathroom. I was so distracted I didn't even notice Caitlin's cousin in the bathroom until I turned the lights on. I quickly apologized and closed the door. At that point, I was just about to leave and run back to the room. He was in the freaking bathroom with the lights off. From what I could see before I shut the door, he was sitting on top of the closed toilet. Before I could leave, he opened the door, smiled at me, and told me to go ahead. I didn't really care about brushing my teeth at that point, but I didn't want to run away and provoke a reaction out of him. I entered the bathroom and immediately locked the door behind me. I quickly brushed my teeth and did my business. This is when things really got creepy for me. I opened the door and he was still standing there, waiting with a smile on his face. Let me walk you back to your room. I didn't even know what to say to that. I guess he took my silence as a yes, because before I knew it, he grabbed my right hand and was walking me back to Caitlin's room. His hands were warm and sweaty, even though he didn't look like he was sweating or remotely warm. I felt so numb and I could hear my own breathing. I honestly felt like I was going to pass out. I swear the hallway has never felt so long. When I got to the room, he let go of my hand and said goodnight, going back to the bedroom he was staying in which we passed before we got to Caitlin's room. I walked back inside and I guess I was making a face because all my friends came up to me and asked me what was wrong. I told them what happened and they all agreed that it was super weird and Caitlin said she would talk to her mom in the morning. I was hoping it would end there, but it didn't. As a rule, we weren't allowed to lock doors during sleepovers. It's usually fine, but not in this instance. I had to have been sleeping for a few hours when Caitlin was shaking me awake. Apparently she had been up for a while and with me being the closest to her, I was the first one she ran to. She then told me with her voice shaking that her cousin had opened the door twice to her room and would stare in the room for almost a full minute before quietly closing the door. I was really frightened when I heard this. He was just watching us sleep throughout the night. I agreed to jump into Caitlin's bed with her and waited. It didn't even take that long when I heard the door open. Both of us just froze and stared straight at the door. There was no light in the hallway so the only source of light in that room was from the moon outside but we could still see a silhouette of someone's head peeking in through the door. We could feel his eyes on us and he was just staring into the darkness of Caitlin's room for a few seconds. We were trying not to move so that he didn't know we were awake but it didn't matter. He let some air out of his nose, as if he was trying not to laugh. Hey, Caitlin, he whispered, and then just closed the door. Caitlin looked like she wanted to cry. She grabbed onto me and we just held each other and waited until he decided to come back. He never ended up coming back, though. I guess it wasn't as fun since he knew we were awake. We never ended up going back to sleep that night, though. The next day, my mom came to get me pretty early, and I said my goodbyes. I was glad Caitlin's cousin was still asleep. When I saw Caitlin in school, I asked her what happened when I left. She said she told her mom, and her mom was really concerned and said she would talk to the aunt. I guess she told my mom about what happened to me too because she asked me about it later on and was prying to see if anything else happened to me. After that, she made sure that Caitlin's cousins were not around before allowing me to sleep over at their place. She didn't have to worry though because they never came back to visit after that. I don't know if Caitlin's mom had another falling out with her sister, or if she just never invited them back to the house, but Caitlin's creepy cousin, let's not meet ever again. This story took place in early 2017. 
I had recently moved from a major city to a small town in the Midwest to get myself together and separate myself from bad habits I had developed. Previously, I had been living on the West Coast and worked for a couple who were pot farmers, just trimming their weed for one season with a few other trimmers. Nothing major stuck out to me other than the guy who was in his mid-30s was a major asshole and super protective of his weed. His girlfriend was someone I wouldn't normally get along with, but she was alright. So I trimmed their weed for that season and they paid me a portion up front. He said the rest would come after they sold a few pounds or whatever, because that's just how the business went. They did end up paying me within a few weeks, so all was good with me. However, the man here kept texting me after I moved mid-country with random, Hey, how are you doing? I never liked the guy, got bad vibes from the get-go, but his girlfriend was a friend of a close friend, so I sort of gave them the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, the girlfriend started messaging me via text, nearing spring, after I had worked for them trimming their weed that fall season, asking if I would be available to house it for them while they were on vacation out of the country. At this point, I was living in Colorado, and the farm was in California. I did not have a permanent job set up yet, and they were offering good money to house it, plus make some extra money trimming weed that they had left over from the season. Stupidly, I drove my ass 17 hours with dollar signs in my eyes, and all was hell from there. They lived in a full house with a gardener's quarters attached to their main house. There is one bedroom and one bathroom, an electric stove, kettle, kitchen area in the gardener's bedroom. There is also a doorway from this area into the main house, blocked by a bookshelf on my side. When they invited me to stay in house sit, they were there for two or three days and part of their stay included drilling the door shut on the opposite side so that I could not enter their house. But that didn't bother me and I honestly understood why they would want to lock up their house but things got really freaking weird afterwards. I had been there alone for a few days, trimming, walking the dogs, filling the hummingbird feeders, watching the house like I was supposed to. The girlfriend would call from Morocco every so often to check up on me. I thought everything was fine until I started hearing water running from the kitchen inside of the house, the part of the house that I had no access to, but was directly connected to. I immediately called the couple and told them that I could hear someone in their house. Their response was literally, It's none of your concern what you hear on the other side of the wall. This turned my stomach. I was in the middle of nowhere, locked by a gate on the property, hired to house it, and all of a sudden it was not my concern if someone was inside their place. It freaked me out. I still had two more weeks to be at this place, and I was properly freaked the fuck out. Over the next few days, I'd feel scared and calm in waves. At one point, I was sitting outside with the dogs and they ran up to the side of the house, wagging their tails like they were greeting someone and I heard a very quiet, shh, and then footsteps patter off. I continued to hear the TV, microwave, water running in the main part of the house. The language the girlfriend was using with me via text was too personal in regard to what I was doing. I mean, sure, they could have had a camera installed, although I searched the room for any devices, but the sounds and even the dog reacting to what I heard was enough for me. Once I realized that I was house-sitting, but also being spied on in some weird way, I started to have fun with it. I don't know if I figured that I was going to die anyway, or maybe if I acted crazy enough, they wouldn't want me for whatever their purpose was. But one night, I was out on the small porch steps, having a very late cigarette. It had to be close to midnight, and I could hear someone walking around the perimeter of the house. So I stood up, opened the door to the gardener's quarters, and closed the door, as if I had walked back inside. But in reality, I just opened the door and closed it, keeping my position with a cigarette on the porch. Immediately, someone walked from the side of the house, because they thought I was inside. They noticed me, and ran into the woods. In my mind, I set a teeny trap to see if I was delusional, and it had proved that I wasn't. So I started doing crazy dumb stuff because I was alone. Nothing too wild. I just blasted Backstreet Boys, set their garage cans up like a drum set, and walked around topless. Honestly, I thought if these people were crazy enough to be fucking watching me while I house it for them, I had to do something more ridiculous to push them away. 
Maybe that doesn't make sense, but I can't help but reference the Hey Arnold episode where the bully is after him and he says, Don't hit me. I'll hit me. I'm crazy. Anyway, the couple finally came back to their house from Morocco and acted like they didn't want to pay me. They did, after some pulling and tugging, but fuck. Don't ever go house sit and not really know the people you're house sitting for in the Emerald Triangle. Or just don't even go there. It's really shady business. It was about two years ago on a very hot night. It's very safe where I live and I went to buy some stuff at a supermarket at dusk. When I left the shop, it was quite dark. It gets dark suddenly in the tropics. It's only about a five minute walk home, but I was feeling uneasy. I kept stopping and turning to look behind me. Nobody, but the road was dimly lit and there were a lot of bushes, easy for someone to hide. I kept walking with this gnawing sense of unease and I still kept looking behind me. I gratefully reached home, put it out of mind, cook dinner, watch TV, etc. About midnight, I went to lay down on my bed. I'm an insomniac, so I just lay there with the lights on and I started to read. I heard a creaking sound above my head. My bedroom window makes a lot of noise, but I was too scared to look. Nothing happened. However, I am now on high alert. Moments later, I heard a smashing noise in the kitchen. I froze. My bedroom door was open and as I said, the light was on. I heard some noises in the living room and pretended to be asleep. After a short time, I heard the click of the front door being opened. Someone had let themselves out. This was around 2.30 a.m. 2.45 a.m. I'm convinced that I'm alone and I called the police. 3.15 a.m. I called them again. 3.45 a.m. I rang them again. They told me that they only had two officers that night and that they were busy. 4.20 a.m. They arrived and asked me what the problem was. I rattled off my story. They didn't even bother to look at the broken window. All they said was, it does sound suspicious, and then left. As it stood, the person had taken my bag from my chair in my room. And yes, I had quite a bit of money in it as I was planning to buy some furniture. I do believe that someone noticed me in the supermarket that night, followed me home, checked my bedroom window to see if I was asleep, then did their deed. I thank God that I wasn't harmed in any way. Even if I somehow managed to call the cops, screaming and begging for help, no one would have cared. So grateful I'm here, unharmed and alive. I live in a remote mountain area. About nine years ago, I was sitting at my computer at 2 a.m. when the side door got kicked in. The local meth head came through the door, pulling a revolver out of his shoulder holster. I picked up my Colt 44, cowboy gun, that I kept on my desk and put a slug right through his belly button from across the house. He fell outside so he didn't bleed in my house. I shot him there because I didn't want to kill him, but I knew from training that an abdominal shot was the most painful. A deputy and ambulance arrived about 45 minutes later. The deputy commented on my marksmanship, admired my gun, made in 1871, wrote a report and left. Six months later, he died from a meth-induced heart attack. Good riddance. When I was 26, my parents were on holiday. I went over to their house every day to feed the cat. One Friday, my husband was away doing a gig, so I waited until he left before going to the house. I got there around 6 p.m. The area that my parents live was not a good one. There was a very large council estate right next to where they lived. Due to all the attempted break-ins, every internal door in the house could be locked. The doors were all heavy and inset into deep frames. I unlocked the front door, then unlocked the door leading into the kitchen. As I opened it, I noticed the drawers were opened and there was stuff all over the floor. I heard movement, so I quickly relocked the door before letting myself into the living room and calling the police. 
I explained that I was in the house. The burglar was still in the house with me. They said that they would send someone over as soon as they could. An hour later, I rang again. I was so frightened if they were still in the kitchen. I sat there with a pair of scissors in my hand, not sure what I was planning to do with them, but they made me feel a bit safer. It was about two and a half hours later when the police finally arrived. It turned out the burglar had removed the kitchen window and frame. The police reckoned it would have been very noisy and would have taken a while. They said forensics would have to come to take the fingerprints, but that they were currently very busy. It took two days for forensics to come by and it had rained heavily in the meantime, so forensics didn't get anything useful. This happened nearly 30 years ago. The burglar was never caught, but the large council of state has been pulled down and there's much less antisocial behavior. This happened back in 2008, and to this day, I don't know if the person who broke in fully realizes how close she came to losing her life. In 2008, when I was 37, I had moved back home to take care of my dying mother and stayed there after she passed. It was a fairly small country town, and the house was in a rural area, very low crime rate, and I can't even remember if I locked the doors during the daytime if someone was home. It was a fairly large ranch style house with my room being at the very back and my dad's on the other side of the house. My father was a pastor for our church. One Sunday morning I was really tired and just didn't feel like going. My pops left and I was enjoying laying in bed watching TV on super low volume with my eyes closed. About 30 minutes later I heard noises from the other side of the house that just weren't quite right. I laid there super still for a few seconds, just listening, trying to figure out what the noise was, and then heard quiet footsteps. It hit me that someone was there that shouldn't be. We've always had a few firearms in the house for personal protection, for scenarios just like this. I got my loaded 45 from my nightstand and very quickly made my way through the house. Then I was finally able to see there was someone in my dad's room. His dress had a cabinet type door on it and they were open. In a fast second I saw two legs of someone bent over going through his stuff. My gun was drawn down and aimed with my finger on the trigger when the intruder's head popped out overlooking the doors. Not knowing what to expect I was ready to fire but I recognized the face. It was the gal that cleaned our house off and on and her husband was a nice guy from our church. Turns out she had a drug problem and she knew that my dad had pain meds in his dresser from when he broke his hip. I yelled so loudly at her. What do you think you're doing? Do you know how close she just came to getting shot? She gave me some lame story and excuse about her being in the area and that she had a piece so she came to our house. Thought we were at church. But she also needed a t-shirt so she came looking for one of my dad's and she knocked my dad's pill bottle over by accident. Yeah, okay, makes no sense whatsoever. I told her again that she almost got killed, that I was told to never point a gun at anything if I didn't intend on killing it, and that this gun was pointed right at her. She was damn lucky that I recognized her in that split second. She kept apologizing and begging me not to call the cops or tell her husband. I told her to get out of my house. She left in tears and I sat on the couch trying to process everything that just happened. It was scary and infuriating at the same time and just left me with a crappy feeling. I told my dad when he got home. He was not happy for sure, but he had a meeting with her. Apparently, she admitted to everything and her problem, admitted to her husband a few days later, and went to rehab. I was living in Cape Cod year-round in a house that had been converted to three apartments. Because this was such a popular vacation destination, parking was at a premium. My apartment had five spaces, one for me, two for the mother and daughter who lived in the downstairs portion of the house, and two people who lived in the upstairs in the front. I was in the upstairs rear by the parking. One night I get home to find a party raging in the rental house next door. A common occurrence in the summer, as almost all these houses in the neighborhood were summer rentals. I see that both my downstairs neighbors are home, and one of my upstairs neighbors was home. 
However, a strange car was parked in one of the spaces. I parked in my usual space and went upstairs. I later looked out the window to find that one of my neighbors had returned and parked behind the strange car boxing it in. About 2 in the morning I was asleep when I heard something wrong. I realized I hear boots coming across the stairs into my apartment. The downstairs door was locked but it had to be closed in a very specific way or the lock didn't catch. I never reported this as I live in a very safe, upscale area. A lesson I have now learned. I honestly didn't think this was real until I saw the cat run and dive under the bed and realized that someone was definitely in my apartment. This was a large studio apartment so there was only one L-shaped room and nowhere to hide. It's interesting because you can plan on how you would act in the moment but when it actually happens everything is just instincts. I just pulled the covers over me and said, hello? I literally greeted the intruder politely. He started yelling incoherently and he bumped into the table and knocked over a vase. I got my phone and was trying to decide if I should run past him into the bathroom and lock myself in when I heard someone else running upstairs. The guy yelling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he's drunk and got away from me. The second guy started dragging the first guy out but then asked me if I could move my car because he was blocking them in. I told him that it's not my car, it was from the front apartment. They leave and I heard them walk around front and pound on the door. I then hear a very heated argument which ends with the police being called. I talked to my neighbor the next day and he was fuming. He called the rental company that handled most of the houses in the neighborhood and from then on renters were told that they would be towed if they used our parking area. After it was all over it surprised me how long it took me to stop shaking. Even though it wasn't a dangerous situation. My adrenaline levels didn't know that, and just so you're aware, I never walked up the stairs without double checking that lock ever again. I wasn't home alone, but I was a kid and asleep. Our house had two stories. The first story was the main house, and the second story had been built above the separated garage. Between them, a set of doors had been built and it closed so that you had to walk under the stairs to walk in between the two buildings. You had to be careful to stay on the garage side of the passageway so you didn't hit your head because you were passing under the slope of stairs. Our backyard was fenced and a gate from the driveway led to the passageway under the stairs. Our normal way to get into the house was not from the front door. We would get out of the car, go through the gate, greet our dog, go under the passageway, then turn left into the kitchen door. My dad was the sheriff's deputy, so the front door was bolted and chained, and the kitchen door always had a bolt. But because he was a cautious man, my dad never wanted us to accidentally get locked out of the house, so we hid a spare key in the freezer in the garage. We were strongly cautioned never to tell anyone about the key or let them see us use it. Although we spent most of our time downstairs during the day, we all slept upstairs at night. My bedroom was the furthest from the stairs. One night I was dead asleep and suddenly I jolted awake. Something had run across my hand. I ran out of my room. Mom, Dad, a rat just ran across my bed. They were instantly awake and we all went back into my room to see what it was. There, sitting on my pillow, was my brother's hamster. His cage was downstairs. How did he get up there? My brother swore he had locked the cage before he went to bed, but here the hamster was. He picked up the hamster, and we all went downstairs to see what happened, except for my sister, who just went back to bed. Sure enough, the cage in the living room was open. We put him back and closed the cage door. Suddenly, my mom had a funny look on her face. Why is the kitchen light on? My dad put his hand out to tell us to stay back, then crept into the kitchen. He yelled back to us, The back door is open. At that moment, my sister came flying downstairs. Someone just ran out of the gate. She had heard the gate slam. My dad bolted out the door to catch whoever it was, but they were long gone already. None of us slept for the next hour, trying to figure out what had happened. My parents probably didn't sleep all night after reclosing and locking the kitchen door and putting us back to bed. 
The best we can figure is, one of us somehow let someone know about the key, although all of us denied it. The person had been at our house before because the dog hadn't barked. Maybe it was a kid because nothing was stolen and the hamster cage was open. We never did figure out. Needless to say, my dad moved the key to another hiding place. I was house and dog sitting for my sister when I took her dog Bailey out back for the last time before heading to bed. My sister's house is a townhouse that's connected on both sides in a long line of townhomes. In the back was a long, fairly narrow strip of grass running along the homes, then a large field with long grass and weeds. So, condos, grass, then field, no fence or any structures for about a mile. I was enjoying the evening air. It was probably around 10.30 p.m. and was completely dark outside. Not feeling weary of anything at all. All was quiet except for Bailey. After about two minutes when Bailey had done her business, I called her back and went inside. Out of habit, I immediately locked the door behind me. We walked across the room to go upstairs with Bailey right ahead of me. Right as I walked behind the wall that separated the view from our back door, I heard the doorknob jiggle. I froze. Doorknob jiggled again. I waited a few more seconds just so I could be 100% sure and heard a definite sound of the metal jiggling and someone trying to get inside. I bolted upstairs where Bailey already was, still completely unaware of the situation. I hid in the closet and called the police. They showed up a while later, searched the area and couldn't find anything and told me there was probably someone who was actually trying to get into a home a few houses down that was having a party, most likely an honest mistake. They treated me nicely, but they clearly thought I was just a scared girl who was overthinking things from being alone in the house. They left, and my brother and his friends drove an hour and a half so they could stay the night with me. If I had been who I am now, I probably would have given the police at least a little pushback. I don't think they could have done much past searching the area they did, but I would have told them that they were wrong. It was not an honest mistake. Someone was definitely trying to get into the house after they saw me out there alone. The fact that I was a 19 year old, 100 pound girl by myself with a very sweet but very dumb and not intimidating dog at all. I was outside there for a long enough time that if someone was nearby me, they would have been intentionally keeping themselves quiet. It took me about 10 seconds to cross the room out of view after coming back inside. That means the person had to be close enough to me and almost definitely watching me when I crossed behind the wall out of view to try to open the door within 10 seconds. I can't imagine that someone sees a small woman by herself, doesn't make themselves known, and tries to follow her back inside the home as pure intentions. I look back and just cringe at what could have happened if I hadn't locked the door behind me right away. This was in 2011. I'm female and was 22 at the time. A year after I graduated college, I was living in my first apartment with a friend. I had adopted the sweetest dog I've ever had, a run of the litter Pomeranian who literally loved every person she ever met. My nephew was young at the time and would sometimes handle her a little too roughly. Sweet kid, we'd always correct him, but he didn't quite realize how little she was under all that fur but she tolerated it without ever nipping or anything. One day, my roommate was gone and there was a knock at the door. It was a handyman who said that he was there for an annual check on the appliances. He was wearing the apartment complex standard uniform and had a badge, so I didn't really think twice about it even though I hadn't been notified that this would be happening. And upon following up, he did really work there. He comes in and begins chatting and sort of leering. I felt uncomfortable but not nearly as freaked out as when my dog came rushing in between us, ears back, teeth bared, and started growling at him. He kind of awkwardly laughed and went to go pet her. Odd choice for a dog that's baring his teeth at you. She immediately lunged forward like she was going to bite him. He leaped back before she could. Tiny dog, large man, but he obviously was freaked out. At this point, she's straight up barking at him. He asked if I could put her away while he worked and I lied and said she had separation anxiety. 
so I recommend that he would come back another time when I could walk her or when my roommate was there so one of us could be in the room with her. He never did come back. You hear about dogs being able to read people, so while I don't know if he would have done anything to me while on company hours, I still think she could sense that he wasn't a good person. She was a good girl. Last night, I was sadly sleeping in bed when I suddenly jolted awake to a loud noise coming from downstairs. It sounded like someone had broken a window and was trying to force a way into my home. Panicking, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, then hid in the closet and waited for the police to arrive. As I crouched down in the darkness, I could hear his footsteps coming up the stairs. My heart was pounding in my chest and I was wondering if the intruder would find me. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash and the sound of glass breaking. I realized the intruder had found their way into my bedroom. I could feel my body shaking with fear as the intruder was moving closer and closer to my hiding spot. I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to be ready to defend myself. Just as I was about to jump out of the closet and confront the intruder, I heard the sound of the police sirens outside. The intruder must have heard them too because he quickly fled the scene. When the police arrived, they searched the house and the surrounding area, but no intruder was there to be found. They took my statement and made sure that I was safe before leaving. I'm now taking precautions to secure my home, including installing a security system and getting a dog. It was a frightening experience, but it taught me the importance of being prepared and taking steps to protect myself and my home. I'm also having someone come out to replace the door today, and this time it will not have a window. I'm a female and this happened last year. I was watching TV in my living room when I heard a strange noise coming from the basement. At first, I dismissed it as just the house settling, but then I heard the noise again and it sounded like someone was moving around down there. Feeling uneasy, I grabbed the flashlight and cautiously made my way to the basement door. As I descended the stairs, I could hear the sound of someone shuffling around and my heart began to raise. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I panned my flashlight around the room and was startled to see an intruder crouch behind some boxes, rifling through my belongings. I froze, not knowing what to do. The intruder looked up and saw me, and I could see the fear in his eyes as he scrambled to his feet and tried to run past me. A side note, I should mention this. I'm an amateur boxer and well-versed in self-defense. I wasn't about to let him get away that easily. I tackled the intruder and wrestled them to the ground. We struggled for what felt like an eternity, but eventually I managed to pin him down and call the police. When the police arrived, they arrested the intruder and took him away in handcuffs. It turned out that the intruder was a homeless man who had been looking for a place to sleep and had broken into my basement. That made me feel kind of bad. After the incident, I installed better locks on the basement door, including a deadbolt. I'm a male and I'm 21. I was home alone in my apartment studying for an upcoming exam. It was late and I was starting to feel tired, so I decided to take a break and make myself a cup of tea. As I was waiting for the water to boil, I heard a strange noise outside my apartment. It sounded like someone was fidgeting with a doorknob. At first, I thought it might be my neighbor, so I went to the door and called out, Hello? But there was no answer. I started to feel a little uneasy. I double checked the locks on the door and went back to the kitchen, but then I heard the noise again and this time, it was louder. My heart started racing as I realized someone was trying to break into my apartment. I could hear the intruder moving around my patio, knocking over furniture and rummaging through my little storage space. I felt trapped and terrified, but I knew I needed to stay calm and get the police on the line. After what felt like an eternity, I heard him dash off. I went to go look at the people and I saw red and blue lights flashing. They searched the area, but the man was never caught. In the aftermath, I felt violated. The next day, I talked to the manager of the apartment buildings. They plan on putting up cameras in the next few weeks, so hopefully this will detour the guy from coming back. All in all, all he stole was my cigarettes and my lighter. But if my door hadn't been locked, what would have happened?
At around noon yesterday, my ring camera at my back door picked up someone entering my gated back patio. They walked to the far corner of my paved area, took a picture of my ring and the area surrounding my back door, and then left. My roommate left around 11.30 and saw lawn care at our building. We live in a three-building townhome complex. There seemed to be some sort of lawn equipment left outside the gate when the man entered. He may have been instructed by the supervisor to take a photo for some reason. I contacted property management and am waiting to hear back from maintenance on if he was okayed by a supervisor. Wondering if anyone's encountered something like this, the steps they took to resolve it, and what the outcome was. I'd like to preface this by saying my husband is an electrical engineer and I am a teacher. We're not crazy people. So, back when my husband and I were dating, my husband was in a terrible car crash. His truck hit black ice and he slid onto oncoming traffic. His truck was completely totaled, so was the other truck he hit. The weird thing though, both he and the other guy were completely fine, not a scratch on them. All my husband had was a bruise on his knee. The first responders were baffled, as was the towing company and insurance when they realized no one had died or was severely injured. Fast forward to a few days after the crash, my husband comes over to my apartment. We're having a conversation about a university class we're both in, and he casually asked me when I got a flat screen TV sitting on my dresser. At this point, I was very confused because I had this little flat screen since I was 13 and had it the entire year we had been dating. Asked him what he was talking about. He told me to quit pulling his leg and asked me what I did with the old tube TV. I had no idea what he was talking about and told him so. He was convinced I had a tube TV. I proceeded to go on Facebook and showed him the pictures we had taken two weeks prior with the TV in the background. It's a flat screen in the picture. My husband goes white like he has seen a ghost and stares into space for a minute. His eyes start to water. I ask him what is wrong and he said, I swear to God, I'm not crazy. You've had a tube TV since we started dating. It was a tube TV when we took that picture. I brushed it off as him being rattled from the accident and he didn't bring it up again. However, anytime we hung out in my room, he'd always look at the TV weird. Fast forward seven years, my husband and I have been married for a few years and decided that we were ready to be parents. I'm not on birth control and we decided whatever happens, happens. We're not actively trying, but not preventing it either. So we're on vacation in Italy, wandering around Rome and I feel like shit. I had had my period that week before and it was one of the worst I've had in my whole life. As we were walking around, I'm suffering from back pain chills and horrific cramping. I go to the bathroom in the cafe and hurl my guts out, have diarrhea and realize I'm menstruating heavily. Obviously I'm weirded out since I just had my period that week before. I clean myself up and go back to my husband and tell him I think we need a doctor. I have a pretty high pain tolerance but this is insane. It's getting to the point that I'm having trouble walking and I start feeling pain in my shoulders. I don't want to ruin our vacation, but I'm starting to really worry. My husband is smarter than me, sees the state I'm in, and says I'm visibly paler than when I went to the bathroom and gets me help. 20 minutes later, I'm on a stretcher being taken to the hospital. An hour after that, I'm being prepped for emergency surgery as the doctor tells me I have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I have heavy internal bleeding, and if he doesn't perform the surgery, I'm gonna die. Six hours later, I wake up very sore and tired. The doctor tells me I'm very lucky, and if I had waited any longer to seek medical attention, I'd be dead. My husband stays with me in the hospital the first night, then gets a hotel for the rest of my stay. A week later, we're cleared to fly home, and I go through a grueling month of healing from the surgery. Two months after our return, somehow my husband and I get on the topic of fires and he goes on about the dangers of kitchen fires and I say, no need to worry, we're all set with an extinguisher in the closet. He looks at me like I have three heads and asks me what I'm talking about. I remind him about the extinguisher in the front closet where we keep our coats. 
We've had it for three years. He insisted we buy one when we bought our house. My husband shakes his head and tells me that he has no idea what I'm talking about and we don't have a fire extinguisher. I remind him about not only the memories of us fighting about if we really needed one, where to put it, buying it from Home Depot, but also installing it on the wall in the closet. He looks at me with confusion and tells me none of that happened. I get up, go to the front closet, all while cursing at him for being an asshole for forgetting our two-week fight about it. And lo and behold, no extinguisher. Not only is there no extinguisher, but there's no holes in the wall where I know we installed it. No fresh paint. The wall has never been touched. I insist he's moved it and fixed the wall, and he asked me why the fuck would he play such a stupid prank. He continues to insist we've never had one, let alone talking about getting one. This goes on for several minutes. I'm approaching hysterics. Tell him to quit playing games when he finally says, Now you know how I feel about the TV. We didn't speak about this for a long time. Then after I found this thread, he brought up this theory that perhaps in another timeline or dimension, whatever you want to call it, we both actually died and we reset like a video game and the TV and extinguisher are glitches. I don't know if I agree with him. All I know is I've never been so rattled in my life and every time I get something from that closet I'm overwhelmed with this feeling of wrongness. I know it should be there, but somehow it's just not. I can't explain it. He says he will go to the grave swearing I had a tube TV. I think my husband actually experienced a reality shift or a matrix glitch because of some of the things he's mentioned to me lately about small things. He actually told me about the actual glitch that he knows happened, but he says that after that there have been things that are weird to him that he's been noticing. We're both pretty big into weird things like glitches in the matrix and paranormal things, but he never expected to experience one of his own. I guess I should start with the actual glitch that my husband experienced. He and my son were out picking up food from the grocery store for dinner, which is not something he normally has to do, nor does he volunteer to do it. However, on that specific day, he had actually mentioned that he wanted to go to the store, and my son wanted to go with him, so they went out together. Fine by me, one less thing I have to do in the end. He told me that, while they were there, they were walking around grabbing things and they went down the aisle with the condiments. He had grabbed a bottle of mustard, because we were out, and then moved on to the next aisle to get something, when my son randomly remembered that we were also out of ketchup, because he had used the last of it the day before on his spaghetti. I know that's weird, don't ask. I'm not going to question him on why he puts ketchup on spaghetti. Anyways, my husband says that he'll go grab it, and tells my son to stay there since it was only an aisle away. He headed over to get it, and he said that it wasn't there which made no sense since it was the same aisle that they had just gone down. He then looked up, and he noticed that he was actually in the bread aisle about two aisles down the store. He mentioned that he had somehow literally walked one aisle over, but then ended up three aisles away from where he started. He even verified this by walking back to where the condiments were, and going one more aisle and making sure that our son was still standing there, and he was. Obviously this makes no sense, and he says that it felt like he had almost somehow teleported to the bread aisle but he moved on, grabbed the ketchup, and then finished shopping, and was just super excited to tell me about what he experienced. Well, that's not where the weirdness ends. He said that now there are strange little things that are different that he's struggling to accept. The first thing he mentioned was my laptop. I do work as a graphic designer, and I work for a small company that does visual designs for larger corporations. Because of COVID, my position is now a fully remote one, 
and I have a room dedicated to being my office, which is a room that the other two typically don't go into. The other day, I was working on something, and my husband had to come in to tell me something else, and as soon as he walked up to my desk, he paused, and started staring at my work computer. I asked him what was going on, and he asked me where my MacBook was. I have literally never used a Mac. I don't personally like the operating system on Apple computers, and have always had a standard, Windows-based laptop. I told him this, and he responded with, No, you had a MacBook Pro. I remember you and me sitting down to look at what you could order through your work, and we chose a really beefy Mac because that's what they wanted you to have. I recall the conversation you had with your boss where they told you the whole team was moving to Apple computers and you were upset about it. I told him that that had never happened and I had no idea what he was talking about. We had a small argument about it, nothing too severe, just a disagreement, and we moved on. One of the other events that happened was when we went to order pizza last weekend. My husband was asking what we wanted, and my son said that he wanted pepperoni. My husband immediately stopped and just stared at him like he had grown a third arm or something, he then started going on about how much my son hated pepperoni, and said that he always asked for a cheese pizza, extra cheese, add chicken. My son has no memory of ever asking for this, and as far back as I can remember, my son has always loved pepperoni. Obviously, this was another thing that upset my husband, but we got our pizza and we moved on. I actually had a conversation with him about all this and he told me that there are other small things that have been eating away at him that have changed. Things like the neighbor's cars are different from what he remembers, and one of the neighbors seems to live in a different house than what he remembered. He also mentioned that he was confused that I had eaten clams the other day, since he swears I was allergic to shellfish. There were a few other things about our son and about our home that he said felt different, I tried to talk to him about them, but I can tell that it's really upsetting him. And he then mentioned that he thinks he's either losing it, or he has shifted to a different existence. Obviously, nothing seems out of place for me, other than his behavior and how he's feeling and acting about things. For the record, he has no mental health issues, he doesn't use drugs or drink, and he hasn't suffered any injuries and all of these things just started happening after he had that weird event at the grocery store. So this actually happened last week. It just took some time to come to terms with it. I got a phone call from a next door neighbor late in the evening asking if I could help him move his mattress into his upstairs. His mom is ill and has a big heavy sleep number bed. I, of course, ran over to help because they're great neighbors. I get over there and his friend, who is also a priest, was there to help. I helped him figure out how to separate the mattress from the bed so we could fit it upstairs. We get it all moved up and back in place when my neighbor asked if I could help move the armoire upstairs too. I think nothing of it and we pull it out of his travel trailer and start bringing it up the front stairs of his house. The front stairs are 11 steps. I was on the lower end of the armoire, about 6 steps up, when my neighbor and his friend lose the handle and it comes crashing down on me and I fall backwards towards the pavement. I then wake up in my dining room to my phone ringing and my wife asking me if I was going to answer the phone. It's my neighbor asking if I could help move the bed upstairs for his mom. I go over and meet the priest's friend again and this has been the first time I met him. I say I can help you with the bed, but I cannot help you with the armoire. My neighbor was like, how do you know about the armoire? I then proceeded to tell him that I'm pretty sure I just died. I spent the next hour talking to the priest. He had so many questions. My neighbor didn't believe it until I described the upstairs bedroom in perfect detail, down to the metal material frame on the floor and the intricate headboard leaning against the wall. 
and I had never been upstairs in the house before. The priest told me what I saw after I died. I told him I never actually died. Before it happened, I woke up at my dining room table. About 10 years ago, I used to work for a small call center that did tech support for some smaller internet service providers throughout the country. The call center was 24 by 7, and it was probably the most stressful job I've ever had. But it paid the bills, and in the end, working nights meant that I could still go to school. So I pretty much just kept with it and did my best. Working the night shift meant that you knew everyone that you worked with, because there were only a handful of you there at any point in time. So when we got a new guy, it was almost an event because it was such a rarity. My glitch actually involves a new employee that we got, and it wasn't just the fact that he was new to the company that makes me remember the situation. It's that he had an accent. On that night that he started, he was introduced, and I was over the moon because he actually had a very thick Irish accent. He and I chatted a bit during the introduction, and come to find out he was from Ireland, and he had moved to the US about 20 or so years prior. He told me about his home life, his family, basically everything that a quick introduction could entail. I remember even commenting that I loved his accent, because it was one of those things that I said that was weird, and I caught it after I said it. I apologized to him after saying it, basically fessing up to the fact that I shouldn't have said it, and he laughed and told me it was totally fine. After we chatted for a few minutes, he got pulled away from his spot to shadow one of the other techs so we could explain a few things to him which was basically all of the training that you got there. He told me that he'd see me around, and I went back to work. The night ended, I went home, everything was pretty normal. The next night, I actually looked around for him, but I didn't see him, so I assumed they either had him shadowing someone else, he was in training with the manager, or he may have had the day off. The next day was the same, he was nowhere to be found. On the third day, I was a bit upset, thinking that he may have decided that this job just wasn't for him and didn't come back. I actually went over to the night manager and asked him if the man had quit, and he asked me who I was talking about. I said, you know, the guy that just started, he had a really thick Irish accent. He stared at me like I was insane and said that no one had been hired in the last couple weeks much less anybody from Ireland. I stood there literally describing this guy, how tall he was, how he looked, his backstory. None of it rang any bells with the manager. I thought that he was messing with me, so I shouted for the other tech that the guy had shadowed, and he had no idea who I was talking about. I asked a few of the other guys, and they too told me that... They did not remember a man with an Irish accent ever starting. I was the only one who remembered this man, apparently. Nobody that worked our shift had heard of a man with an Irish accent. None of them had any memory of this guy ever existing, with me being the only exception. I guess it is possible that they were all just messing with me, but to get that many guys to just pretend that somebody didn't exist for the fun of it... That would have been quite a feat. It was honestly really upsetting too, because he seemed like a cool dude, and I would have loved to have been friends with the guy. A couple years ago, I lost a ring my grandma gave me for Christmas. I wore that ring 24-7 and rarely took it off, However, when I did take it off, I always put it in the same place so I wouldn't lose it. This ring meant a lot to me since, sadly, my grandma passed away from cancer shortly after. One day, I remember looking down at my hand and starting to panic because the ring wasn't on my finger. Before getting really upset, I went and checked the usual spot where I put it 
but it wasn't there. I remember telling my family and having them search the whole house. Anyways, I lost it a couple weeks before Christmas, so they told me that they would give me another. After they told me this, I went down to my basement to do my wash, and when I was putting my clothes in the dryer, I felt something hit me in the head and fall onto the floor in front of me. Lo and behold, it was my ring. It literally fell out of thin air. I told myself it was a little message from my grandma, but it was one of the weirdest things. Still to this day, I think about it. About two weeks ago, I was driving home from a friend's house in a snowstorm. It wasn't supposed to snow that day, so it came on unexpectedly, hard and fast. The highway was relatively clear because of the constant traffic, but the heavy snowfall was already accumulating and freezing off the highway, which I discovered upon exiting. I stepped on my brakes to slow down at the red light ahead of me, where two cars were already waiting, but I began to slide. To avoid hitting the car stopped at the light, which I definitely would have if I hadn't changed directions. I turned my wheel and began sliding across the exit to the right side of the road. I was probably 25 yards across the street when I slid into a ditch. I was at a 45 degree angle and I was absolutely sure that my car was about to flip. I closed my eyes and braced for it, only to find myself on the cross street only a few seconds later, facing the right direction. I thought I possibly somehow drove the 25 yards onto the cross street, but I had already been mid-tumble with my eyes closed and would have somehow had to avoid the signs at the end of the exit which would have been a hard impact at what I estimate to be around 45 miles per hour. Now I'm legitimately entertaining the idea that I died in a parallel universe. So I was home alone and my dog was outside. I let him in after a while because I didn't want him to get distracted chasing squirrels. After he came in, I went into another room to watch TV then I heard my dog barking from outside, the way he does when he wants to come in. I opened the door, and it was my dog. I swear I had let him in 10 minutes ago, and there's no way he could have gotten outside so quickly with nobody else there. We were moving states today. My husband has our kids in one car, and I have our dogs in the other. They are about 5 or 6 miles ahead of me. As I am passing a rest stop, I notice the trunk of a black Ford Edge open and filled with boxes. I'm like, why'd they stop without telling me? There was a guy wearing jeans and a green waffle knit long sleeve at the back door of the driver's side, buckling a kid into a car seat. Okay, that's what my husband is wearing today, and those are the contents of her trunk. I'm seriously annoyed that they didn't tell me that they were stopping, and it's already too late to pull off. I call my husband and ask him why he didn't tell me. He has no idea what I'm talking about. They didn't stop, and they're still a few miles ahead of me. So I work for a joinery company and was delivering a load to a construction site about an hour away from work. I'm playing a Reddit compilation video through my headphones. I was about 8 minutes into the video in the middle of town at a red light with a bad feeling of deja vu. The video started buffering. I thought it was odd since I had good reception, but was going to wait it out. The light went green and a video played just long enough to say the word, wait, and started buffering again. I couldn't see anything at all. The road was clear, but I thought I'd listen, look left, then right again, and there was a massive semi that appeared out of nowhere and ran the red light. It would have taken out the driver's side of the cab, and I would have been toast if I hadn't waited. Definitely reminded me of my own mortality. I have a thing that happened when I was a kid that some people may not consider a glitch, but it was really weird and it definitely seems like it was, in fact, a glitch in reality. Something happened, and I cannot explain it, so I'm submitting it, and if you think it's a glitch or glitch-worthy, then you're free to use it. This happened back when I was eight years old. 
and it was during the summer, so I was out of school and had a lot of time to do whatever I wanted to do. My dad stayed home during the summer while my mom worked, and he typically had the late shift. So he would go in when she was getting home. That way, somebody was always there to watch me. On the day that this happened, my dad was asleep pretty late in the day, and I had gotten up pretty early and had jumped straight on to my Nintendo 64. I wasn't supposed to spend the whole day playing it, but... No one was really watching me closely, so I decided that I was going to play it until my dad got up, and then figure out something else to do. Like I mentioned, I had been up pretty early and my dad was going to sleep until noon at the latest, so I had a few hours. I put in Glover and was playing through the levels, and when I looked over at the clock, I noticed that it was already noon. I decided to just go ahead and shut it off just in case my dad did get up, and then went and made myself a sandwich. After eating it, I was sitting there watching TV, just kind of waiting for my dad to get up, and getting bored with watching daytime television. After about 20 or so minutes, I started dozing off and decided that I wanted to take a nap, so I put my head down on the couch and dozed off. This is where things ended on my side, because I was obviously asleep. When I finally woke up, I got off the couch and walked into the kitchen and was surprised to see my mom at the table on the phone. I didn't realize that my nap had been so long that she had gotten home. She hung up the phone while staring at me like she was confused as soon as she saw me. I said hi and asked her what was wrong, and she started asking me where I was, what I'd been doing, and several other questions. I told her that I was asleep on the couch, and she said that that was impossible, and told me that I needed to tell her where I was. I kept telling her the same thing, that I was sleeping on the couch, because it was the truth. That's where I had been the whole time, To keep this story fairly short and explain what happened, my dad woke up, and when he did, he couldn't find me. He looked throughout the house, and I was apparently nowhere to be found. He said that he looked in my bedroom, the living room, upstairs, and even in the basement, and he could not find me. He then called my friends that lived on my street to see if I had gone to their houses, and obviously I wasn't there. He called my mom and told her that I was seemingly missing, and she rushed home from work. When she saw me just walk into the kitchen like nothing had occurred, she was shocked. She had also checked all the rooms of the house, the yard, the shed, everything, and she had no idea where I was. It was the weirdest thing because they were within minutes of calling the police, and reporting me as missing. But the whole time, I was asleep on the couch in the next room. I wasn't covered up, I wasn't wearing something that would cause me to camouflage, and the room wasn't dark. Neither of my parents could find me, and I was right there. It was almost as if I just didn't exist. Now, I guess it's possible that they both could have somehow overlooked me on the couch, but it would be really weird to think that two adults could just not see a kid lying on the couch in the middle of a living room for multiple hours to the point that they were about to call the police. It almost seemed like I just disappeared from existence for a few hours and then came back whenever I woke up. My mom died 13 years ago. About four years ago, my dad went on vacation in Arizona with his girlfriend. He said he was up watching TV and the hotel phone rang. He answered it, said it was my mom's voice saying, I'm okay. He said, Cass? The phone went crackly and said, Heather, my name, I'm okay. He said his girlfriend was confused why the phone rang. He immediately called me even though it was late and he was crying. 
dad doesn't believe in the supernatural, but still to this day cannot explain the call. So I never really put too much merit into this matrix theory until I experienced it myself with my husband on my wedding day. I'm a 30 year old female and my husband is 32. In 2020, we were able to get married even during the pandemic and at a small backyard wedding of 20 people and got married at our local outdoor park for our vows. Everything was perfect that day. The sun was out, air was crisp, and more importantly, all our loved ones were around to listen to us exchange our vows. So after my now husband and I exchanged our vows, we proceeded to walk down the aisle towards our photographer, as I'm sure all couples do after getting married. We got some shots with everyone in the background as we walked away. Satisfied with the photos, the photographer went off to look at the next location that we were all walking to to do formal pictures with the whole family. We turned around to walk back to our families and give them hugs, but when we turned around, no one was moving, no noise, nothing, perfectly silent, just looking at us. My husband and I were alarmed, and my husband even made a joke, why is no one moving? Did we do something wrong? There was a solid 45 seconds of pure frozenness, then everything resumed. I've never experienced anything like that. There's simply no rational explanation for it other than a glitch in the matrix. Okay, so this just happened now. I ordered some photo card sleeves from Amazon a few days ago, and my package arrived today, exactly as I ordered, and I put them away. Then I came back from school and saw another package on my bed. I had bought an album that said it would come later than the sleeves, so I thought that was it. But no, it was more sleeves of exactly what I ordered. I then wanted to go check if somehow I dreamt my sleeves arriving and the sleeves themselves weren't where I left them. But the package that came in was in the bin and part of the sleeve packaging was still on my desk. I then went to go check the emails where I confirmed my order and I didn't somehow accidentally order two lots. I also checked and my bank balance hasn't changed, so I didn't end up reordering them on a separate occasion. It was the exact same amount, two softer sleeves, one harder sleeve. But also, the packaging is different, as in the label are two different fonts, and the cardboard packages are two different sizes. I have no idea how I could have misplaced the previous cards, or why I have more cards, on top of the fact that we never get two postman deliveries. It's just one time at 11 a.m. every day, but I left for school at 1.15 p.m. I'm generally so confused. Everything I'm about to describe came to light in the last 30 minutes. I'm a 49 year old female and I drove to my parents house, 75 female and 78 male, to check on my dad. He was in the ER with chest pains earlier today and has since been discharged. Onto the glitch. My parents do not use Reddit and have no clue what glitch in the matrix means. After the dust settled on, is dad okay? My mom presented me with an envelope that was in their mailbox this week with my writing on it. No debate, this is my writing and exactly how I would address the card to my parents, front and back, including Shirley's temple stamps from my mom. Glitch 1 Postmark is from July 2016, Los Angeles, which tracks where I lived in 2016, but how did it take six and a half years to get to my parents' mailbox? Reasonable answers, the card got stuck in the postal bin or inside my parents' mailbox for six and a half years. Okay, then riddled me this. Glitch 2 Yes, it's my handwriting on the envelope, but the card inside I've never seen. And based on the pop culture reference on the card, it's not a card I would send. And the message inside the card is my aunt's handwriting and signature. The card has been in transit for six and a half years and is from my mom's sister and addressed and sent by me. Reasonable explanation. My uncle, aunt's husband, my mom's brother-in-law, and my favorite uncle could have handed it off to me for mailing when he passed through LA. 
This explanation isn't totally wild because he travels a lot and we always find time for a dinner together whenever he's local and passing through. However, I have zero recollection of us ever getting together in my seven years in LA, nor any sort of card handoff. Plus, why would my aunt Georgia give her husband a card to take to me in California to mail to my mom in Virginia? So Reddit, how did my mom receive a six and a half year old card mailed in my writing but sent from her sister on the day when my dad was in the hospital for a near death experience? Also just noticed the happy birthday Mo makes no sense. My mom's birthday is in November. The postmarks are July 2016. So this birthday wish was eight months late. I have a weird and kind of creepy glitch story that may be a case of quantum immortality. I'm really not sure. I can't say that I know a whole lot about simulation theory or glitches, and I know even less about what quantum immortality really entails, but I think that this falls into that category. In order to fully make sense of it all, I guess I need to explain what happened. This is not a situation that happened to me personally, it actually happened to my brother, and I'm a bit of a side victim to the situation. This is going to be a bit weird in structure, and I'm sorry for that, but I'm not really sure how to explain it all in a proper timeline, because the situation that caused it all happened about five years ago, and then I learned that the thing happened this past month and now I'm questioning everything from that moment forward. So, on that, five years ago there was a major incident in our family home. I was 16 at the time, and my brother was about to turn 18. It was the middle of winter, and it was getting pretty cold here in the Midwest. We had the heat on in the house, but my brother's room was in a separate room off to the side of the basement. The room was once a laundry room, but my dad had changed all of the hookups, so he had taken that room as his. Unfortunately, the basement did have issues with heat, so my brother had bought a small room heater to set up down there to keep it all as warm as the rest of the house. On the night that this happened, my brother had left his space heater on, and I don't really know if it was a short in the plug or the heater itself, but it ended up catching on fire. Now, I want to mention that I do not remember much about this night, beyond the house catching, me getting out, and the insanity and chaos that took place as the fire department put out the fire. I will say that while I don't remember much, there is one very specific detail that I don't recall anything about, and that is my brother. I don't remember him exiting the house, and I don't recall him ever being pulled out of the fire by anyone else. For some reason, his whereabouts after the fire started, for me, are completely unknown. I will say that I do remember him being home that evening, because he was there for dinner. We'd had pizza and he asked dad to get wings for him, which he did. I don't know why I recall that specifically, but I do. But for some reason, I have zero knowledge, memory, or idea where he was after the fire started. On the other end of this is my brother and what he remembers. He says that he remembers being home that night and surprisingly, he said that he remembers the fire. He said that he was in bed and he remembers a weird popping sound that actually made him jump out of bed. Then, he recalls the room getting really hot and smoky. He said that he tried to get out of the laundry room but couldn't because the fire was blocking him in. With how that laundry room was built, there were no windows or exits outside of the main door and there was a decent amount of basement that existed between the laundry room and the stairs. Thinking about it, the old laundry room really should not have been used as a bedroom, but hindsight is twenty twenty. 
the whole thing that he told me sounds horrible. He mentioned that he remembered starting to lose consciousness because of the smoke and heat, and that he tried as hard as he possibly could to get through the fire, but he remembers being horribly burned. And he has a very detailed memory of not making it to the stairs before collapsing. Now, obviously, that's not what happened, but he remembers it very thoroughly. He says that after he collapsed on the ground in the basement, in his mind, he kept hearing his own voice telling him that he was not going to die there, that he was going to make it. He said that it was like he was telling himself that he was going to be okay, that he was going to make it, and that he was going to get up, but it wasn't him. I know that sounds confusing, but it was like a third-party version of himself was yelling at him to wake up and get out. Then, he says that he jumped awake, but that's where things get really strange. He says that when he woke up, it was morning, and he was at his friend Derek's house. He says that he asked Derek how he got there, and Derek told him all about how he'd stayed over that night, how they'd been playing Call of Duty all night, and how they had pizza. He looked outside, and sure enough, his car was sitting in Derek's driveway. According to Derek, Derek's parents, and even my parents, he had been there all night. He wasn't home whenever the fire broke out, a fact that everyone was beyond grateful for. However, he completely and totally remembers being in the fire. And I remember some of what he actually said, that he was home when we had dinner, and I don't ever remember him leaving. He says that he was home. Everyone else says that he was out. And for me, there's just a huge blank in my memory for where he was or what happened to him. It's a crazy event that I cannot explain. But my brother sincerely believes that he died in that fire. He remembers the pain, the heat, but... He was, by all official and known accounts, not home that night. Like I mentioned, I'm not sure if this is a glitch, but based on his recollection of the fire, and the fact that I can't remember where he was, it all seems like something went wrong here. Something about all of this really confuses me, and it makes me think how broken our simulation may actually be. This happened the other day, and it was seriously the weirdest thing that I have ever witnessed. It may not seem like much of an event, but it was certainly strange, and I have no idea how to actually explain it. I live on a side road that is attached to one of the main roads of my area, and they have the main road shut down partially due to construction. It's been going on for what feels like forever, but thankfully, as of late, they've been making strides and getting it all finished. Because they're doing it in bursts and sections, they have to block off certain parts and turns and put up detours. But it hasn't been much of a problem until they went into it this hard. When this happened, they had blocked off a rather large section a bit down the road to the right after turning off my road onto the main one. It was basically set up to where, if you turned right off of my road, you would hit construction within a few moments and have to immediately turn around. There were no driveways, no side roads, nothing like that, so there were a lot of cars that were going that way and having to immediately turn back around. It was almost humorous because from the intersection you could see that there was construction. Yet, people would still turn that way only to be sent back by the road being completely closed off. On to the event in question. My dad and I were sitting outside on the porch having a drink and enjoying the summer weather while talking about nothing in particular. 
We were watching people that went down the road and making a bet on how long it would be until we saw them make the U-turn and come back, and laughing the whole time. Mostly because, again, you could see the construction when you turned that way, and if you were paying attention, you could see that there was a whole section where there was no road at all. It was just broken down concrete blocked off by roadblocks. As we were sitting there, we saw a bright red Mustang head down the road. I made a comment that it was one hell of a car, because it was pretty clearly well maintained and taken care of. Then, when it got to the stop sign at the end, they hit their blinker to the right. My dad and I both threw out a number of how many seconds it would be until we saw him turn around. He turned to the right and started down the hill, and we just sat there waiting. We were both counting out the seconds and watching, but we were genuinely surprised when we didn't see it come back. We were both kind of scratching our heads, like, how long is he going to sit at that road close sign and just watching? After a couple of minutes, we both decided to walk down to the end of the yard to look at where the road ends to see if he was seriously just sitting there. But when we went and looked, the Mustang wasn't there. Somehow, this guy had just disappeared, but there was no way that he would have taken that car off-road, and like I mentioned, there was nowhere to turn off of the road or go. It was completely and totally blocked. He didn't turn around like we weren't paying attention or anything like that, because we would have absolutely noticed the bright cherry red and very shiny Mustang. It was super weird. He was there, he turned right towards the construction, and then he was just gone. Neither of us had an explanation other than my dad joking about how it was a ghost car, and if that's the case, then there's a ghost out there that has damn good taste in cars and a decent amount of money to spend on one. Hello, this is Bad Vibes. Joining me today is Interscare Wifey. She will be reading two stories. Make sure to drop her a sub. Link will be in the pinned comment. Back in 2005 or 2006, I was renting this house that was a nearly 100 year old farmhouse. My bedroom was upstairs and for some reason it always creeped me out a little bit. It was as if I felt a presence there, although I hadn't had any actual paranormal experiences. One night, my then boyfriend and I had stayed up late watching TV and had fallen asleep on the couch. I had to work early the next day, so when I woke up around 3am, I decided to go upstairs to bed. I gently shook my boyfriend to get him to come upstairs, but he did not immediately follow. It was beginning to get light, so when I got to bed I pulled the cover up over my head to try to block out the light so I could sleep. This house was old and creaky, and I heard my boyfriend coming up the creaky stairs and walked down the hallway to the room not long after I had laid down. I could hear him come into the room and I felt the bed depress on his side as he sat down. But then he got up and then sat down further at the bottom of the bed. He did this, getting up and sitting down along the edge of the bed until he was sitting right next to me. I was annoyed at this point, wondering if this was some weird attempt to put the moves on me, when all I wanted to do was sleep. Then I felt his arm go across my waist, so I flung the blanket back up to ask him, what the fuck? But he wasn't there. I ran downstairs to see if maybe he was tricking me and he was still sound asleep on the couch. So I ran back upstairs, got into the blankets and shut my eyes tight until I fell asleep. For as long as I remembered in the house, I never had another experience, although the creepy feeling upstairs always remained. I'm not sure that what happened was real. It felt real. I don't think it was a lucid dream because I hadn't had time to fall back asleep yet.
First, I'm going to start by saying that growing up in my parents' house, I've always felt a sense of unease or as if there was a presence there. My sister also felt the same way. Our house is located in an area where there used to be a lot of mines. One night, I fell asleep on the couch in the living room. The couch was beside the stairs and also facing the kitchen. I remember very clearly opening my eyes but not being able to move. I started hearing what sounded like a hundred footsteps running up and down the stairs behind me and then it went silent. I looked up into the kitchen and saw a dark silhouette of a woman standing in the kitchen facing away from me. I remember that she was about 5'3 and very skinny. She had very long fingers and she was crying. I then woke up to my sister playing with my dog in the living room beside me and then everything was normal. Another time I was sleeping in my room. I'm unsure if this would be considered sleep paralysis because it only happened for a split second. I remember I opened my eyes and there was a face directly in front of mine sideways facing me and it was laying beside me. The face was decomposing and the mouth was wide open like it was screaming in front of me. I immediately closed my eyes and when I opened them again, it was gone. I've always had sleep paralysis since I turned 18. I used to have it 6 to 10 times every night when I was 18 to 20 years old living in my old military dorm room. It always started the same way with the same entity. I would always see his torso and head covered in blue and green ink tattoos and his voice mocked me when I prayed. Literally sounded like the low toned voices horror movies depict of evil spirits. After about two years, I started having sleep paralysis maybe once or twice a month. I am now 37 and live in a new place in a different state. For the past three years now, I have had it every month, but it's always during a full moon. I know this because I kept a log of time and dates that occurred. I always wake up to see this dark figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. It goes away when I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It happens so frequently that I don't get scared anymore. Well, last night was weird. I was dreaming randomly about being in a bathtub. Nothing scary. Woke up because I felt like I needed to pee, then sleep paralysis hit me. I saw a man who looked dead because his eyes were grayish with his back towards me. I panicked, closed my eyes and started praying. Once I regained full consciousness and control, I immediately opened my eyes and saw an 8 foot dark figure with red eyes standing in front of the doorway. I blinked several times and even rubbed my eyes, but it didn't go away. I felt so pissed because I felt violated. I began to rebuke it and it went away. I hate this. I don't know why this happens to me every full moon around 2 to 3 a.m. I have a feeling it sucks the positive energy or light out of me for whatever it needs it for. I'm so sick and tired of it. Anyone else feel this way or had similar experiences? Update. I put some small crosses at every entrance on the second floor on each window, doorway, and staircase. My room is on the second floor directly above the living room and adjacent to the stairway. Last night I woke up because I heard a man laughing. It was so crystal clear. I wasn't dreaming because when I woke up I continued to hear it for about three more seconds or so. The laugh was not like someone laughing at a joke. It sounded condescending, mean, or mocking. I looked at the time and it was 2.50 AM. It sounded like it came from the first floor where our kitchen and living room is. Wondering if it's laughing because the crosses I put on the second floor wouldn't let it pass. I also checked aside from our security cameras and no one was out there. Plus I live in a very secluded area. The other night around 3 a.m. I started to experience some sleep paralysis. This is normal for me. I often have sleep paralysis and although it's uncomfortable, it isn't necessarily abnormal. 
This particular night, I started feeling something wrap around me, like a snake, but it felt evil. I was sleeping on my stomach, and the thing was on top of me, and wrapping me in its arms, so maybe more like an octopus at this point. After a bit of this, I noticed that the thing is actually just a snake-like octopus version of my friend. The body is my friend, the face is my friend, with the hand suffocating and constraining me. I wake up completely for a short period of time, but was unable to stay awake. I fell back asleep and into the paralysis again. Same shit. This also happens to me quite often. I try to fight my sleep paralysis and lose. Once waking up, I remember the friend I was dreaming of is more than likely awake because they had to work the night shift. I texted my friend and told him of my experience. When he tells me just how the strangest thing happened to him. He swears he saw someone walking and disappearing behind the small shed near the woods while he was outside on a smoke break at 3am. Probably just a coincidence, but I thought I would share. To set the scene, it was my spouse, our two-year-old, and myself in a one-bedroom apartment. Two-year-old's bed was close to the wall by the door. Our bed was on the other side of the room. I could see our two-year-old, but also see the bathroom door, which was located just outside the room. It first started out with minor bad feelings. The usual walk into the apartment and feel something off. Bad vibes all around. One night while we were sleeping, I had woken to a strange feeling that our two-year-old was up to something that she shouldn't have been. The room was completely dark, so I sit up to have a look around, and almost immediately this small shadow catches my eye. It's my two-year-old. She's standing at the entrance of the bathroom looking back at me, and then proceeded to sidestep into the bathroom out of my view. I wake up my significant other and ask them. Wake up. Why is two-year-old out of their bed? How do they climb out? She said, what are you talking about? Two-year-old is in their crib asleep. My eyes finally adjusted to the dark and I see my two-year-old sleeping peacefully in their crib. My heart starts picking up pace at this point as I'm trying to figure out who did I just see walk into our bathroom. I get out of bed and rush to the bathroom ready to catch whoever it is. I flip on the light, but the bathroom is empty. It's just me staring at my reflection in the mirror. I turn off the light and head back to bed confused about what just happened, but not too sure what I saw. Fast forward a few nights and I'm still thinking about what happened. There I am in bed next to significant other with two-year-old sleeping sound. Again, I wake up to this strange feeling like we're being watched. I open my eyes, my body is still. I'm paralyzed, trapped in my own body. My eyes search across the room and I look at the door to our bedroom and what I saw made my heart drop. There was this man in our bedroom door. Something about him was completely off like he was something otherworldly in a man's body. He was more shadow than detail and his posture was hunched like he was trying to be quiet, like he was stalking his prey. The shadow man begins to creep towards me, lurching closer to our bed. My mind is racing, I'm thinking, tonight's the night. An invader has finally entered our home and I was the only one awake. I start planning my attack and what I'm going to do to defend my family but my body is still immobilized. The intruder then does the unthinkable. He places one foot on my bed, then the other, and slowly starts creeping higher and higher up the bed. He's standing over me, and in the quick moment of fear, I was able to break out and kick both of my legs up towards the shadow man, hoping to catch him by surprise and ready to leap at him. As I kicked up, I felt the weight of my blanket fly off my body. I wasn't going to wait to hear the sound of a thud as he fell back. I was in fight or flight, and my only focus was on jumping on this thing as fast as possible and keeping my family safe. My violent kick wakes my significant other up in a panic. I get up ready to pounce when I see that there's no one there. What the hell is going on? She said. 
There was a man in our room. I kicked the shit out of him. He was right there. The room is empty and dark. No man, no intruder, no sound. The silence is broken by my wife telling me to check the rest of the apartment. And after I look around, there was no one else there. I go back to bed and try to sleep, but my adrenaline was still pumping, so sleep wasn't really on the table. A few months after this event, we decided to move and upgrade to a bigger place to live, and since moving, there hasn't been any of the bad vibes as in the apartment. No shadow man, no little girl, just the three of us, thankfully. I have a friend, 27 male, who told me a fascinating story about lucid dreaming. He explained that his father had taught himself to lucid dream every night, a skill I was highly envious of. His father taught him how to do it when he was 15 or so by drawing dots on his hands and looking at them throughout the day so that eventually when he was dreaming, he could look at his hands and not see the dots, allowing him to realize he was dreaming. This is a common technique for inducing lucid dreams and something that I tried, but never long enough to actually stick to it. As a teenager, he learned to lucid dream on command, just like his father every night. He explained that it was more thrilling than any drug he'd ever taken because he had full control over every scenario. He could construct any environment of his wildest imagination. He could have sex with any person he imagined, obtain superpowers like flying, invisibility, teleport to any place he wanted, or visit alien worlds, etc. It was pure bliss, and he explained to me that he ended up sleeping all throughout the day at times because his dream world was more exciting than reality. He did this every night for more than a year or so, until things started to get strange. He told me that he started to notice a hooded figure in the periphery of his vision, but whenever he tried to look at the figure, it would walk out of his field of vision. The figure first appeared very far away in the distance from him, but every night after the first sighting, the hooded figure would return to his dream, closer to him, and still always outside his central view. He could never really focus on the figure or see its face, so he couldn't tell if it was supposed to be human or something else. Once the figure started appearing closer to him, he would be filled with an overwhelming sense of dread and felt less control over his dream environment. He finally felt terrified to fall asleep, knowing that the figure would get even closer and seemingly harm him as he sensed the evil nature of this faceless figure. He ended up fighting sleep every night to prevent dreaming and turned into an insomniac, which he still is to this day. He told me he doesn't lucid dream anymore, and I'm not sure how he unlearned it, but he hasn't seen the hooded figure since. Pretty creepy story that really stuck with me and a caveat to trying to learn to lucid dream every night. You might still grow to regret it when things get out of your control. So to start off, I wanted to explain that I suffer from bipolar disorder and I deal with many sleepless nights because of it. I have experienced sleep paralysis so many times in my life since I was a little kid that I never kept count. When I was little, I was absolutely terrified. I wouldn't be able to move and there would just be this dark silhouette of a person standing nearby. The distance would vary from each experience. The most terrifying one that stuck with me was when I was maybe 10 years old. The figure was standing on my chest and I had difficulty breathing. I never understood why this was happening to me. Then as I got older, my fear turned into rage. Instead of wanting to scream out of terror, I was trying to let out a war cry and would try to charge the figure, but to no avail. I turned 21 and I had stayed up playing games all night. When I finally drifted off, there was a figure, but this time it was different. Again, I was filled with so much rage and all I wanted to do was attack this mysterious figure. I managed to lift my arms towards it. It took a step back and I woke up. That was the first time I saw it move. I then went a very long time without suffering from sleep paralysis till my wife left me unexpectedly when I turned 29. My grief consumed me. I spent many nights sobbing without sleep. 
Then one night, when I finally did fall asleep, after being prescribed a powerful sleep aid, the figure returned. Except it was more aggressive this time, and it was no longer just a shadow, but it would still never let me see its face. Still filled with rage, I would try to charge it, but my movement was very slow and it took so much effort just to lift a finger. It grabbed me by my foot, but to its shock, I grabbed its hand back. I tried to pull myself up using all the strength I had. Just before I could, it shoved its hand over my face, blocking my view. I then bit its hand as hard as I could. I completely woke up shortly after that. So far, it hasn't returned, but that was only a few months ago. I'm sure that isn't the last encounter I'll have. Every time I have these episodes, I make it a goal to defeat whatever it is, and I'll grow stronger every time I face it. Given my bipolar condition, this could just be my imagination since I don't have a very good self-image. I don't claim to know what it is or what's happening to me. But what I do know is, I will not stop fighting this until I defeat it, or it leaves me forever. If anyone's had similar experiences, how have you fought back? To be clear, I have had sleep paralysis before, but never like this. In fact, I think this is the first time that I've truly experienced it, because usually what I do is just snap out of it. I think to myself, get angry, get angry, and I could shake off the sleep paralysis because it usually felt like an intense amount of fear, but not this time. I woke up this morning, or thought I did, and my body was vibrating. I could hear a buzzing sound. I was laying on my left side, and it was so weird. Why can't I move? No way, I can sort of move. It was a lot of effort, but I managed to move my body slightly, but it seemed like it wanted to stay in that position because it returned to it and the buzz sound continued. What the fuck is that sound? Aliens? Holy fuck, am I probed? I have to see, that's awesome, but I have to see. I blame seeing scenes from Signs and the abduction clip in VHS these days. But yeah, for the chunk of the panic moment, I was thinking irrationally, I'm gonna see aliens. So I put everything into turning around and looking up. I mean everything. The buzzing just keeps intensifying as I made even more of an effort to turn. So it was a really intense fight to move. To me it was like I was in a force field and I was breaking through. Teeth bare, eyes trying not to fall asleep. I was thinking, take a fighting stance, get ready to throw a punch. I used to box so I'm thinking, if I see something, I have to punch it. In all of this, the buzzing is going insane in my head. It's like having an industrial fan going full speed on both sides of your head. And again, this is funny because in retrospect, I probably looked like I was just turning around very slowly in bed. To me, this was an epic moment. At one point, I think I momentarily fell asleep again, then woke up again. It was so stupidly intense that I was laughing in bed so much from it. This happened about two years ago. My father had passed about 10 years before and I kept his watch next to my bed. I live alone with two rescue kitties that sleep with me and whenever I have a scary dream, seeing them next to me calms me down and I realize it's just a dream. So, I go to sleep on Wednesday about 9.30 p.m. While I'm sleeping, I feel the watch next to me and something in my room that keeps referring to the watch, but not in words. Then I hear it. Can you do me a favor? I'm frozen. I can't move and I'm thinking this isn't my father, but referring to the watch was to trick me. I'm screaming in my mind. No. It asks again. Can you do me a favor? I can't see, but I feel it in the room. I'm getting angry at this point. How dare this thing try to trick me into using my dad's watch? It's not my dad. I know that. I was trying really hard to move and getting angry. It asked me again. Can you do me a favor? 
but I wake up and yell no. I look at the time and it's midnight. My cats are nowhere to be seen and now I'm even more mad that this thing scared my poor cats. I say to the place, saying you're not welcome and to get out. I get back to sleep and I wake up still mad. I tell everyone about what happened. I'm not sure how that thing got into my house. Later that evening, I found out that a woman I work with died Wednesday afternoon and she lived alone. She was supposed to start at work at midnight, the time I woke up. Also, she always used the phrase, can you do me a favor? I felt terrible knowing that she was alone, dead, trying to tell me. I had never had anything happen like that before. I felt some guilt, but when I told people at work, her trying to contact me made me feel better. Not really scary, but it did make me feel better about her death. Another girl at work found her body, since she wasn't the type not to show up without calling. It was a very sad time. Hey, this is Bad Vibes, and if you made it this far in the video, thank you. I'm going to tell two experiences that I had with sleep paralysis. So if you don't want to hear those, you can click off. These are the two experiences that stood out to me the most and the ones that made me have the most fear. I never once saw a shadow figure or anything like that. These were also the first and last time I ever had sleep paralysis. So for the first time, at this point, I had never heard of sleep paralysis. I had no clue it was a thing, didn't know what it was. And that's what made this so scary. This was when I was living with my in-laws. I was in bed, my wife sleeping next to me, and I woke up. I was laying on my back, and I opened my eyes, and I'm staring at the ceiling. And I was freaking out at this point because I couldn't move, and I had no idea what was going on. So I'm just laying there. I could move my eyes slightly, but that's it. And I'm just thinking in my head, what's going on? Why can't I move? And then I realized I couldn't move my mouth either. I don't know how long it lasted, but I finally, um, I guess fell asleep. Well, fully asleep. The next day I tell my father-in-law about it and my wife, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like that's not a thing, that doesn't, that didn't happen. But anyways, I eventually found out what sleep paralysis was, and I had it some more in that house, but it, since I knew what it was, it wasn't really scary, it was more annoying. Well, the last time I had it, it was two days after moving into our first apartment, so the place was unfamiliar. I was laying in bed, and I had my door open, and you could see from my bed all the way to the front door. I wake up, can't move. Same old, same old. But then my stupid brain goes into thinking, what if someone breaks in? What am I gonna do? Like, how am I gonna protect my kids and wife? And I'm just staring at the front door, just staring at it. And it's playing tricks on me at that point. So I'm basically causing myself to have a panic attack. Don't know if I eventually snapped out of it or I fell back asleep, I can't remember that part of it. But I just freaked myself out so bad, feeling helpless. And that was the last time I had sleep paralysis. Anyways, thanks for watching.